Darby Ogle and the Good People by Hermione Templeton Cavanaugh The Fairies Up the Airy Mountain Down the Rushy Glen We daren't go a hunting For fear of little men We folk, good folk Trooping all together Green jacket, red cap And white owl's feather They stole little Bridget For seven years long when she came down again, her friends were all gone. They took her lightly back. Between the day and morrow, they thought that she was fast asleep. But she was dead with sorrow. William Allingham How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, Share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Darby Ogle and the Good People Darby Ogle and the Good People Although only one living man of his own free will ever went among them there, still. Any well-learned person in Ireland can tell you that the abode of the Good People is in the hollow heart of the great mountain Slevenamon. That same one man was Darby Ogil, a cousin of my own mother. Right and left, generation after generation, the fairies had stolen pigs, young childher, old women, young men, cows, churnings of butter from other people. But had never bothered any of our kith or kin until, for some mysterious reason, they soured on Darby, and took the eldest of his three foin pigs. The next week a second pig went the same way. The third week not a thing had Darby left for the Ballinrobe fair. You may acely think how sore and sorry the poor man was, and how Bridget his wife and the child her carried on. The rent was due, and all left was to sell his cow Rosie to pay it. Rosie was the apple of his eye, he admired and respected the pigs, but he loved Rosie. Worst luck of all was yet to come. On the morning when Darby went for the cow to bring her into market, Bad scrans to the hoof was there, but in her place only a wisp of dirty straw to mock him. Milia Murther. What a howlin' and screechin' and cursin' did Darby bring back to the house. Now Darby was a bold man, and a desperate man in his anger, as you soon will see. He shoved his feet into a pair of brogues, clapped his hat on his head, and gripped his stick in his hand. Fairy or no fairy, ghost or goblin, livin' or dead, who took Rosiel Rue this day, he says. With those wild words he bolted in the direction of Sleeve Naman. All day long he climbed like an ant over the hill, looking for a hole or cave through which he could get at the prison of Rosie. At times he struck the rocks with his blackthorn, crying out challenge. Come out, you that took her, he called. If ye have the courage of a mouse, ye murtherin thieves, come out. No one made answer at last, not just then. But at night, as he turned, hungry and footsore, toward home, who should he meet up with on the crossroads but the old fairy doctor, Sheila Maguire. Well known she was as a spy for the good people. She spoke up. Oh, then, you're the foolish, blunder and headed man to be saying what you've said, and doing what you've done this day, Darby Ogil, says she. What do I care, says he fiercely. I'd fight the divil tonight for my beautiful cow. Then go into Mrs. Hagen's meadow bay aunt, says Sheila, and wait till the moon is up. By and by ye'll see a herd of cows come down from the mountain, and your own will be among them. What'll I do then? asked Darby, his voice trembling with excitement. Sarah a hare I care what ye do. But there'll be lads there, and hundreds you won't see, that'll stand no ill words, Darby Ogil. One question more, ma'am, says Darby, as Sheila was moving away. How late in the night will they stay without? Sheila caught him by the collar and, pulling his head close, whispered. When the cock crows the good people must be safe at home. After cock crow they have no power to help or to hurt, and every mortal eye can see them plain. I thank you kindly, says Darby, and I bid you good evening, ma'am. He turned away leaving her standing there alone, looking after him, 
but he was sure he heard voices talking to her, and Logan and Titherin behind him. It was dark night when Darby stretched himself on the ground in Hagen's meadow, the yellow rim of the moon just tipped the edge of the hills. As he lay there in the long grass amidst the silence there came a cowled shudder in the air. And after it had passed the deep cracked voice of a nearby bullfrog called loudly in Ballyragan. The Omadhan. Omadhan. Omadhan, it said. From a slow three over near the hedge an owl cried, surprised and trembling. Who oh oh? Who oh oh? it axed. At that every frog in the meadow, and there must have been ten thousand of them, took up the answer, and shrieked shrill and high together. Darby Ogil. Darby Ogil. Darby Ogil, sang they. The Omadhan. The Omadhan, cried the wheezy master frog again. Huo. Huo, axed the owl. Darby Ogil. Darby Ogil, screamed the rollicking chorus. And that way they were going over and over again until the bold man was just about to creep off to another spot when, sudden, a hundred slow shadows, stirring up the mists, crept from the mountain way toward him. First he must find was Rosie among the herd. To creep quiet as a cat through the hedge and reach the first cow was only a minute's work. Then his plan, to wait till cockcrow, with all other sober, sensible thoughts, went clean out of the lad's head before his rage. For cropping eagerly the long, sweet grass, the first baste he met, was Rosie. With a leap Darby was behind her, his stick falling sharply on her flanks. The ingratitude of that cow almost broke Darby's heart. Rosie turned fiercely on him, with a vicious lunge, her two horns aimed at his breast. There was no suppler boy in the parish than Darby, and well for him it was so, for the mad rush the cow gave would have caught any man the last rifle heavy on his legs. And ended his days right there. As it was, our hero sprang to one side. As Rosie passed, his left hand gripped her tail. When one of the O'Gills takes hoot of a thing, he hangs on like a bull terrier. Away he went, rushing with her. Now began a race the like of which was never heard of before or since. Ten jumps to the second, and a hundred feet to the jump. Rosie's tail standing straight up in the air, firm as an iron bar, and Darby floating straight out behind. A thousand furious fairies flying a short distance after, filling the air with wild commands and threatenings. Suddenly the sky opened for a crash of lightning that shivered the hills, and a roar of thunder that turned out of their beds every man, woman, and child in four counties. Flash after flash came the lightning, hitting on every side of Darby. If it wasn't for fear of hurting Rosie, the fairies would certainly have killed Darby. As it was, he was stiff with fear, afraid to hoot on and afraid to lave go, but flew, waving in the air at Rosie's tail like a flag. As the cow turned into the long, narrow valley which cuts into the east side of the mountain, the good people caught up with the pair, and what they didn't do to Darby, in the line of sticking pins. Pulling whiskers, and pinching wouldn't take long to tell. In troth, he was just about to let go his hood, and take the chances of a fall, when the hillside opened and, whisk. The cow turned into the mountain. Darby found himself flying down a wide, high passage which grew lighter as he went along. He heard the opening behind shut like a trap, and his heart almost stopped beating, for this was the fairy's home in the heart of Slevenamon. He was captured by them. When Rosie stopped, so stiff were all Darby's joints, that he had great trouble loosening himself to come down. He landed among a lot of angry-faced little people, each no higher than your hand, everyone wearing a green velvet cloak and a red cap. We'll take him to the king, says a red-whiskered wee chap. What he'll do to the murtherin spalpeen will be good and plenty. With that they marched our bold Darby, a prisoner, down the long passage, which every second grew wider and lighter, and fuller of little people. Sometimes, though, he met with human beings like himself, only the black charm was on them, they having been stolen at some time by the good people. He saw lost people there from every parish in Ireland, both commoners and gentry. Each was laughing, 
talking, and devarting himself with another. Off to the sides he could see small cobblers making brogues, tinkers mending pans, tailors sewing cloth, smiths hammering horseshoes, everyone merrily to his trade, making a diversion out of work. To this day Darby can't tell where the beautiful red light he now saw came from. It was like a soft glow, only it filled the place, making things brighter than day. Down near the center of the mountain, was a room twenty times higher and broader than the biggest church in the world. As they drew near this room, there arose the sound of a reel played on bagpipes. The music was so bewitching that Darby, who was the gracefulest real dancer in all Ireland, could hardly make his feet behave themselves. At the room's edge Darby stopped short and caught his breath, the sight was so entrancing. Set over the broad floor were thousands and thousands of the good people, facing this way and that, and dancing to a reel. While on a throne in the middle of the room sat old Brian Connors, king of the fairies, blowing on the bagpipes. The little king, with a gold crown on his head, wearing a beautiful green velvet coat and red knee breeches, sat with his legs crossed, beating time with his foot to the music. There were many from Darby's own parish. And what was his surprise to see there Maureen McGibney, his own wife's sister, whom he had supposed resting dacently in her grave in holy ground these three years. She had flowers in her brown hair, a fine color in her cheeks, a gown of white silk and gold, and her green mantle raced to the heels of her pretty red slippers. There she was, gliding back and forth, furnished a little gray whiskered, round stomached fairy man, as though there was never a care nor a sorrow in the world. As I told you before, I tell you again, Darby was the finest real dancer in all Ireland, and he came from a family of dancers, though I say it who shouldn't, as he was my mother's own cousin. Three things in the world banish sorrow, love and whiskey and music. So, when the surprise of it all melted a little, Darby's feet led him into the thick of the throng, right under the throne of the king, where he flung care to the winds. And put his heart and mind into his two nimble feet. Darby's dancing was such that pretty soon those around stood still to admire. There's a saying come down in our family through generations which I still hood to be true, that the better the music the acier the step. Sure never did mortal men dance to so fine a chun and never so supple a dancer did such a chun meet up with. Fair and graceful he began. Backward and forward, sidestep and turn. Cross over, then forward, a hand on his hip and his stick twirling free, sidestep and forward, cross over again, bow to his partner, and hammer the floor. It wasn't long till half the dancers crowded around admiring, clapping their hands, and shouting encouragement. The old king grew so excited that he laid down the pipes, took up his fiddle, came down from the throne, and standing furnished Darby began a finer chun than the first. The dancing lasted a whole hour, no one speaking a word except to cry out, Foot it, ye divil. AC now, he's threading on flowers. Huru. Huru. Hooray. Then the king stopped and said. Well, that baits Banagher, and Banagher baits the world. Who are you, and how came you here? Then Darby up and tooed the whole story. When he had finished, the king looked serious. I'm glad you came, and I'm sorry you came, he says. If we had put our charm on you outside to bring you in, you'd never die till the end of the world, when we here must all go to hell. But, he added quickly, there's no use in worrying about that now. That's neither here nor there. Those willing to come with us can't come at all, at all. And here you are of your own free act and will. Howsomever, you're here, and we daren't let you go outside to tell others of what you have seen, and so give us a bad name about, about taking things, you know. We'll make you as comfortable as we can, and so you won't worry about Bridget and the child her, I'll have a gold sovereign left with them every day of their lives. But I wish we had the calm either on you, he says, with a sigh, for it's AC to see your great company. Now come up to my place and have a noggin of punch for friendship's sake, says he. That's how Darby Ogle began his six months' stay with the good people. Not a thing was left undone to make Darby contented and happy. A civiler people than the good people he never met. 
At first he couldn't get over saying, God keep all here, and God save you kindly, and things like that, which was like burning them with a hot iron. If it weren't for Maureen McGibney, Darby would be in sleeve on at this hour. Sure she was always the wise girl, ready with her crafty plans and warnings. On a day when they two were sitting alone together, she says to him. Darby, dear, says she, it isn't right for a dacent man of family to be spending his days cavortin' and idlin'. And fillin' the hours with sport and nonsense. We must get you out of here, for what is a sovereign a day to compare with the care and protection of a father, she says. Through for ye. Moan Darby, and my heart is just split tin for a sight of Bridget and the child her. Bad luck to the day I set so much store on a dirty, ungrateful, treacherous cow. I know well how you feel, says Maureen, for I'd give the whole world to say three words to Bob Broderick. That ye tell me that out of grief for me has never kept company with any other girl till this day. But that'll never be, she says, because I must stop here till the day of judgment, and then I must go to, says she, beginning to cry, but if you get out, you and bear a message to Bob for me. Maybe? She says. It's acy to talk about going out, but how can it be done, asked Darby. There's a way, says Maureen, wiping her big gray eyes, but it may take years. First, you must know that the good people can never put their charm on anyone who is willing to come with them. That's why you came safe. Then, Agin, they can't work harm in the daylight, and after cockcrow any mortal eye can see them plain. Nor can they harm anyone who has a sprig of holly, nor pass over a leaf or twig of holly, because that's Christmas bloom. Well, there's a certain evil word for a charm that opens the side of the mountain, and I will try to find it out for you. Without that word, the armies of the world couldn't get out or in. But you must be patient and wise, and wait. I will so, with the help of God, says Darby. At these words, Maureen gave a terrible screech. Cruel man! She cried, don't you know that to say pious words to one of the good people, or to one under their black charm, is like cutting him with a knife? The next night she came to Darby again. Watch yourself now, she says, for tonight they're going to lave the door of the mountain open, to thryu, and if you stir two steps outside they'll put the commuter on you, she says. Sure enough, when Darby took his walk down the passage, after supper, as he did every night, there the side of the mountain lay wide open and no one in sight. The temptation to make one rush was great, but he only looked out a minute, and went whistling back down the passage, knowing well that a hundred hidden eyes were on him the while. For a dozen nights after it was the same. At another time Maureen said. The king himself is going to thryu hard the day, so beware. She had no sooner said the words than Darby was called for, and went up to the king. Darby, my soul, says the king, in a Southern way, have this noggin of punch. A bet there never was brewed. It's the last we'll have for many a day. I'm going to set you free, Darby Ogil, that's what I am. Why, king, says Darby, putting on a mournful face, how have I offended ye? No offense at all, says the king, only we're depriving you. No depravity in life, says Darby. I have lashins and lavings to eat and to drink, and nothing but fun and diversion all day long. Out in the world it was nothing but work and trouble and sickness, disappointment and care. But Bridget and the child her, says the king, giving him a sharp look out of half-shut eyes. Oh, as for that, king, says Darby, it's easier for a widow to get a husband, or for orphans to find a father, than it is for them to pick up a sovereign a day. The king looked mighty satisfied and smoked for a while without a word. Would you mind going out an evening now and then, help in the boys to mind the cows, he asked at last. Darby feared to thrust himself outside in their company. Well, I'll tell ye how it is, replied my brave Darby. Some of the neighbors might see me, and spread the report on me that I'm with the fairies, and that'd disgrace Bridget and the child her, he says. The king knocked the ashes from his pipe. You're a wise man besides being the hoid of good company, 
says he, and it's sorry I am you didn't take me at my word. For then we would have you always, at last till the day of judgment, when, but that's neither here nor there. Howsomever, we'll bother you about it no more. From that day they thrated him as one of their own. It was one day five months after that Maureen plucked Darby by the coat and led him off to a lonely spot. I've got the word, she says. Have you, Faith? What is it, says Darby, all of a thrimble. Then she whispered a word so blasphemous, so irreligious, that Darby blessed himself. When Maureen saw him making the sign, she fell down in a fit, the holy emblem hurt her so, poor child. Three hours after this me bold Darby was sitting at his own fireside talking to Bridget and the child her. The neighbors were hurrying to him, down every road and through every field, carrying armfuls of holly bushes, as he had sent word for them to do. He knew well he'd have fierce and savage visitors before morning. After they had come with the holly, he had them make a circle of it so thick around the house that a fly couldn't walk through without touching a twig or a leaf. But that was not all. You'll know what a wise girl and what a crafty girl that Maureen was when you hear what the neighbors did next. They made a second ring of holly outside the first, so that the house sat in two great wreaths, one wreath around the other. The outside ring was much the bigger, and left a good space between it and the first, with room for ever so many people to stand there. It was like the inner ring, except for a little gate, left open as though by accident, where the fairies could walk in. But it wasn't an accident at all, only the wise plan of Maureen's. For nearby this little gap, in the outside wreath, lay a sprig of holly with a bit of twine tied to it. Then the twine ran along up to Darby's house, and in through the window, where its end lay convenient to his hand. A little pull on the twine would drag the stray piece of holly into the gap, and close tight the outside ring. It was a trap, you see. When the fairies walked in through the gap, the twine was to be pulled, and so they were to be made prisoners between the two rings of holly. They couldn't get into Darby's house, because the circle of holly nearest the house was so tight that a fly couldn't get through without touching the blessed tree or its wood. Likewise, when the gap in the outer wreath was closed, they couldn't get out again. Well, anyway, these things were hardly finished and fixed, when the dusky brown of the hills warned the neighbors of twilight, and they scurried like frightened rabbits to their homes. Only one amongst them all had courage to sit inside Darby's house waiting the dreadful visitors, and that one was Bob Broderick. What vengeance was in store couldn't be guessed at all, at all, only it was sure that it was to be more terrible than any yet wreaked on mortal man. Not in Darby's house alone was the terror, for in their anger the good people might lay waste the whole parish. The roads and fields were empty and silent in the darkness. Not a window glimmered with light for miles around. Many a blackguard who hadn't said a prayer for years was now down on his marrow bones among the dacent members of his family, thumping his craw, and roaring his pathair and avies. In Darby's quiet house, against which the cunning, the power, and the fury of the good people would first break, you can't think of half the suffering of Bridget and the child her. As they lay huddled together on the settle bed. Nor of the strain on Bob and Darby, who sat smoking their dedeens and whispering anxiously together. For some reason or other the good people were long in coming. Ten o'clock struck, then eleven, after that twelve, and not a sound from the outside. The silence and then no sign of any kind had them all just about crazy, when suddenly there fell a sharp rap on the door. Milia Murther, whispered Darby, we're in for it. They've crossed the two rings of holly, and are at the door itself. The child had begun to cry and Bridget said her prayers out loud, but no one answered the knock. Rap, 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 on the door, then a pause. God save all here, cried a queer voice from the outside. Now no fairy would say, God save all here, so Darby took heart and opened the door. Who should be standing there but Sheila Maguire, a spy for the good people? So angry were Darby and Bob that they snatched her within the threshold, and before she knew it they had her tied hand and foot, wound a cloth around her mouth, and rolled her under the bed. Within the minute a thousand rustling voices sprung from outside. 
Through the window, in the clear moonlight, Darby marked weeds and grass being trampled by invisible feet, beyond the farthest ring of holly. Suddenly broke a great cry. The gap in the first ring was found. Signs were plainly seen of uncountable feet rushing through, and spreading about the nearer wreath. After that a howl of madness from the little men and women. Darby had pulled his twine and the trap was closed, with five thousand of the good people entirely at his mercy. Princes, princesses, dukes, duchesses, earls, earlesses, and all the quality of Slevenamon were prisoners. Not more than a dozen of the last to come escaped, and they flew back to tell the king. For an hour they raged. All the bad names ever called to mortal man were given free, but Darby said never a word. Pickpocket, sheepstailer, murtherin, thief of a blackguard, were the softest words trun at him. By and by, howsomever, as it begun to grow near to cockcrow, their talk grew a great deal civiler. Then came Beggin, Pladin, Promisin, and Inthraton, but the doors of the house still stayed shut and its windows down. Pretty soon Darby's old rooster, Terry, came down from his perch, yawned, and flapped his wings a few times. At that the terror and the screechin' of the good people would have melted the heart of a stone. All of a sudden a fine, clear voice rose from Bayant the crowd. The king had come. The other fairies grew still, listening. Ye murtherin' thief of the world, says he king grandly, what are ye doin' with my people? Keep a civil tongue in your head, Brian Connor, says Darby, sticking his head out the window, for I'm as good a man as you, any day, says Darby. At that minute Terry, the cock, flapped his wings and crowed. In a flash there sprang into full view the crowd of good people, dukes, earls, princes, quality, and commoners, with their ladies, jammed thick together about the house. Every one of them with his head thrown back bawling and crying, and tears as big as pigeon eggs rolling down his cheeks. A few feet away, on a straw pile in the barnyard, stood the king, his gold crown tilted on the side of his head, his long green cloak about him, and his rod in his hand, but trembling all over. In the middle of the crowd, but towering high above them all, stood Maureen McGibney in her cloak of green and gold, her putty brown hair fallen down on her shoulders. And she, the crafty villain, cryin' and bawlin' and Abu Sin Darby, with the best of them. Waddle you haven't let them go, says the king. First and foremost, says Darby, take your spell off that slip of a girl there, and send her into the house. In a second Maureen was standing inside the door, her both arms about Bob's neck, and her head on his collarbone. What they said to each other, and what they done in the way of embracin' and kissin' and cryin', I won't take time in telling you. Next, says Darby, send back Rosie and the pigs. I expected that, says the king. And at those words they saw a black bunch coming through the air, in a few seconds Rosie and the three pigs walked into the stable. Now, says Darby, Promise in the name of old Nick, tis by him the good people swear, never to moil nor meddle again with any one or anything from this parish. The king was fair put out by this. Howsomever, he said at last, you ungrateful scoundrel, in the name of old Nick, I promise. So far, so good, says Darby, but the worst is yet to come. Now you must raylace from your spell every soul you've stole from this parish and besides, you must send me ten thousand pounds in gould. Well, the king gave a roar of anger that was heard in the next barony. Ye high-handed, hard-hearted robber, he says, I'll never consent, he says. Plays yourself, says Darby. I see Father Cassidy comin' down the hedge, he says, and he has a prayer for ye all in his book that'll burn ye up like wisps of shraw ef he ever catches ye here, says Darby. With that the roaring and bawling was pitiful to hear, and in a few minutes a bag with ten thousand gold sovereigns in it was trun at Darby's threshold. And fifty people, young and some of them old, flew over and stood beside the king. Some of them had spent years with the fairies. Their relatives thought them dead and buried. They were the lost ones from that parish. With that Darby pulled the bit of twine again, opening the trap 
and it wasn't long until every fairy was gone. The green coat of the last one was hardly out of sight when, sure enough, who should come up but Father Cassidy, his book in his hand. He looked at the fifty people who had been with the fairy standin', there, the poor cratchers, tremblin', and wonderin', and afeard to go to their homes. Darby tooed him what had happened. Ye foolish man, says the priest, you could have got out every poor prisoner that's locked in sleeve naman, let alone those from this parish. One could have scraped with a knife the surprise off Darby's face. Would your reverence have me let out the Corconians, the Connaught men, and the Fardowns, I ask ye, he says hotly. When Mrs. Maloney there goes home and finds that Tim has married the widow Hogan, ye'll say I let out too many, even of this parish, I'm thinking, dot. But, says the priest, ye might have got ten thousand pounds for H of us. If H had ten thousand pounds, what comfort would I have in being rich? asked Darby again. To enjoy well being rich, there should be plenty of poor, says Darby. God forgive ye, ye selfish man, says Father Cassidy. There's another racin besides, says Darby. I never got better nor friendlier thraitment than I had from the good people. And the divil a hair of their heads I'd hurt more than need be, he says. Some way or other the king heard of this saying, and was so mightily pleased that next night a jug of the finest poteen was left at Darby's door. After that, indeed, many's the winter night, when the snow lay so heavy that no neighbor was stirring, and when Bridget and the child her were in bed, Darby sat by the fire. A noggin of hot punch in his hand, arguing and getting news of the whole world. A little man, with a gold crown on his head, a green cloak on his back, and one foot thrown over the other, sat furnished him by the hearth. Darby Ogil and the Leprechaun The news that Darby Ogil had spent six months with the good people spread fast and far and wide. At fair or hurlin or market he would be backed be a crowd egg in some convenient wall, and there for hours men, women, and child her, with jaws droppin'. And eyes bulgined stand furnished him listening to half-frightened questions or to bold mysterious answers. Alway, though, one bit of wise adwise int his disgorge, neither make nor moil nor meddle with the fairies, Darby'd say. If you're going along the lonely barine at night, and you hear, from some fairy fort, a sound of fiddles, or of piping, or of sweet voices singing, or of little feet pattering in the dance. Don't turn your head, but say your prayers and hoot on your way. The pleasures the good people share with you have a sore sorrow hid in them, and the gifts they'll offer are only made to break hearts with. Things went this away till one day in the market, over among the cows, Mortine Cavanaugh, the schoolmaster, a cross-faced, argifying old man he was, contradicted Darby Pint Blank. Stay a bit, says Mortine, catching Darby by the coat collar. You forget about the little fairy cobbler, the leprechaun, he says. You can't deny that to catch the leprechaun is great luck entirely. If one only fix the glance of his eye on the cobbler. That look makes the fairy a prisoner, one can do anything with him as long as a human look covers the little lad, and he'll give the favors of three wishes to buy his freedom, says Mortine. At that Darby, smiling high and knowledgeable, made answer over the heads of the crowd. God help your sense, honest man, he says. Around the favors of thim same three wishes is a bog of thricks and cajoleries and conditions that'll defeat the wisest. First of all, if the look be taken from the little cobbler for as much as the wink of an eye, he's gone forever, he says. Man alive, even when he does grant the favors of the three wishes, you're not safe, for, if you tell anyone you've seen the leprechaun, the favors melt like snow. Or if you make a fourth wish that day, whiff. They turn to smoke. Take my advice, neither make nor moil nor meddle with the fairies. Throw for ye, spoke up long Pether McCarthy, siding in with Darby. Didn't Barney McBride, on his way to early mass one May morning, catch the fairy cobbler sewing and workin' away under a hedge? Have a pinch of snuff, Barney Agra, says the leprechaun, handing up the little snuff box. But, mind ye, when my poor Barney bent to take a thumb and finger full what did the little villain do but fling the box, snuff and all, 
into Barney's face. And, Finn, whilst the poor lad was winkin' and blinkin', the leprechaun gave one leap and was lost in the reeds. Finn again, there was Peggy O'Rourke, who captured him fair and square in a hawthorn bush. In spite of his wiles she wrung from him the favors of the three wishes. Knowing, of course, that if she told anyone of what happened to her the spell was broken, and the wishes wouldn't come through, she hurried home. Aching and longing to in some way find from her husband, Andy, what wishes she'd make. Throwing open her door, she said, What would ye wish for most in the world, Andy dear? Tell me and, your wish'll come true, says she. A peddler was crying his wares out in the lane. Lanterns, tin lanterns, cried the peddler. I wish I had one of thin lanterns, says Andy, careless and bend in over to get a coal for his pipe, when, lo and behold, there was a lantern in his hand. Well, so vexed was Peggy that one of her fine wishes should be wasted on a paltry tin lantern that she lost all patience with him. Why, thin, bad scram to you, says she, not Mindin, her own words, I wish the lantern was fastened to the IND of your nose. The word wasn't well out of her mouth till the lantern was hung swinging from the IND of Andy's nose in a way that the wit of man couldn't loosen. It took the third and last of Peggy's wishes to relays Andy. Look at that now, cried a dozen voices from the admiring crowd. Darby said so from the first. Well, after a time people used to come from miles around to see Darby. And sit under the straw stack beside the stable to advise with our hero about their most important business, what was the best time for the set tin of hens and what was good to cure colic in childhood. And things like that. Any man so persecuted with admiration and herification might a easily feel his chest swell out a bit, so it's no wonder that Darby set himself up for a knowledgeable man. He took to talking slow and shut tin one eye when he listened, and he walked with a knowledgeable twist to his childers. He grew monstrously fond of fairs and public gatherings, where people made much of him, and he lost every ounce of liking he ever had for hard work. Things went on with him in this way from bad to worse, and where it would have ended no man knows. If one unlucky morning he hadn't refused to bring in a creel of turf his wife Bridget had axed him to fetch her. The unfortunate man said it was no work for the likes of him. The last word was still on Darby's lips when he realized his mistake and he'd have give the world to have the sayin back again. For a minute you could have heard a pin drop. Bridget, instead of being in a hurry to begin at him, was cruel deliberate. She planted herself at the door, her two fists on her hips and her lips shut. The look Julius Caesar throw at a servant girl he'd caught stealing sugar from the rile cupboard was the glance she waved up and down from Darby's toes to his head and from his head to his brogues. Agin. Thin she began and talked steady as a fall of hail that has now and then a bit of lightning and thunder mixed in it. The knowledgeable man stood pretending to brush his hat and trying to look brave, but the heart inside of him was melting like butter. Bridget began a easily be carelessly mentioning a few of Darby's best known weaknesses. After that she took up some of them not so well known, being ones Darby himself had serious doubts about having at all. But on these last she was more savare than on the first. Through it all he daren't say a word, he only smiled lofty and bit there. Twas but natural next for Bridget to explain what a poor crusher her husband was on the day she got him and what she might have been if she had married ate her one of the six others who had axed her. The step for her was a little one thin to the shortcomings and misfortunes of his blood relations, which she follied back to the blackguardisms of his fourth cousin, Philly McFadden. Even in his misery poor Darby couldn't but marvel at her wonderful memory. By the time she began talking of her own family, and especially about her Aunt Honoria O'Shaughnessy, who had once shook hands with a bishop, and who in the rebellion of ninety-eight had trun a brick at a Lord Lieutenant, when he was riding by, Darby was as wilted and as forlorn-looking as a rooster caught out in the winter rain. He lost more pride in those few minutes than it had taken months to gather and poured. It kept falling in great drops from his forehead. Just as Bridget was lading up to what Father Cassidy calls a peroration, that being the part of your wife's discourse when, 
after telling you all that she's done for you. And all she's stood from your relations, she breaks down and cries, and so smothers you entirely, just as she was coming to that, I say, Darby scrooged his cabine down on his head. Stuck his fingers in his two ears, and making one grand rush through the door, bolted as fast as his legs could carry him down the road toward the Slevenamon Mountains. Bridget stood on the step looking after him too surprised for a word. With his fingers still in his ears, so that he couldn't hear her commands to turn back, he ran without stopping till he came to the willow tree near Joey Hooligan's forge. There he slowed down to fill his lungs with the fresh, sweet air. Twas one of those warm-hearted, laughing autumn days which steals for a while the bonnet and shawl of the May. The sun from a sky of feathery whiteness, leaned over, telling jokes to the world and, the gould harvest fields and purple hills, lazy and contented, laughed back at the sun. Even the blackbird flying over the haw tree looked down and, sang to those below, God save all here, and, the linnet from her bow answered back quick and, sweet, God save you kindly, sir. With such pleasant sights and sounds and twitterings at every side, our hero didn't feel the time passing till he was on top of the first hill of the Slevenamon Mountains, which, as everyone knows, is called the Pig's Head. It wasn't quite lonesome enough on the Pig's Head, so our hero plunged into the valley and climbed the second mountain, the Devil's Pillow, where twas lonesome and disarmed enough to shoot anyone. Beneath the shade of a three, for the days was warm, he sat himself down in the long, sweet grass, lit his pipe, and let his mind go free. But, as he did, his thoughts rose together, like a flock of frightened, angry pheasants, and a word back to the audacious things Bridget had said about his relations. Wasn't she the mendagious, humbrageous woman, he thought, to say such things about as elegant stock as the O'Gills and the O'Grady's? Why, Woolam Ogill, Darby's uncle, at that minute was head butler at Castle Brophy. And was known far and wide as being one of the finest scholars and as having the most beautiful pair of legs in all Ireland. This same Woolam Ogill had tooed Bridget in Darby's own hearing, on a day when the three were going through the great picture gallery at Castle Brophy. That the O'Gills at one time had been kings in Ireland. Darby never since could remember whether this time was before the flood or after the flood. Bridget said it was during the flood, but surely that saying was nonsense. Howsomever, Darby knew his uncle Woolham was right, for he often felt in himself the signs of greatness. And now, as he sat alone on the grass, he said out loud. If I had me rights I'd be doing nothing all day long but sittin' on a throne. And playin' games of forty-five with me Lord Liftenant and some of me generals. There never was a lord that liked good aiding or drinking better nor I or who hates worse to get up early in the morning. That last disloik, I'm tood, is a great sign entirely of gentle blood the world over, says he. As for his wife's people, the O'Hagans and the O'Shaughnessys, well, they were no great shakes, he said to himself, at last so far as looks were concerned. All the handsomeness in Darby's childhood came from his own side of the family. Even Father Cassidy said the childhood took after the O'Gills. If I were rich, says Darby to a lazy old bumblebee who was droning and tumbling in front of him, I'd have a castle like Castle Brophy, with a great picture gallery in it. On one wall I'd put the pictures of the O'Gills and the O'Grady's, and on the wall Fernand's them I'd have the O'Hagans and the O'Shaughnessy's. At that idea his heart bubbled in a new and fierce delight. Bridget's people, he says Agan, scowling at the bee, would look four times as common as they rarely are, when they were compared in that way with my own relations. And whenever Bridget got rampageous, I'd take her in and show her the difference betwixt the two clans, just to punish her, so I would. How long the lad sat that way warming the cowled thoughts of his heart with drowsy pleasant dreams and misty longings he don't rightly know, when, tack, 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 came the busy sound of a little hammer from the other side of a fallen oak. Be jingo, he says to himself with a start, tis the leprechaun that's in it. In a second he was on his hands and knees, the tails of his coat flung across his back, and he crawling softly toward the sound of the hammer. Quiet as a mouse he lifted himself up on the mossy log to look over, 
and there, before his two popping eyes, was a sight of one Horatian. Sitting on a white stone, and working away like fury, hammering pegs into a little red shoe, half the size of your thumb, was a bald-headed old cobbler of about twice the height of your hand. On the top of a round snub nose was perched a pair of horn-rimmed spectacles, and a narrow fringe of iron-gray whiskers grew under his stubby chin. The brown leather apron he wore was so long that it covered his green knee breeches and almost hid the knitted gray stockings. The leprechaun, for it was he indeed, as he worked, mumbled and muttered in great discontent. Oh, haven't I the hard, hard luck, he said. I'll never have Thim done in time for her to dance in tonight. So, Thin, I'll be kilt entirely, says he. Was there ever another queen of the fairies as wearing on shoes and brogues and dancin' slippers? Haven't I the, looking up, he saw Darby. The top of the day to you, dasent man, says the cobbler, jumpin' up. Giving a sharp cry, he pint quick at Darby's stomach. But, weera, weera, what's that woolly ugly thing you have crawlin' and creepin' on your waistcoat? he said, pretendin' to be all excited. Sorry thing on my waistcoat, answered Darby, cool as ice, or anywhere else, that'll make me take my two bright eyes off and you, not for a second, says he. Well. Well. Will you look at that, now? Laughed the cobbler. Mark how quick and handy he took me up. Will you have a pinch of snuff, clever man, he axed, hooting up the little box. Is it the same snuff you gave Barney McBride a while ago, axed Darby, sarcastic. Lave off your foolishness, says our hero, growin' fierce, and grant me at once the favors of the three wishes, or I'll have you smoking like a herring in my own chimney before nightfall. Says he. At that the leprechaun, seeing he but wasted time on so knowledgeable a man as Darby Ogil, surrendered and granted the favors of the three wishes. What is it you ask? Says the cobbler, himself turning on a sudden very sour and sullen. First and foremost, says Darby, I want a home of my ancestors, and it must be a castle like Castle Brophy, with pictures of my kith and kin on the wall. And then facing them pictures of my wife Bridget's kith and kin on the other wall. That favor I give you, that wish I grant ye, says the fairy, making the shape of a castle on the ground with his all. What next, he grunted. I want gold enough for me and my generations to enjoy in grandeur the place forever. Always the gold, sneered the little man, bending to draw with his all on the turf the shape of a purse. Now for your third and last wish. Have a care. I want the castle set on this hill, the devil's pillow, where we two stand, says Darby. Then sweeping with his arm, he says, I want the land about to be my domain. The leprechaun struck his all on the ground. That wish I give you, that wish I grant you, he says. With that he straightened himself up, and, grinning most aggravatin', the while, he looked Darby over from top to toe. You're a foin knowledgeable man, but have a care of the fourth wish, says he. Because there was more of a challenge than friendly warning in what the small lad said, Darby snapped his fingers at him and cried. Have no fear, little man. If I got all Ireland ground for making a fourth wish, however small, before midnight, I'd not make it. I'm going home now to fetch Bridget and the child her, and the only fear or uneasiness I have is that you'll not keep your word, so as to have the castle here ready before us when I come back. Oh ho! I'm not to be thrusted, amen't I, screeched the little lad, flaring into a blazing passion. He jumped upon the log that was betwixt them and, with one fist behind his back, shook the other at Darby. You ignorant, auspicious-minded blackguard, says he. How dare the likes of you say the likes of that to the likes of me, cried the cobbler. I'd have you to know, he says, that I had a reputation for truth and veracity equal, if not superior to the best, before you were born, he shouted. I'll take no high talk from a man that's afraid to give words to his own wife when she's in a tantrum, says the leprechaun. It's acy to know you're not a married man, says Darby, mighty scornful, be case if you. The lad stopped short, forgetting what he was going to say in his surprise and agitation. 
for the far side of the mountain was waving up and down before his eyes like a great green blanket that is being shook by two women. While at the same time high spots of turf on the hillside toppled sidewise to level themselves up with the low places. The enchantment had already begun to make things ready for the castle. A dozen foin threes that stood in a little groove bent their heads quickly together, and thin by some invisible hand they were plucked up by the roots and dropped aside. Much the same as a man might grasp a handful of weeds and fling them from his garden. The ground under the knowledgeable man's feet began to rumble and heave. He waited for no more. With a cry that was half of gladness and half of fear, he turned on his heel and started on a run down into the wally, leaving the little cobbler standing on the log. Shouting abuse after him and ballyragging him as he ran. So excited was Darby that, going up the pig's head. He was nearly run over by a crowd of great brown building stones which were moving down slow and orderly like a flock of driven sheep, but they moved without so much as bruising a blade of grass or bend in a twig. As they came. Only once, and that at the top of the pig's head, he threw a look back. The devil's pillow was in a great commotion, a whirlwind was sweeping over it, whether of dust or of mist he couldn't tell. After this, Darby never looked back again, or to the right or the left of him, but kept straight on till he found himself, panting and puffing, at his own kitchen door. Twas ten minutes before he could spake, but at last, when he tooed Bridget to make ready herself and the child her to go up to the devil's pillow with him. For once in her life that remarkable woman, without axing, how comes it so? What racin have you, or why should I do it, set to work washing the childer's faces? Maybe she dabbed a little more soap in their eyes than was needful, for it was a habit she had. Though this time, if she did, not a whimper broke from the little Hayros. For the matter of that, not one word, good, bad, or indifferent, did herself spake till the whole family were trudging down the lane two by two, marching like soldiers. As they came near the first hill, along its sides, the evening twilight turned from purple to brown, and at the top of the pig's head the darkness of a black night swooped suddenly down on them. Darby hurried on a step or two ahead, and resting his hand upon the large rock that crowns the hill, looked anxiously over to the devil's pillow. Although he was ready for something foin, yet the greatness of the foinness that met his gaze knocked the breath out of him. Across the deep wally, and on top of the second mountain, he saw lined against the evening sky the roof of an immense castle, with towers and peripets and battlements. Under the towers a thousand sullen windows glowed red in the black walls. Castle Brophy couldn't hoot a candle to it. Behold! Says Darby, flinging out his arms and turning to his wife, who had just come up, behold the castle of my ancestors, who were my forefathers. How, says Bridget, quick and scornful, how could your ancestors be your forefathers? What Darby was going to say to her he don't just remember, for at that instant, from the right-hand side of the mountain, came a cracking of whips, a rattling of wheels, and the rush of horses. And, lo and behold! A great dark coach with flashing lamps, and drawn by four coal-black horses, dashed up the hill and stopped beside them. Two shadowy men were on the driver's box. Is this Lord Darby Ogle? axed one of them in a deep, muffled voice. Before Darby could reply, Bridget took the words out of his mouth. It is, she cried, in a kind of a half-cheer, and Lady Ogle and the child her. Then hurry up, says the coachman, your supper's gettin' cowled. Without waiting for anyone, Bridget flung open the carriage door, and pushin' Darby aside, jumped in among the cushions. Darby, his heart sizzling with vexation at her audaciousness, lifted in one after another the child her, and then got in himself. He couldn't understand at all the change in his wife, for she had always been the utterliest, modestest woman in the parish. Well, he'd no sooner shut the door than crack went the whip, the horses gave a spring, the carriage jumped, and down the hill they went. For fastness there was never another carriage ride like that before nor since. Darby hilt tight with both hands to the window, his face pressed against the glass. He couldn't tell whether the horses were only flying, 
or whether the coach was falling down the hill into the wally. By the hollow feeling in his stomach he thought they were falling. He was striving to think of some prayers when there came a terrible jolt, which sent his two heels against the roof, and his head betwixt the cushions. As he righted himself the wheels began to grate on a graveled road, and plainly they were dashing up the side of the second mountain. Even so, they couldn't have gone far when the carriage drew up in a flurry, and he saw through the gloom a high iron gate being slowly opened. Pass on, said a voice from somewhere in the shadows, their suppers getting cowled. As they flew under the great archway Darby had a glimpse of the thing which had opened the gate, and had said their supper was getting cowled. It was standing on its hind legs, in the darkness he couldn't be quite sure as to its shape, but it was either a bear or a loin. His mind was in a pond her about this when, with a swirl and a bump, the carriage stopped another time. And now it stood before a broad flight of stone steps which led up to the main door of the castle. Darby, half afraid, peering out through the darkness, saw a square of light high above him which came from the open hall door. Three servants in livery stood waiting on the thrashel. Make haste, make haste, says one in a doleful voice, their suppers gettin' cowled. Hearing these words, Bridget immediately bounced out and was halfway up the steps before Darby could catch her and hoot her till the child her came on. I never in all my life saw her so audacious, he says, half cryin', and linkin' her arm to keep her back, and thin, with the child her follying, two by two, according to size. The whole family paraded up the steps till Darby, with a gasp of Deloitte, stopped on the thrashel of a splendid hall. From a high ceiling hung great flags from every nation and domination, which swung and swayed in the dazzling light. Two lines of men and maid servants, dressed in silks and satins and brocades, stood facing each other, bowing and smiling and waving their hands in welcome. The two lines stretched down to the gould stairway at the far end of the hall. For half of one minute, Darby, every eye in his head as big as a teacup, stood hesitating. Thin he said, why should it flutter me? Ara, ain't it all mine? Aren't all these people in me pay? I'll engage it's a pretty penny all this grandeur is costing me to keep up this minute. He threw out his chest. Come on Bridget, he says, let's go into the home of my ancestors. How endeavor, scarcely had he stepped into the beautiful place, when two pipers with their pipes, two fiddlers with their fiddles, two flute players with their flutes. And, they dressed in scarlet and gould, stepped out in front of him, and thus to melodious music the family proudly marched down the hall, climbed up the golden stairway at its IND. And Thin turned to enter the biggest room Darby had ever seen. Something in his sow whispered that this was the picture gallery. Be the powers of Pewther, says the knowledgeable man to himself, I wouldn't be in Bridget's place this minute for a hatful of money. Wait, oh just wait, till she has to compare her own relations with my own foin people. I know how she'll feel, but I wonder what she'll say, he says. The thought that all the unjust things. All the unreasonable things Bridget had said about his kith and kin were just going to be disproved and turned against herself made him proud and almost happy. But we're us through. He should have remembered his own advice not to make nor moil nor meddle with the fairies, for here he was to get the first hard welt from the little leprechaun. It was the picture gallery sure enough, but how terribly different everything was from what the poor lad expected. There on the left wall, grand and noble, shone the pictures of Bridget's people. Of all the well-dressed, handsome, proud-appearing persons in the whole world the O'Hagans and the O'Shaughnessys would compare with the best. This was a hard enough crack, though a crushing or knock was to come. Furnance them, on the right wall, glowered the O'Gills and the O'Gradys, and of all the ragged, sheep-stealing, hangdog-looking villains one ever saw, in jail or out of jail, it was Darby's kindred. The place of honor on the right wall was given to Darby's fourth cousin, Phelim McFadden, and he was painted with a pair of handcuffs on him. Woolam Ogill had a squint in his right eye, and his thin legs bowed like hoops on a barrel. If you have ever at night been groping your way through a dark room, and got a sudden hard bump on the forehead from the edge of the door, 
you can understand the feelings of the knowledgeable man. Take that picture out, he said hoarsely, as soon as he could speak. And will someone kindly introduce me to the man who met it? Because, he says, I intend to take his life. There was never a crass-eyed Ogil since the world began, says he. Think of his horror and surprise when he saw the left eye of Woolam Ogil twist itself slowly over toward his nose and squint worse than the right eye. Pretending not to see this, and hoping no one else did, Darby fiercely led the way over to the other wall. Fronting him stood the handsome picture of Anuria O'Shaughnessy, and she dressed in a shoot of tin clothes, like the knights of old used to wear, armor I think they calls it. She hilt a spear in her hand, with a little flag on the blade, and her smile was proud and high. Take that likeness out too, says Darby, very spiteful. That's not a dacent shoot of clothes for any woman to wear. The next minute you might have knocked him down with a feather, for the picture of Anuria O'Shaughnessy opened its mouth and stuck out its tongue at him. The supper's getting cowled, the supper's getting cowled, someone cried at the other IND of the picture gallery two big doors were swung open. And glad enough was our poor hero to folly the musicianers down to the room where the aiding and drinking were to be transacted. This was a little room with lots of looking glasses, and it was bright with a thousand candles, and white with the shiningest marble. On the table was biled beef and reddish and carrots and roast mutton and all kinds of important aiding and drinking. Beside these stood fruits and sweets and, but sure what is the use in talking. A high-backed chair stood ready for each of the family, and twas a lovely sight to see them all when they were sitting there, Darby at the head, Bridget at the foot. The childer, the poor little patriarchs, sitting bolt upright on each side, with a bewigged and befrilled serving man standing haughty behind every chair. The aiding and drinking would have begun at once, in troth there was already a bit of biled beef on Darby's plate, only that he spied a little silver bell beside him. Sure, twas one like those the quality keep to ring when they want more hot wather for their punch, but it puzzled the knowledgeable man, and twas the beginning of his misfortune. I wonder, he thought, if tis here for the same raison as the bell is at the curric races, do they ring this one so that all at the table will start aiding and drinking fair? And no one will have the advantage. Or is it, he says to himself Agin, to ring when the head of the house thinks everyone has had enough? Haven't the quality queer ways? I'll be a long time learning them, he says. He sat silent and puzzling and staring at the biled beef on his plate, afeard to start in without ringing the bell, and dreading to risk ringing it. The grand servants towered coldly on every side, their chins tilted. But they kept throwing over their childers glances so scornful and haughty that Darby shivered at the thought of showing any uncultivation. While our hero sat thus in unisy contemplation and smoldering mortification and flurried hesitation, a powdered head was poked over his childer, and a soft beguiling voice said. Is there anything else you'd wish for? The foolish lad twisted in his chair, opened his mouth to spake, and gave a look at the bell. Shame rushed to his cheeks, he picked up a bit of the biled beef on his fork, and to consail his turpitation gave the misfortunate answer. I'd wish for a pinch of salt, if you plays, says he. Twas no sooner said than came the crash. Oh, tunderation and murderation, what a roaring crash it was. The lights winked out together at a breath, and left a pitchy, throbbing darkness. Overhead and to the sides was a roaring, smashing, crunching noise, like the ocean's madness when the wintry storm breaks egg in the carry shore. And in that roar was mingled the tearing and the splitting of the walls and the falling of the chimneys. But through all this confusion could be heard the shrill laughing voice of the leprechaun. The clever man met his fourth grand wish, it howled. Darby, a thousand wild voices screaming and mocking above him, was on his back, kicking and squirming and striving to get up, but some load hilt him down and something bound his eyes shut. Are you killed? Bridget asked her, he cried, where are the child her, he says. Instead of answer, there suddenly flashed a fierce and angry silence, and its quickness frightened the lad more than all the wild confusion before. 
T'was a full minute before he dared to open his eyes to face the horrors which he felt were standing about him. But when courage enough to look came, all he saw was the night-covered mountain, a purple sky, and a thin new moon, with one trembling gould star a hand space above its bosom. Darby struggled to his feet. Not a stone of the castle was left, not a sod of turf but what was in its old place, every sign of the little cobbler's work had melted like April snow. The very threes Darby had seen pulled up by the roots that same afternoon and now stood a waving blur below the new moon, and the nightingale was singing in their branches. A cricket chirped lonesomely on the same fallen log which had hidden the leprechaun. Bridget! Bridget! Darby called Agen and Agen. Only a sleepy owl on a distant hill answered. A shivering thought jumped into the boy's bewildered sowl. Maybe the leprechaun had stolen Bridget and the child her. The poor man turned, and for the last time darted down into the night filled Wally. Not a pool in the road he waited to go around, not a ditch in his path he didn't leap over, but ran as he never ran before, till he raced his own front door. His heart stood still as he peeped through the window. There were the child her crudled around Bridget, who sat with the youngest asleep in her lap before the fire, rocking back and forth and she crooning a happy, contented baby song. Tears of gladness crept into Darby's eyes as he looked in upon her. God bless her, he says to himself. She's the flower of the O'Hagans and the O'Shaughnessys, and she's a proud feather in the caps of the O'Gills and the O'Gradys. Twas well he had this happy thought to cheer him as he lifted the door latch. For the mainest of all the little cobbler's spiteful thricks waited in the house to meet Darby, neither Bridget nor the child her remembered a single thing of all that had happened to them during the day. They were willing to make their happy davits that they had been no farther than their own petity patch since morning. The Conversion of Father Cassidy I tood you how on cold winter nights when Bridget and the child her were in bed, old Brian Connors, king of the fairies. Used to sit visitin' at Darby Ogilus' own fireside. But I never tood you of the wild night when the king faced Father Cassidy there. Darby Ogil sat at his own kitchen fire the night after Mrs. Morrissey's burying, studying over a GRRE debate that was held at her wake. Half witted Red Durgan begun it be asking loud and sudden of the whole company, who was the greatest man that ever lived in the whole world? I want to know Perdiclar, and I'd like to know at once, he says. At that the deliberation started. Big Joey Hooligan, the smith, hilt out for Julius Caesar, because Caesar had throunced the witty woman Cleopatra. Mortine Cavanaugh, the little schoolmaster, stood up for Bonaparte, and wanted to fight Dinny's Moriarty for Disputin Agin the Frenchman. Howsomever, the starter of the raw excitement was old Mrs. Clancy. She was not what you'd call a great historian, but the parish thought her a foin, sensible woman. She said that the greatest man was Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Jews, who ate grass like a cow and grew fat on it. Could Julius Caesar or Napoleon Bonaparte do as much, she axed. Well, pretty soon everyone was talking at once, hurling at each other, as they would pave in stones, the names of poets and warriors and scholars. But after all was said and done, the mourners went away in the morning with nothing settled. So the night after, while Darby was warming his shins before his own turf fire in deep meditation and wise cogitation and cam contemplation over these high conversations, the master of the good people flew raging into the kitchen. Darby Ogil, what do you think of your wife Bridget, says he, fiercely. Fakes, I don't know what particular thing she's done, says Darby, rubbing his shins and looking troubled, but I can guess it's something mighty disagreeable. She wore her blue petticoat and her brown shawl when she went away this morning, and I always expect ructions when she puts on that shoot of clothes. Thin Agin, she looked so sour and so satisfied when she came back that I'm worried bad in my mind, you don't know how uncomfortable she can make things sometimes, quiet as she looks, says he. And well you may be worried, dasent man, says the ruler of Sleeve Naman, you'll rage and you'll roar when ye hear me. She went this day to Father Cassidy and slandered me outrageous, he says. She tooed him that you and Maureen were colloguing with a little old, wicked, 
thieving ferryman. And that if something wasn't done at once egg in him the sowls of both of ye would be destroyed entirely. When Darby found, twas not himself that was being bothered, but only the king, he grew acier in his feelings. Sure you wouldn't mind women's talk, says he, waving his hand in a lofty way. Many a good man has been given a bad name by them before this, and will be Agin, you're not the first by any manies, says he. If Bridget makes you a bad reputation, think how many years you have to live it down in. Be sensible, king, he says. But I do mind, and I must mind. Bald the little ferryman, every hair and whisker bristling, for this minute Father Cassidy is putting the bridle and saddle on his black hunter, Terror. He has a prayer book in his pocket, and he's coming to read prayers over me and to banish me into the say. Hark! Listen to that, he says. As he spoke, a shrill little voice broke into singing outside the window. Oh, what'll you do if the kittle bile's over? Sure, what'll you do but fill it again? Ah, what'll you do if you marry a soldier? But pack up your clothes and go marchin' with him. That's the signal, says the king, all excited. He's coming and I'll face him here at this hearth, but sorrow foot he'll put over that threshold, till I give him lave. Then we'll have it out face to face like men furnace this fire. When Darby heard those words great fright struck him. If a hair of his reverence head be harmed, he says, tis not you but me and my generation will be blamed for it. Please go back to Slevenam on this night, for pace and quietness sake, he begged. While Darby spoke, the ferryman was fixing one stool on top of another under the window. I'll sit at this window, says the master of the good people, wagging his head threateningly, and from there I'll give me ord hers. The throuble he's trying to bring on others is the throuble I'll throuble him with. If he comes dasent, he'll go dasent, if he comes bothering, he'll go bothered, says he. Faith, thin, your honor, the king spoke no less than the truth, for at that very minute terror, as foin a horse as ever followed hounds, was galloping down the starlit road to Darby's house. And over terror's main bent as foin a horseman as ever took a six-bar gate, Father Cassidy. On and on through the moonlight they clattered, till they came in sight of Darby's gate, where, unseen and unwisable, a score of the good people, with thorns in their fists, lay sniggering and laughing, waiting for the horse. Of course the fairies couldn't harm the good man himself, but Terror was completely at their mercy. We'll not stop to open the gate, Terror, says his reverence, patting the baste's neck. I'll give you a bit of a lift with the bridle rein and a touch like that on the flank, and do you clear it, my swallow bird? Well, sir, the priest riz in his stirrups, lifted the rein, and terror crouched for the spring, when, with a sudden snort of pain, the baste whirled round and started like the wind back up the road. His reverence pulled the horse to its haunches and swung him round once more facing the cottage. Up on his hind feet went terror and stood crazy for a second, pawing the air, then with a cry of rage and pain in his throat, the base turned, made a rush for the hedge at the roadside. And cleared it like an arrow. Now, just bayant the hedge was a bog so thin that the geese wouldn't walk on it, and so thick that the ducks couldn't swim in it. Into the middle of that cowled pond terror fell with a splash and a crash. That minute the king climbed down from the window splitting with laughter. Darby, he says, slapping his knees, Father Cassidy is floundering about in the bog outside. He's not hurt, but he's mighty cowled and uncomfortable. Do you go and make him promise not to read any prayers this night, then bring him in. Tell him that if he don't promise, by the piper that played before Moses, he may stay reading his prayers in the bog till morning, for he can't get out unless some of my people go in and help him. Says the king. Darby's heart began hammer and egg in his ribs as though it were making heavy horseshoes. If that's so, I'm a ruined man, he says. I'd give twenty pounds rather than face him now. Says he. The distracted lad put his hat on to go out, and thin he took it off to stay in. He let a groan out of him that shook all his bones. You may save him or lave him, says the king, turning to the window. 
I'm going to lave the priest see in a minute what's bothering him. If he's not out of the bog be that time, I'd advise you to lave the country. Maybe you'll only have a pair of cow's horns put on ye, but I think ye'll be kilt, he says. My own mind's AC. I wash my hands of him. That's the great comfort and advantage of having your soul salvation fixed and sartin one way or the other, says the king, peering out. When you do a thing, bad as it is or good as it may be, your mind is still AC, because, he turned from the window to look at Darby, but the lad was gone out into the moonlight. And was shrinkin' and cringin' up toward the bog, as though he were going to meet and talk with the ghost of a man he'd murdered. Twas a harsher and angrier voice than that of any ghost that came out of a great flopping and splashin' in the bog. Father Cassidy sat with his feet drawn up on terror, and the horse was half sunk in the mire. At times he urged terror over to the bank, and, just as the baste was raising to step out, with a snort, it'd whirl back again. He'd thry another side, but spur as he might, and whip as he would, the horse turned shivering back to the middle of the bog. Is that you, Darby Ogil, you vagebone, cried his reverence. Help me out of this to the dhry land so as I can take the life of you, he cried. What right has anyone to go trespassin' in my bog, musing it all up and spiling it? Says Darby, pretendin' not to recognize the priest. I keep it private for my ducks and geese, and I'll have the law on you, so I will, oh, be the powers of pewther, tis me own dear Father Cassidy, he cried. Father Cassidy, as an answer, raced for a handful of mud, which he aimed and flung so fair and through that three days after Darby was still pulling bits of it from his hair. I have a whip I'll keep private for your own two foin legs, cried his reverence. I'll take you to tell lies to the countryside about your being with the fairies, and for deluderin' your own poor wife. I came down this night to expose you. But now that's the last I'll do to you. Faith, says Darby, if I was with the fairies, tis no less than you are this minute, and, if you expose me, I'll expose you. With that Darby up and tood what was the cause of the whole botheration. His reverence, after the telling, waited not a minute, but kicked the spurs into terror, and the brave horse headed once more for shore. Twas no use. The poor baste turned at last with a cry and floundered back again into the mire. You'll not be able to get out, Father Akushla, says Darby, till you promise fair and firm not to read any prayers over the good people this night. And never to hurt or molest myself on any account. About this last promise the king is very particular entirely. You dunderheaded bulligad hon, says Father Cassidy, turning all the blame on Darby, you meanderin, marauder of the Sivan says. He says. You big-headed scorpion of the world, with bowlegs, cried he, and things like that. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Says Darby, pretendin, to be shocked, to think that me own pasture should use such terrible language. That me own dear father Cassidy could spake blaggard words like them. Every drop of blood in me is biling with scandalation. Let me beg of you and implore your reverence never again to make use of talk like that. It breaks my heart to hear you, says the villain. For a few minutes after that Darby was doing nothing but dodging handfuls of mud. While this was going on, a soft red glow, like that which hangs above the lonely raths and forts at night when the fairies are dancing in them, came over the fields. So when Father Cassidy riz in his stirrups the soft glow was resting on the bog, and there he saw two score of little men in green jackets and brown caps waiting about the pond's edge. And everyone hooting a switch in his hands. The little lads knew well twas too dark for the clergyman to read from his book any banishing prayers, and barring having too much fun, the divil a thing they had to fear. Twas fresh anger that came to Father Cassidy after the first rush of surprise and wonder. He thried now to get at the good people, to lay his hands on them. A dozen charges at the bank his reverence made. And as many times a score of the little people flew up to meet him and shruck the poor baste over the soft nose with their wands till the horse was welted back. 
Long after the struggle was proved hopeless it went on till at last the poor based, trembling and disheartened, refused to mind the spur. At that Father Cassidy gave up. I surrender, he said, and I promise for the sake of my horse, said he. The based himself understood the words, for with that he waited cam and quiet to the dhry land and stood shaking himself there among the pack of fairies. Mighty few words were passed betwixt Darby and Terror's rider as the whole party went up to Darby's stable, the little people following behind quiet and orderly. It was not long till Terror was nibbling comfortably in a stall, Father Cassidy was drying himself before the kitchen fire, the king and Darby were sitting by the side of the hearth. And two score of the green-cloaked little people were scattered about the kitchen waiting for the great debate which was sure to come betwixt his reverence and the head man of the good people. Now that the two had met. So full was the room that some of the good people sat on the shelves of the dresser, others lay on the table, their chins in their fists. Whilst little Philem Begg was perching himself on a picture above the hearth. He'd no sooner touched the picture frame than he let a howl out of him and jumped to the floor. I'm burned to the bone, says he. No wonder, says the king, looking up, twas a picture of a stee. Patrick you were sitting on. Fadrig Oge, swinging his heels, balanced himself on the edge of a churn filled with buttermilk, but every one of them kept wondering eyes fastened on the priest. And to tell the truth, Father Cassidy at first was more scornful and unpolite than he need be. I suppose, says his reverence, you do be worrying a good deal about the place you're going to after the day of judgment, he says, kind of mocking. Ara, now, says the king, taking the pipe from his mouth and staring hard at the clergyman, there's more than me ought to be studying that question. There's a parish priest I knew, and he's not far from here, who ate mate on a fast day, three years ago come next Michaelmas, who should be a good lot in the earth in that same place, says the king. The laughing and tittering that followed this hit lasted a minute. Father Cassidy turned scarlet. When I ate it I forgot the day, he cried. That's what you tood, says the king, smiling sweet, but that saying don't help your chance much. Maybe you failed to say your prayers a year ago last Easter Monday night for the same reason? Axed the king, very cool. At this the laughing broke out again, uproarious, some of the little men hooting their sides and tears rolling down their cheeks. Two lads begun dancing together before the chiny dishes upon the dresser. But at the height of the merriment there was a cry and a splash, for Fadrig Oge had fallen into the churn. Before anyone could help him Fadrig had climbed bravely up the churn dash, hand over hand like a sailor man, and clambered out all white and dripping. Don't mind me, he says. Go on with the discourse, he cried, shaking himself. The ruler of the good people looked vexed. I marvel at Yez, and I am ashamed of Yez, he says. If I'm not able alone for this Deluherd man, your shoutin' and your gallivantin' will do me no good. Besides, fair plays a jewel, even two egg in one ain't fair, says the king. If I hear another word from one of Yez, back to sleeve Naman he'll go, and lay there on the broad of his back, with his heels in the air, for a year and ten days. You were about to observe, Father Cassidy, says His Majesty, bowing low, your most obedient sir. I was about to say, cried his reverence, that you're a friend of Satin. I'll not deny that, says the king, what have you to say agin him? He's a rogue and a rapscallion and the enemy of mankind, tundered Father Cassidy. Prove he's a rogue. Cries the king, slapping one hand on the other, and why shouldn't he be the enemy of mankind? What has mankind ever done for him except to lay the blame of every main, cowardly thrick of its own on his childers? Wasn't it on their account he was put inside of the swine and drove into the say? Wasn't it because of them he spent seven days and seven nights in the belly of a whale, wasn't it? Stop there, now, says Father Cassidy, pinting his finger, who'd where you are, that was Jonah. You're working miracles to make me forget, shouted the king. I'm not. Cried the priest, and what's more, if you'll agree not to use charms of the black art to help yourself, I'll promise not to work miracles egg in you. Done.
I'll agree, says the king, and with that bargain I'll go on first, and I'll prove that mankind is the enemy of Satin. Who begun the enmity, interrupted his reverence. Who started in be tempting our first parents? Not wishing to make little of a man's relations in his own house or to his own face, but your first parents were a poor lot, said the king. Didn't your first parent turn Quain's evidence agin his own wife? Answer me that. Under the circumstances, would ye have him tell a lie when he was asked, says the priest right back. Well, the argument got hotter and hotter until Darby's mind was in splint hers. Sometimes he sided with old Nick, sometimes he was agin him. Half of what they said he didn't understand. They talk theology, conchology, and distrology, they hammered each other with geography, orthography, and misnography, they welted each other with philosophy, philosophy, and thrymosophy. They bounced up and down in their sates, they shouted and got purple in the face. But every argument brought out another nearly as good and twicked as loud. Through all this time the folliers of the king sat upon their perches or lay upon the table motionless, like little wooden images with painted green cloaks and brown caps. Darby, looking from one to the other of them for help to understand the tremendous argument that was going on, felt his brain growing numb. At last it balked like Seamus Free's donkey, and urge as he would, the devil afoot his minded stir after the two hayros. It turned at last and galloped back to Mrs. Morrissey's wake. Now, Finn. The thought that came into Darby's head as he sat there furnished Father Cassidy and the king was this. The two wisest persons in Ireland are this minute shouting and disputing before me own turf fire. If I ax them those questions, I'll be wiser than Martin Cavanaugh, the schoolmaster, and twicked as wise as any other man in this parish. I'll do it, he says to himself. He raised the tongs and struck them so loud and quick against the hearth that the two debaters stopped short in their talk to look at him. Tell me, he says, lave off and tell me who was the greatest man that ever lived, says he. At that a surprising thing happened. Brian Connors and Father Cassidy, H striving to speak first, answered in the same breath and gave the same name. Danlo O'Connell, says they. There was at that the instant silence and stillness which follows a great explosion of gunpowder. Thin every subject of the king started to his feet. Three cheers for Danlo O'Connell. Cried little Roderick Do. Every brown cap was swung in the air. Hooray! Hooray! Huru rang the cheers. His reverence and the fairy chief turned sharp about and stared at each other, delighted and wondering. Darby shruck Agin with the tongs. Who was the greatest poet, says he. Agin the two spoke together. Tom Moore, says they. The king rubbed his hands and gave a glad side look at the priest. Darby marked the friendly light that was stealing into Father Cassidy's brown eyes. There was great excitement among the good people up on the cupboard shelves. On the table little Niall, the wise, was trying to start three cheers for Father Cassidy, when Darby said Agin, who was the greatest warrior, he says. The kitchen grew still as death, each of the two heroes waiting for the other. The king spoke first. Brian Boru, says he. No, says Father Cassidy, half laughing, Owen Roe O'Neill. Fadrig Ogay jumped from the churn. Owen Roe forever. I always said it, cries he. Look at this man, boys, he says, pinting up to the priest. There's the making of the finest bishop in Ireland. The divil a much differ betwixt Owen Roe and Brian Borrow. Tis one of them too, and I don't care which, says the king. The priest and the king sank back in their chairs, eyeing each other with admiration. Darby powered something out of a jug into three brown stone noggins, and then turned hot wather from the kittle, on top of that agin. Says the king to the clergyman, you're the cleverest and the knowingest man I've met in five thousand years. That jolt you gave me about Jonah was a terror. I never saw your aquil. If we could only send you to Parliament, you'd free Ireland, says Father Cassidy. 
To think, says he, that once I used to believe there was no such thing as fairies. That was because you were superstitious, says the king. Everyone is so, more or less. I am myself, a little, says he. Darby was stirring spoons in the three steaming noggins and Father Cassidy was looking throubled. What would his flock say to see him drinking punch with a little old pageant, who was the friend of old Nick? Your health, says the king, hooting up the cup. His reverence took a bowl of the punch, for decency's sake, and stood quiet a minute. At last he says, happiness to you and forgiveness to you, and my heart's pity folly you. Says he, raising the noggin to his lips. He drained the cup thoughtful and solemn, for he didn't know rightly whether t'was a venial sin or a mortal sin he'd committed by the bad example he was giving Darby. I wished I could do something for yes, he says, putting on his cloak, but I have only pity and kind wishes to give you. He turned Agin when his hand was on the doorknob, and was going to say something else, but changed his mind, and went out to where Darby was hooting the horse. Meanwhile, the little people were consultin eager in a knot beside the fireplace, until the king broke away and follied Father Cassidy out. Wait a minute, the fairy says. There's something important your reverence should know about, he says. There's two speckled hens that strayed away from your own door over to the black pond, and they've been there this twelvemonth. I'm loath to say it, but in your own mind your honor accused bothered Bill Donahue, the tinker, with Taquin, Thim. Well, they've raised two great clutches of chickens and, they're all yours. We thought we'd tell ye, he says. And last Tuesday night Nancy Burke bait her husband Dicky for being toxicated. I think she bait him too Scanlaus, says little Niall, the fiddler, comin' out. And Dicky is too proud to complain of her to your honor. He says, twould be makin' a kind of informer out of himself. But maybe she'll bait him agin, so I thought to mint eye on it, he says. With that Fadrigoge broke in from where he stood on the thrashel. Tom Healy's family, up the mountainy way, is all down with the favor, they have no one to send word, cried Fadrig. Your honor ought to know about it, he says. Be this time the good people were all outside, crowded about the horse, and H1 excited, shouting up some friendly information. Father Cassidy, from terror's back, sat smiling down kind, first on this one, then on that, and then on the other. Wisha, says he, ain't ye the kindly crashures? I've heard more news of me own parish in the last five minutes than I'd have learned in a twelvemonth. But there's one thing I'd liked mighty well to know. Maybe yes could tell me, says he, who committed the mysterious crime in this parish a year ago last Christmas? Who stole the six shillings from old Mrs. Frawley? She counted them at Mrs. McGee's, and she felt them in her pocket at Mrs. Donovan's, the crowd jostled her at the chapel door, and aft her that they were gone, he says. Well, the fairies were split tin with laughter as he spoke. No one stole them at all, says Sean Rue, the tears of merriment rolling down his face. The disrememberin' woman only imagined she counted them at Mrs. McGee's and felt them at Mrs. Donovan's. She was only thinkin' about the money at them places, and that's how she got the day. She hid the shillins in the blue teapot with the broken spout that stands in the left hon corner of the mahogany dresser, and Thin forgot it entirely, he says. Well, look at that, now, says the priest, and all the turmoil there's been about that same six shillins, and she after hidin' them in the teapot herself. Now isn't there something I can do in return for all your kindness, he says. There's one thing, says King Brian Connors, lookin' a good dale confused. If your reverence could just as well, if it'd be no positive inconvenience, we'd like mightily for ye not to be singin' pious hymns as you go riding along the highway after dark. If you'd sing ballads, now, or Tom Moore's melodies. You may no harum, of course, as it is, but last week you broke up a dance we were having at Murray's Wrath. And Saturday night you put a scat there on a crowd of us as we were coming by McGrath's Meadow, he says, anxious. Twas a queer bargain for a clergyman to make, and fakes it went egg in his conscience, but he hadn't the heart to refuse. 
so he bent down and shook the king's hand. I promise, he says. A wild, shrill cheer broke from the throng of little people. Now I'll go home and lave yez in peace, says Father Cassidy, gripping his bridle rein. I came your enemy, but I'm converted. I'll go back your friend, he says. Ye won't go home alone, we'll escort ye, shouted Fadrigoge. Woolam Fagan, the poacher, was sneaking home that night about one o'clock, with a bag full of rabbits under his arum. When hearing behind him the bait of horses' hoofs and the sound of melodious music, he jumped into the ditch and lay close within the shadow. Who should come cantering up the starlit road but Father Cassidy, on his big black hunter, Terror? Woolam looked for the musicianers who were singing and playing the entrancing music, but sorrow one could he see, and what was more, the sounds came from the air high above Father Cassidy's head. "'Tis the angels guarding the good man," says Woolam. Sure, twas only the good people escorting his reverence from Darby Agales' house, and to cheer him on his way, singing the while, believe me, if all those endearing young charms. How the fairies came to Ireland. The most lonesome bridal path in all Ireland leads from Tom Healy's cottage down the sides of the hills, along the edge of the valley. Till it races the high road that skirts the great mountain, Sleeve Naman. One blustering, Unaisy night, Father Cassidy, on his way home from a sick call, rode over that same path. It wasn't strange that the priest, as his horse ambled along, should be thinking of that other night in Darby Agales' kitchen, the night when he met with the good people. For there, off to the left, towered and threatened Sleeve Naman, the home of the fairies. The dismal old mountain glowered toward his reverence, its dark look saying, plain as spoken words. How dare ye come here, how dare ye? I wonder, says Father Cassidy to himself, looking up at the black hill, if the good people are fallen angels, as some do be saying. Why were they banished from heaven? It must have been a great sin entirely they committed, at any rate, for at the same time they were banished the power to make a prayer was taken from them. That's why to say a pious word to a fairy is like throwing scalding water on him. Tis a hard pinnance that's put on the poor crushers. I wished I knew what t'was for, he says. He was going on Pondheran in that way, while terror was picking his steps, nervous, among the stones of the road, when suddenly a frowning. Ugly rock seemed to jump up and stand furnace them at a turn of the path. Terror shied at it, stumbled wild, and thin the most aggrawating of all bothersome things happened, the horse cast a shoe and went stone lame. In a second the priest had leaped to the ground and picked up the horseshoe. Wira. Wira, says he, lifting the lame foot, why did you do it, Alan Tis five miles to a smith and seven miles to your own warm stable. The horse, for answer, raced down and touched with his soft nose the priest's cheek. But the good man looked reproachful into the big brown eyes that turned sorrowful to his own. With the shoe in his hand the priest was standing, fretting and helpless on the lonesome hillside, wondering what he'd do at all at all. When a sudden voice spoke up from somewhere near Terror's knees. The top of the Avenine, to your reverence, it said, I'm sorry for your bad luck, says the voice. Looking down, Father Cassidy saw a little cloaked figure, and caught the glint of a gold crown. Twas Brian Connors, the king of the fairies, himself, that was in it. His words had so friendly a ring in them that the clergyman smiled in answering, Why, Finn, good fortune to you, King Brian Connors, says the good man, and save you kindly. What wind brought you here, he says. The king spoke back free and pleasant. The boys told me you were coming down the mountainy way, and I came up just in time to see your misfortune. I've sent for Sean Rue, our own farrier, there's no bet there in Ireland, he'll be here in a minute, so don't worry, says the king. The priest came so near saying, God bless ye, that the king's hair riz on his head. But Father Cassidy stopped in the nick of time, changed his course, and steered as near a blessing as he could without hurting the master of the good people. Well, may you never hear of trouble, he says, till you're wanted to its wake, says he. There's no trouble tonight at any rate, says the king, 
for while Sean is fixing the baste we'll sit in the shelter of that rock yonder. There we'll light our pipes and devard our minds with pleasant discoursin and wise conversation. While the king spoke, two green-cloaked little men were making a fire for the smith out of twigs. So quick did they work, that by the time the priest and the fairy man could walk over to the stone and sit themselves in the shelter, a thousand gould sparks were dancin' in the wind. And the glimmer of a foin blaze fought with the darkness. Almost as soon, clear and putty, rang the cheerful sound of an anvil, and through the swaying shadows a dozen busy little figures were working about the horse. Some wore leather aprons and hilt up the horse's hoof whilst Sean fitted the red-hot shoe, others blew the bellows or piled fresh sticks on the fire, all joking, laughing, singing, or thrickin'. One couldn't tell whether, twas playing or workin', they were. After lighting their pipes and paying each other an armful of complaints, the master of Sleeve Naman and the clergyman began a serious discourse about the Deloits of fox hunting. Which led to the consideration of the wonderful wisdom of racing horses and the disgraceful deterioration of the skibberbeg hounds. Father Cassidy related how when Ned Blaze's steeplechasin horse had been entered for the Connemara Cup, and found out at the last minute that Ned feared to lay a bet on him. The horse felt himself so stabbed to the heart with shame by his master's distrust, that he threw his jockey, jumped the wall, and, head in the air, galloped home. The king then tooed how at a great hunting meet, when three magistrates and two head excises officers were in the chase, that thief of the world, Leteran Raymember. The chief hound of the Skibberbeg pack, instead of follying the fox, led the whole hunt up over the mountain to Patrick McCaffrey's private still. The entire countryside were DHRY for a fortnight after. Their talk in that way drifted from one pleasant subject to another, till Father Cassidy, the sly man, says AC, and, careless, I've been tooed, says he. That before the good people were banished from heaven yes were all angels, he says. The king blew a long thin cloud from betwixt his lips, felt his whiskers thoughtful for a minute, and said. No, he says, we were not exactly what you might call angels. A raw angel is taller nor your chapel. Will you tell me what they're like, axed Father Cassidy, very curious. I'll give you an day be comparison what they're like, the king says. They're not like a chapel, and they're not like a three, and they're not like the ocean, says he. They're different from a goint, a great dale different, and they're dissembler to an eagle. In fact you'd not mistake one of them for anything you'd ever seen before in your whole life. Now you have a pretty good idea what they're like, says he. While I think of it, says the fairy man, a vexed frown wrinkling over his forehead. There's three young bachelors in your own parish that have a foolish habit of callin, their Colleen's angels when they's not the last likeness, not the last. If I were you, I'd preach a g in it, says he. Oh, I dunno about that, says Father Cassidy, fitting a live coal on his pipe. The crushures must say thim things. If a young bachelor only talks sensible to a sensible Colleen he has a good chance to stay a bachelor. An thin a g in, a gasun who'll talk to his sweetheart about the size of the pita tie crop'll maybe bait her when they're both married. But this has nothing to do with your historical observations. Go on, king, he says. Well, I hate foolishness, wherever it is, says the fairy. Howsomever, as I was saying, up there in heaven they called us the little people, he says. Millions of us flocked together, and I was the king of them all. We were happy with one another as birds of the same nest, till the ruction came on betwixt the black and the white angels. How it all started I never rightly knew, nor wouldn't ask for fear of getting implicated. I bade all the little people keep to themselves thin, because we had plenty of friends in both parties, and wanted trouble with neither of them. I knew old Nick well. A civiler, pleasanter spoken sow you couldn't wish to meet, a little too sweet in his ways, maybe. He gave a thousand favors and civilities to my subjects, and now that he's down, the devil a word I'll say agin him. I'm agin him, says Father Cassidy, looking very stern. I'm agin him and all his pumps and works. I'll go bail that in the IND he hurt yes more than he helped yes. 
Only one thing I blame him for, says the king. He seduced from the little people my comrade and best friend, one Thaddeus Flynn be name. And the way that it was, was this. Thaddeus was a warm-hearted little man, but monstrous high-spirited as well as quick-tempered. I can shut me eyes now, and in me mind see him thripping along, his head bent, his pipe in his mouth, his hands behind his back. He never wore a waistcoat, but kept always his green body coat buttoned. A tall cabine was set on the back of his head, with a sprig of green shamrock in the band. There was a thin rim of black whiskers under his chin. Father Cassidy, lifting both hands in wonder, said, If I hadn't baptized him, and buried his good father before him, I'd swear twas Michael Pether McGilligan of this parish you were describing. Says he. The McGilligans ain't dacent enough, nor refined enough, nor proud enough to be fairies, says the king, waving his pipe scornful. But to race him and to continue, he says. Thaddeus and I used to frequent a place they called the battlements or parapets, which was a great gould wall about the edge of heaven, and which had wide steps down on the outside face. Where one could sit, pleasant evenings, and hang his feet over, or where one stand before going to take a fly in the fresh air for himself. Well, Agra, the night before the great battle, Thaddy and I were sitting on the lowest step, looking down into league upon league of nothing, and talking about the world. Which was sixty thousand miles below, and hell, which was twenty thousand miles below that age in, when who should come blustering over us, his black wings hiding the sky. And a long streak of lightning for a spear in his fist, but old Nick. Brian Connors, how long are you going to be downthrodden and through just and looked down upon, you and your subjects, says he. Fakes, Finn, who's doing that to us? Asks Thaddy, standing up and growing excited. Why, says old Nick, were you made little pygmies to be the laugh and the scorn and the mock of the whole world, he says, very mad. Why weren't you made into angels, like the rest of us, he says. Musha, cries Thaddy, I never thought of that. Are you a man or a mouse, will you fight for your rights, says Satin. If so, come with me and be one of us. For we'll bait them black and blue tomorrow, he says. Thaddy needed no second axing. I'll go with ye, sat tin, me decent man, cried he. Weera. Weera. To think of how downtrodden we are. And with one spring Thaddy was on old Nick's childers, and the two flew away like a hummingbird riding on the back of an eagle. Take care of yourself, Brian, says Thaddy, and come over to see the fight. I'm to be in it. And I extend you the invitation, he says. In the morning the battle opened. One line of black angels stretched clear across heaven, and faced another line of white angels, with a wally between. Everyone had a spaking trumpet in his hand, like you see in the pictures, and they called each other hard names across the wally. As the white angels couldn't swear or use bad language, ruled Nick's army had at first in that way a great advantage. But when it came to hurling hills and shying thunderbolts at each other, the black angels were bait from the first. Poor little Thaddeus Flynn stood amongst his own, in the dust and the crash and the roar, brave as a lion. He couldn't hurl mountains, nor was he much at flinging lightning bolts, but at calling hard names he was equal to the best. I saw him take off his coat, throw it on the ground, and shake his pipe at a tremendous angel. You audacious villain, he cried. I dare you to come halfway over, he says. My, oh my, when the armies met together in the raw handy grips, it must have been an illigent sight, says Father Cassidy. Tis a wonder you kept out of it, says he. I always believed, says the king, that if he can help it, no one should fight when he's sure to get hurted, unless it's his duty to fight. To fight for the mere sport of it, when a throuncin, is sartin, is wasting your time and hutton, your reputation. I know there's plenty things different, he says, peenting his pipe. I may be wrong, and I won't argify the matter. Twould have been better for myself that day if I had acted on the other principle. Howsomever, be the time that everybody was sidestepping mountains and dodging thunderbolts, I says to myself, says I, 
this is no place fair you or the likes of you. So I took all me own people out to the battlements and hid them out of the way on the lower steps. We'd no sooner got placed when, wish. A black angel shot through the air over our heads, and began falling down, down, and down, till he was out of sight. Then a score of his friends came tumbling over the battlements. Immediately hundreds of others came whirling, and pretty soon it was raining black wings down into the gulf. In the midst of the turmoil, who should come jumping down to me, all out of breath, but Thaddy. It's all over, Brian. We're bait scandalous, he says, swinging his arms for a spring and balancing himself up and down on the edge of the steps. Maybe you wouldn't think it of me, Brian Connors. But I'm a fallen angel, says he. Wait a bit, Thaddeus Flynn, says I, don't jump, I says. I must jump, he says, or I'll be trun, says he. The next thing I knew he was swirling and darting and shooting a mile below me. And I know, says the king, wiping his eyes with his cloak. That when the day of judgment comes I'll have at last one friend waiting for me below to show me the coolest spots and the pleasant places. The next minute up came the white army with prisoners, angels, black and white, who had taken no side in the battle, but had stood apart like ourselves. A man, says the angel Gabriel, who, for fear of his skin, won't stand for the right when the right is in danger, may not desarve hell, but he's not fit for heaven. Fill up the stars with these cowards and throw the lavins into the say, he ordered. With that he swung a lad in the air and gave him a fling that sent him ten miles out until the sky. Every other good angel follied shut, and I watched thousands go, till they faded like a stretch of black smoke a hundred miles below. The angel Gabriel turned and saw me, and I must confess I shivered. Well, King Brian Connors, says he, I hope you see that there's such a thing as being too wise and too cute and too ticklish of yourself. I can't send you to the stars, because they're fun, and I won't send you to the bottomless pit so long as I can help it. I'll send yes and down to the world. We're going to put human beings on it pretty soon, though they're going to turn out to be blackguards, and at last we'll have to burn the place up. After that, if you're still there, you and yours must go to perdition, for it's the only place left for you. You're too hard on the little man, says the angel Michael, coming up, st. Michael was ever the outspoken, friendly person, sure what harm, or what hurt, or what good could he have done us. And can you blame the poor little crashures for not interfering? Maybe I was too harsh, says the angel Gabriel, but being saints, when we say a thing we must stick to it. Howsomever, I'll let him settle in any part of the world he likes, and I'll send there the kind of human beings he'd wish most for. Now, give your order, he says to me, taking out his book and pencil, and I'll make for you the kind of people you'd like to live among. Well, says I, I'd like the men honest and brave, and the women good. Very well, he says, writing it down, I've got that, go on. And I'd like them fun of jollity and sport, fond of racing and singing and hunting and fighting, and all such innocent diversions. You'll have no complaint about that, says he. And, says I, I'd like them poor and persecuted, because when a man gets rich, there's no more fun in him. Yes, I'll fix that. Throw for you, says the angel Gabriel, writing. And I don't want them to be Christians, says I, make them heathens or pagans, for Christians are too much worried about the day of judgment. Stop there. Say no more, says the saint. If I make as fine a race of people as that I won't send them to hell to plaze you, Brian Connors. At last, says I, make them Jews. If I made them Jews, he says, slowly screwing up one eye to think, how could you keep them poor? No, no, he said, shutting up the book, go your ways, you have enough. I clapped me hands, and all the little people stood up and bent over the edge, their fingers pointed like swimmers going to dive. One, two, three, I shouted, and with that we took the leap. We were two years and twenty-six days falling before we raced the world. On the morning of the next day we began our search for a place to live. We traveled from north to south and from east to west. 
Some grew tired and dropped off in Spain, some in France, and others Aegean in different parts of the world. But the most of us traveled ever and ever till we came to a lovely island that glimmered and laughed and sparkled in the middle of the say. We'll stop here, I says. We needn't search farther, and we needn't go back to Italy or Switzerland, for of all places on the earth, this island is the nearest like heaven. And in it the County Clare and the County Tipperary are the prettiest spots of all. So we hollowed out the great mountain Slevenamon for our home, and there we are till this day. The king stopped a while, and sat hooden his chin in his hands. That's the thrust story, he says, sighing pitiful. We took sides with nobody, we minded our own business, and we got trun out for it, says he. So in the earth was Father Cassidy in the talk of the king that the singing and hammering had died out without his knowing. And he hadn't noticed at all how the darkness had thickened in the valley and how the stillness had spread over the hillside. But now, when the chief of the fairy stopped, the good man, half frightened at the silence, jumped to his feet and turned to look for his horse. Beyond the dull glow of the dying fire a crowd of little people stood waiting, patient and quiet, hooting terror, who champed restless at his bit. And bade him patient with his hoof on the hard ground. As the priest looked toward them, two of the little men wearing leather aprons moved out from the others, leading the baste slow and careful over to where the good man stood beside the rock. You've done me a favor this night, says the clergyman, gripping with his bridle hand the horse's mane, and all I have to pay it back with only harry you, and make you uncomfortable. So I'll not say the words, he says. No favor at all, says the king, but before an hour there'll be lying on your own threshold a favor in the shape of a bit of as fine bacon as ever laughed happy in the middle of biling turnips. We borrowed it last night from a magistrate named Blake, who lives up in the county Wexford, he says. The clergyman had swung himself into the saddle. I'd be loath to say anything disrespectful, he says quick, or to hurt sensitive feelings, but on account of my soul's sake I couldn't aid anything that was come by dishonest, he says. Bother and botheration, look at that now, says the king. Every thrade has its drawbacks, but I never realized before the hardship of being a parish priest. Can't we manage it some way? Couldn't I put it some place where you might find it, or give it to a friend who'd send it to you? Stop a minute, says Father Cassidy. Up at Tim Healy's I think there's more hunger than sickness, more need for pedatize than for physic. Now, if you sent that same bit of bacon. Oh, ho! Says the king, with a dhry cough, the Healy's have no souls to save, the same as parish priests have. I'm a poor, wake, miserable sinner, says the priest, hanging his head. I fall at the first temptation. Don't send it, says he. Since you forbid me, I'll send it, says the king, chucklin. I'll not be ruled by you. Tomorrow the Healy's LL have five tender-hearted heads of cabbage, making love in a pot to the finest bit of bacon in Tipperary, that is, unless you do your duty and ride back to warn them. Remember their poor souls, says he, and don't forget your own, he says. The priest sat Unizi in the saddle. I'll put all the responsibility on terror, he says. The baste has no soul to lose. I'll just drop the reins on his neck, if he turns and goes back to Healy's I'll warn them, if he goes home let it be on his own conscience. He dropped the reins, and the dishonest baste started for home immediately. But after a few steps Father Cassidy drew up and turned in the saddle. Not a soul was in sight. There was only the lonely road and the lonesome hillside, the last glimmer of the fairy fire was gone, and a curtain of soft blackness had fallen betwixt him and where the blaze had been. I bid you good night, Brian Connors, the priest cried. From somewhere out of the darkness a voice called back to him, Good night, your reverence. The Adventures of King Brian Connors Chapter 1 The King and the Omidhan did your honor ever hear how Anthony Sullivan's goat came to join the fairies? Well, it's a queer story and a wandering, quarrelsome story, as a tale about a goat is sure to be. Howsomever, in the home of the good people, which, as you know, 
is the hollow heart of the great mountain sleeve Naman, Anthony Sullivan's goat lives and prospers to this day. A pet and a harrow among the fairies. And this is the way it came about. All the world knows how for months Darby Ogil and his putty sister-in-law, Maureen McGibney, were kept prisoners by the good people. And, how, after they were relazed by the king, that same little fairy, King Brian Connors. Used often to visit Thim and sit with Thim Colligan and debaten and considerin' in Darby Ogilus kitchen. One lonesome December night, when Bridget and the childher were away visiting Bridget's father at Ballinger. And the angry blast was screaming and drifting the first white flakes of winter around Darby's house, then it was that Darby Ogil, Brian Connors, the king of the good people. And Maureen McGibney sat with their heads together before the blazing hearth. The king, being not much higher than your two hands, sat on the child's stool betwixt the other two, his green cloak flung back from his childers. And the gold crown on his head glistening in the firelight. It was a pleasant sight to watch them there in the flickering hearth glow. From time to time, as he talked, the old king patted Maureen's hands and looked smiling up into her putty gray eyes. They had been discoursing on the subject of throubles and tribulations. Ara! You ought to be the happy man, king, Darby says, sipping his noggin of punch, with no silly woman to order you or to cross you or to belittle you. Look at myself. After all the respect I've climbed into from being with the fairies, and after all the knowledge I've got from them. There's one person in this parish who has no more reverence for me now than she had the first day she met me, sometimes not so much, I'm thinking, he says, hurt-like. I've seen the workings of families during more than five thousand years, says the little king, so you needn't tell me who that one person is, me poor man, tis your own wife, Bridget. Throw for you. When it's the proud woman she ought to be this day to have the likes of me for a husband, says Darby. Ah, then, you ought to be the happy man, whatever wind blows, he sighed again, when you see a fat pig you like, you take it without so much as saying by your lave. If you come upon a fine cow or a good horse, in a twinkling you have it in sleeve naman. A girl has a good song with her, a boy has a nimble foot for a jig, or an old woman a smooth tongue for a tail, and, whisk. They're gone into the heart of the mountain to sing or dance for you, or to beguile you with old tales until the day of judgment. The king shook his head slowly, and drew a long face. Maybe we ought to be happy, says he. Tis through there's no sickness in sleeve naman, nor worry for tomorrow, nor fret for one's childhood, nor parting from friends, or things like that but trouble is like the drifting snow outside. Darby. It falls on the cottage and it covers the castle with the same touch, and once in a while it sifts into sleeve naman. In the name of goodness. Cries Darby, surprised, is there anything in the whole world you can't have for the wishing it? The king took off his gold crown and began polishing it with his sleeve to hide his nervousness. I'll tell you a secret, he whispered, bending over toward Darby, and speaking slow. In sleeve on our hearts are just breaking for something we can't get. But that's one thing we'd give the world for. Oh, king, what in the livin' world can it be? cried Maureen. I'd give the teeth out of me head if I could only own a goat, says the king, looking as though he were going to cry. Man alive! says Darby, dropping the poker, the countryside is full of goats, and all you have to do is to take your pick and help yourself. You're making game of us, king. The king shook his head. The good people have been thrying for years to capture one, says he. I've been bunted into ditches by the villains, I've been trun over hedges by them. I had to leap on the back of Anthony Sullivan's goat, and with two hundred of me subjects in full cry behind, ride him all night long hooting by his horns to cape him from getting at me and destroying me entirely. The jumps he took with me that night were tremendous. It was from the cowsheed to the shrawstack, from the shrawstack to the housetop, and from there down to the ground agin, and then hurraying and hurrooing, a race up the mountainside. But, says the king, kind o, sniffling and turning to the fire, we love the ground he walks upon, says he. 
Terran hounds, says Darby, why don't you put your spell on one of them? You don't know them, says the king. We can't put the black spell on them, they're not Christian beasts, like pigs or cows. When it comes to animals, we can only put our cum ither on cattle and horses, and such as are Christian animals, ye know. In his mind and in his heart a goat is a pagan. He wouldn't ask any better diversion than for me to thry and lay me hands on him, says the king, wiping his eyes. But, says he again, standing up on the stool and hooting his pipe over his head, Anthony Sullivan's goat is the gallicist base that roams the fields. There's more fun in him, and no more fear in him, than in a yellow lion. He'd do anything for sport. He'd bunt the king of Russia, he'd baa at a parish priest, out of pure, rollicking divilment, says the king. If the good people had a friend, a raw friend, says he, looking hard at Darby, that wouldn't be afeard to go into our home within the mountain once more, just once. And bring with him that goat. Say no more, says Darby, hoarsely, and turning white with fear, say no more, Brian Connors. Not all the gould in Slevenamon would tempt me there again. It's make a prisoner of me forever you would. I know your thricks. The look of scorn the little man flung at Darby would have withered the threes. I might have known it, he says, sitting down disgusted. I was a fool for hoping you would, says he. There's no more spirit in ye nor sense of gratitude than in a hin. Wait till, and he shook his fist. Don't blame the lad, cried Maureen, patting the king's head, soothingly. Sure, why should the like of a wonderful man, such as you, who has lived five thousand years, and knows everything? Compare your wit or your spirit or your sense with the likes of us poor crushures that only stay here a few hours and thin are gone forever? This she cried, craftily, flathering the old man. Be acy on him, King, Akushla, says she, coaxing. Well, the little man, being soothered, sat down again. Maybe I was too hard, he says, but to tell the truth, the life is just bothered out of me, and my temper is ruined these days with an omadhon we've taken lately, I don't know what to do with him. Talk of throuble. He mopes and mourns and moot hers in spite of all we can do. I've even tooed him where the crocks of gould are hid. You haven't tooed me that, cries Darby, quickly. No, says the king, looking at him sideways. At last not yet, says Darby, looking sideways at the king. Not yet, nor will I fare a long time yitter, you covetous, ungrateful spalpeen. Snapped the fairy. Well, said he, paying no more attention to Darby, this young Omadhon is six feet high in his stockings, and as foin a looking lad as you'll see in a day's walk. Now what do you think he's mourning and crooning for? Fakes, I dunno, answered Darby. Maybe it's a horse or a dog or a cow, or maybe a pair of pigs. You've not hit it, said the ruler of the good people, it's a Colleen. And him having a college education, too. Troth, thin, said Darby, with a knowledgeable wag of his head, some of them larned students are as foolish in that way as ignorant people. I once met a tinker named Larry McManus, who knew the geography from cover to cover, and still he had been married three times. Poor Gasun. Who is the Omadhon? asked Maureen, not minding Darby. He's no less, said the king, than Roger O'Brien, a son of old Bob O'Brien, who was the richest and proudest man in the county Tipperary. Old Bob thraces his ancestors for five hundred years, and he owns a mile of land and has forty tenants. He had no child but this Omadhon. And who is the Colleen? Some grand princess, I suppose, said Maureen. There was the whole throuble, answered the little man. Why, she's no one at all, but a little white-cheeked, brown-eyed, black-haired girl named Nora Costello, belonging to one of his own tenants on the domain. It all came from a Dickerton people above their station. Fakes, Darby says, there's Phelim Brady, the stonecutter, a fine, dacent man he was till he made up his mind to learn the history of Ireland from IND to IND. When he got so far as where the Danes killed Brian Boru he took to drink, 
and the divil a hopworth as good he's been ever since. But laid on with your discourse, king, says he, waving his noggin of punch. At this the king filled his pipe, Maureen threw fresh turf on the fire, and the wind drew the sparks dancing up the chimney. Now and then while the king talked, some of the fairies outside rapped on the window panes and pressed their little faces against the glass to smile and nod at those within. Thin scurried busily off Agen until the darkness. Once the wail of a child rose above the cry of the storm, and Maureen caught the flash of a white robe against the window pane. It's a child we've taken this night from one Jude Casey down in Mayo, says King Brian Connors. But fill my noggin with fresh punch, Maureen, and draw Closter till I tell you about the Omidhan. And the master of the good people crossed his legs and settled into telling the story, comfortable as comfortable could be. The way the throuble began was foin and innocent as the day is long, said the king. Five or six years ago, it was on the day Roger was first sent to college at Dublin, missed her and Mistress O'Brien, mighty lonesome and downhearted. Were driving over the estate when who should they spy standing, modest and timid, at her own gate, but putty little Nora Costello. Though the child was only fourteen years old, Mistress O'Brien was so taken with her wise. Gentle ways that Nora next day was sent for to come up to the big house to spine an hour amusing the mistress. There was the rock they all split on. Every day after for a month the little girl went visiting there. At the end of that time Mistress O'Brien grew so fond of her that Nora was brought to the big house to live. Old Bob liked the little girl monstrous well, so they put fine clothes on her until in a couple of years one couldn't tell her from a raw lady, whether he met her in the house or at the crossroad. Only every Saturday night she'd put on a little brown poplin dress and go to her father's cottage, and stay there helping her mother till Monday or maybe Tuesday. For I mustn't get proud-hearted, she'd say, or lose the love I was born to, for who can tell when I'll need it, says she. A wise girl, says Darby. A dear Colleen, says Maureen. Well, every summer me brave Roger came home from college, and the two rode together after the hounds, or sailed his boat or roved the woods. And the longest summer days were too short entirely to suit the both of them. Although she had a dozen young fellows courting her, some of them gentlemen's sons, the devil and I she had for anyone except Roger. And although he might pick from twenty of the bluest-blooded ladies in Ireland any day he liked, Nora was his one delight. Every servant on the place knew how things were going, but the old man was so blind with pride that he saw nothing at all. Stranger than all, the two childer believed that old Bob guessed the way things were with them and was pleased with them. A worse mistake was never made. He never dreamed that his son Roger would think of any girl without a fortune or a title. Mistress O'Brien must have known, but, being tender-hearted and loving and, like all women, a trifle weak-minded, hoped, in spite of Rayson, that her husband would consent to let the child her marry. Knowing old Bob as she knew him, that was a wild thought for Mistress O'Brien to have. For if ever there was a stiffer, bitherer, prouder, more unforgiving, boisterous man I haven't seen him, and I've lived five thousand years. Darby, scowling mighty important, raised his hand. Whist a bit, he says, you remind me of the ballad about Lord Skipperbeg's lovely daughter and the farmer's only son. Stretching his legs and wagging his head, he sang. Her cheeks were like the lily white. Her neck was like the rose. Oh, my! Oh, my! said the king, surprised, was her neck as red as that? By no manies, said Darby. I met a mistake. Twas this away. Her neck was like the lily white. Her cheeks were like the rose. She quickly doffed her silk attire. And donned a yeoman's clothes. Rise up, rise up, my farmer's son. Rise up through love, says she. We'll fly across the region, Maine. Unto Amari. Have done your fooling, Darby, says Maureen. You have the king bothered. I wished you hadn't stopped him, Agra, says the king. I never heard that song before, and it promised well. 
I'm fond of love songs, he says. But the Omadhan, coaxed the Colleen. I forgot where I was, the king says, scratching his head. But, spaking of old Bob, he went on, no one ever thought how evil and bitter he could be, until his son, the foolish lad, a few days before the IND of his schooling, wrote to the father that he wanted to marry Nora when he came home, and that he would be home in a few days, he thought. He was breaking the news AC to the family, D.C. Phew. Hullabaloo. Out of the house with her, the sly, conniving hussy, shouted old Bob, when he read the letter. Into the road with all we've given her. Pull the roof off Costello's house and drive off the place his whole brood of outrageous villains. So they packed Nora's boxes, fakes, and many a fine dress was in them, too, and bade her be gone. The mistress slipped a bag of gold sovereigns with a letter into one of the chests. Nora took the letter, but she forbade them sending so much as a handkerchief after her. She wouldn't even ride in the coach that the mistress had waiting for her outside the grand gate. And all alone, in her brown poplin dress, she marched down the gravel path, proud, like a queen going to be crowned. Nor did she turn her head when the servants called blessings after her. But oh, Astor, her face was marble white, and when she was on her way down the lonely high road how she cried. Twas a bit their time entirely, the night young Roger came home, and, hearing of all this, rushed up the stairs to face his father. What happened betwixt them there no one knows, only they never passed each other a friendly look nor gave one to the other a pleasant word from that good hour to this. To make Matt hers worse, that same night young Roger went and axed Nora Costello to marry him. But all the countryside knows how the girl refused him, saying she wouldn't beggar and ruin the man she loved. Well, he took her at her word, but disbelieved and mocked at the racins she gave, the Omidhan. He wasn't much good after that, only for galloping his horse over the country like a madman, so I said to myself, says I, that we might as well take him with us into the sleeve Naman. I gave the ord hers, and there he is. Oh, the poor lad, says Maureen, does old Bob suspect the boy is with the fairies? Not in the last, says the king. You know how it is with us. Whenever we take a person we lave one of our own in his place, who looks and acts and talks in a way that the prisoner's own mother can't tell the differ. By and by the fairy sickens and pretends to die, and has his wake and his burial. When the funeral's over he comes back to us hale and spiling for more sport. So the lad the O'Briens put into their tomb was one of our own, Fadrig Ogabe name. Many a time Fadrig has taken the place of the gentry and quality in every county of Ireland, and has been buried more than a hundred times. But he swears he never before had a dacenter funeral nor a rattliner wake. And the girl, cried Maureen, Nora, where is she? Faith, that's strange, too, says the king. She was the first person old Bob axed for after the funeral. He begged her to come back to them and forgive him, and the poor girl went again to live at the big house. He'll get her another good husband yet, said Darby. Oh, never. Says Maureen, crying like a child. She'll die of a broken heart. I've seen in me time, says the king, people die from being pushed off houses, from falling in wells, and every manner of death you can mention. And I saw one old woman die from aiding too much treacle, he says, but never a person die from a broken heart. This he said to make light of what he had been telling, because he saw by Maureen's face that she was growing sick with pity. For Maureen was thinking of the black days when she herself was a prisoner in Sleeve Naman. For an answer to the jest, the girl, with her clasped hands held up to the king, moaned, Oh, king, king, lave the poor lad go. Lave him go. Take the black spell off him and send him home. I beg you lave him go. Don't bother him, says Darby, what right have we to interfere with the good people? Though at the same time he took the pipe from his mouth and looked kind of wistful at the little man. But Maureen's tears only fell faster and faster. I can't do what you ask, Avic, says the king, very kindly. 
That day I let you and Darby go from us the power to free anyone was taken away from me by my people. Now every fairy in Slevenamon must give his consent before the spell can be taken away entirely from anyone, and, well, you know they'll never consent to that, he says. But what I can do, I will do. I can lift the spell from the Omidhan for one hour, and that hour must be just before cockcrow. Is that the law now? asked Darby, curiously. Maureen was sobbing, so she couldn't speak. It is, says the master of the good people. And tonight I'll send our spy, Sheila Maguire. To Nora Costello with the message that if Nora has love enough and courage enough in her heart to stand alone at her throw lover's grave in Kilmartin churchyard. Tomorrow night an hour before cockcrow, she'll see him plain and talk with him. And let you two be there, he says, to know that I keep me word. At that he vanished and they saw him no more that night, nor until two hours after the next midnight, when as they were tying the old horse and cart to the fence outside Kilmartin Church. Then they heard him singing. He was sitting on the wall, chanting at the top of his voice a strange, wild song, and hooting in his hand a silver-covered noggin. On a fallen tombstone nearby lay a white cloth, glimmering in the moonlight, and on the cloth was spread as fine a supper as heart could wish. So beside the white rows of silent tombs, under the elm trees and willows, they ate their fill, and Darby would have ate more if close to them they hadn't heard a long, deep sigh. And caught a glimpse of a tall man, gliding like a shadow into the shadows that hung around the O'Brien's family vault. At the same time, standing on the top of the stile which led into the graveyard, a woman's form was seen wavering in the moonlight. They watched her coming down the walk betwixt the tombs, her hand on her breast, clutching tight the cloak. Now and then she'd stand, looking about the while, and shivering in mortal terror at the cry of the owls, and then she'd flit on and be lost in the shadows. And then they'd see her run out into the moonlight, where she'd wait Agen, gathering courage. At last she came to a strip of soft light before the tomb she knew. Her strength failed her there, and she went down on her knees. Out of the darkness before her a low, pleading voice called, Nora. Nora. Don't be frightened, Akushla McCree. Slowly, slowly, with its arm spread, the dim shape of a man glided out of the shadows. At the same instant the girl rose and gave one cry, as she flung herself on his breast. They could see him bending over her, thin, pouring words like rain into her ears, but what he said they couldn't hear, Darby thinks he whispered. I wonder, oh, I wonder what he's telling her in this last hour says Maureen. It's acy to know that, says Darby, what should he be telling her but where the crocks of Gould are hid. Don't be watching them, it ain't dasent, says the king, uncultivation or unpoliteness is ogis, come over here. I've a pack of cards, Darby, says he, and as we have nearly an hour to wait, I challenge you to a game of forty-five. Sure we may as well, says Darby. What can't be cured must be endured. With that, me two bold heroes sat astride the fallen stone, and hammering the rock hard with their knuckles, played the game. Maureen went and, hooting on to the ivy, knelt at the church wall, its praying and crying, too, I think she was. Small blame to her if she was. All through that hour she imagined the wild promisings of the two poor crushures over be the tomb, and this kept burning the heart out of her. Just as the first glow of grey broke behind the hills the king stood up and said, It's your game, Darby, more be good luck than be good shooting, tis time to lave. You know if I'm caught out after cockcrow I lose all me spells for the day, and besides I'm wiseable to any mortal eye. I'm helpless as a baby then. So I think I'll take the omidhan and go. The roosters may crow now any minute, says he. The omidhan, although he couldn't hear, he felt the charm drawing him. He threw a frightened look at the east and held the girl closer. Twas their last minute. King! King, says Maureen, running up, if I brought Sullivan's goat into Slevenamon, would ye swear to let me out safe again? Troth, I would indeed, I swear be child Nick. Tis be him the good people swear. I'll do that same. 
then let the Omadhan go home. Get the good people's consent and I'll bring you the goat, says Maureen. The king trembled all over with anxiety and excitement. Why didn't you spake sooner? I'm afeard I haven't time to go to sleeve Naman and back before cockcrow, he stuthered, and at cockcrow, if the lad was under the say or in the stars, that spelled bring him to us. And then he could never again come out till the day of judgment. Howsomever, I'll go and thry, he says, hooting tight on to his crown with both hands, and with thim words he vanished. Be this and be that, it wasn't two minutes till he was back and would not a second to spare, either. Fadrigoge wants Mrs. Nancy Clancy's nanny goat, too. Will ye bring the both of them, Maureen? He screamed. You're driving a hard bargain, King, cried Darby. Don't promise him, Maureen. I will, cried she. Then it's a bargain, the fairy shouted, jumping to the top of a headstone. We all consent, he says, waving the noggin. He yelled to the Omadhan. Go home, Roger O'Brien. Go back to your father's house and live your life out to its natural IND. The curse is lifted from you, the black spell is spent and gone. Pick up the girl, ye spalpeen, don't ye see she's fainted? When O'Brien looked up and saw the master of the fairies he staggered like a man that had been struck a powerful blow. Thin he caught up the girl in his arms and ran with her down the graveled path and over the stile. At that minute the sorest misfortune that can happen to one of the good people came to pass. As the lad left the churchyard every cock in the parish crowed, and, tear and ounds. There on a tombstone, caught by the cockcrow, stood the poor, frightened little king. His gold crown was far back on his head, and his green cloak was twisted behind his back. All the power for spells and charms was gone from him until the next sunset. I'm ruined entirely, Darby. He says. Throw your shawl about me, Maureen Alana, and carry me in your arms, pretending I'm an infant. What'll I do at all at all, says he, weakly. Taking him at his word, Maureen wrapped the king in her shawl, and carrying him in her arms to the cart, laid him in the straw at the bottom, where he curled up, still and frightened till they were on their way home. Omadhan, a foolish fellow. Chapter 2 The Couple Without Childhood Five miles down the road from Kilmartin Churchyard, and thin two miles across, lived Barney Casey with Judy. His wife, known far and wide as the couple without childhood. Some foolish people whispered that this lack of family was a punishment for an old sacred crime. But that saying was nonsense, for an honester couple the sun didn't shine on. It was only a penance sent from heaven as any other penance is sent, t'was, like poverty, sickness, or as being born a connaught man, just to keep them humble-hearted. But, oh, it was the sore penance. Many an envious look they gave their neighbor, Tom Mulligan, the one-legged ballad-maker, who lived half a mile up the road, for, twelve pouty. Red-haired innocents sported and fought before Tom's door. The couple took to going through the fields to avoid passing the house, for the sight of the childher gave them the heartache. By and by the two began conniving how unbeknownst they might buy a child, or beg or even steal one, they were that lonesome-hearted. Howsomever, the plan at last they settled on was for Judy to slip away to a far part, Mayo, I think, where she would go through the almshouses till she found a gasun that suited her. And they had the cute plan laid by which it was to pass before the neighbors as their own, a casey of the caseys. Lave it to me, Barney darling, said Judy, with tears in her eyes, and if the neighbors wonder where I am, tell them I've gone to spind a few months with my old mother, says she. Well, Judy stole off sly enough, and twas well until the cowled weather when Barney got word that she had found a perfect angel, that it was the picture of himself. And that she would be home in a few days. With a mind like Thistledown he ran to Father Scanlan to arrange for the christening. On his way to the priest's house he invited the first woman he met, and Mulligan, the ballad-maker's wife, to be godmother, he picked bashful Ted Murphy, the bachelor, to be godfather. And on his way home he was that excited and elated that he also invited big misses. 
Brophy, the proud woman, to be the boy's godmother, forgetting altogether there was such a parson in the world as an mulligan. The next day the neighbors made ready a great bonfire to celebrate the dispositious occasion. But a cone. Midnight before the day of the christening poor Judy came home with empty arms and a breaking heart. The little lad had died suddenly and was buried. Maybe the good people had taken him, t'was hard to tell which. Tear and ages, there was the throuble. For two hours the couple sat in their desolate kitchen hooting hands and crying and bawling together till Barney could stand it no longer. Snatching his cabine, he fled from the coming disgrace and exposure out into the fields, where he wandered aimless till after dawn, stamping his feet at times and wagging his head. Or shaking his fist at the stars. At that same unlucky hour who should be jolting in their cart along the high road, two miles across, on their way home from Kilmartin churchyard, but our three heroes, Maureen, the king, and Darby Ogil. Their old white horse bobbed up and down through the sticky morning fog, Darby and Maureen shivering on the front seat. The ruler of the fairies, Maureen's shawl folded about him, was lying cuddled below in the shraw. When they saw anyone coming, the fairy chief would climb into Maureen's lap, and she'd hoot him as though he were a baby. Small blame to him to be sour and sullen. Here I am, he says to himself, his majesty, Brian Connors, king of all the good people in Ireland, the master of the night time, and having been king for more than five thousand years. With more power after sunset than the emperor of Greece or the grand turkey of barbarous parts, here am I, he says, disguised as a baby, wrapped in a woman's shawl. And depending for my safety on two simple country people, then he groaned aloud, bad luck to the day I first saw the Omidhan. Those were the first words he spoke. But it wasn't in the little man to stay long ill-natured. At the first Shabeen house that they found open Maureen bought for him a bottle of spirits, and this cheered him greatly. The first drink warmed him, the second softened him, the third put a chun to the ind of his tongue, and by the time they raced Tom Grogan's public house which was straight two miles across from Barney Casey's, the liquor set him singing like a nightingale. Maureen and Darby slipped into Grogan's for a bit of warmth and a mouthful to eat. Laving the master of Slevenamon well wrapped up at the bottom of the cart, his head on a sack of oats and his feet against the cart side, and as I said, him singing. He had the finest, liftinest way for a ballad you ever heard. At the end of every verse he elewated the last word and hilt it high, and put a lonesome wobble into his voice that would make you cry. Peggy Collins, the tall, thieving old beggar woman who used to wear the dirty red cloak, and looked like a soldier in it, was sleeping inside the hedge as the cart came along. But when it stopped she peeped out to see who had the good song with him. When she saw it was an infant not much longer than your two hands, God preserve us and save us. She gasped, and began to say her prayers. The king went on singing, clear and doleful and beautiful, the ballad of Donnelly and Cooper. Come all ye throughborn Irishmen wherever you may be. I hope you'll pay attention and listen unto me ee. -e. And if you'll pay attention the truth I will declare. How Donnelly fought Cooper on the Karav Kildare. Prayers were never from Peggy's heart. So as she listened to the entrancing song she turned from praying to plotting. If I had that child, she says, I could go from fair to fair and from pathron to pathron, and his singing'd fill my apron with silver. The king turned to another ditty, and you'd think he was a thrush. They'll kiss you, they'll caress you, he sang. They'll spind your money free. But of all the towns in Ireland Kilkenny for me ee ee ee. The grey-haired old rascal, Peggy, by this was creeping ever and ever till she raced the cart. Up then she popped, and the first thing me poor captain knew the shawl was slapped fast on his face, and two long, thin arms were dragging him out over the wheel. He tried to cry out, but the shawl choked him, and scrambling and kicking did him no good. Over the nearest stile bounced Peggy, and into the nearest field she flew, her petticoat lifted, her white hair streaming, and her red cloak fluttering behind. She crunched the chief man of the fairies under her left elbow, his head hanging behind, with as little reverence as if, 
saving your presence, he were a shrey gander. Well, your honor, Peggy ran till there wasn't a breath in her before she slowed down to a walk, and then she flung the king over her right shoulder. His face on her back in that way some careless women carry child her. This set his head free. When he saw who it was had stolen him, oh, but he was vexed. For all that he didn't say a word as they went, but lay there on her collarbone, bobbing up and down, blinking his eyes, and thinking what he should do to her. At last he quietly raced over with his teeth and took a bite at the back of her neck that she felt to her toes. Wow! Your honor should have heard the screech Peggy let out of her. Well, as she gave that screech she gave a jerk at the king's legs, pulling him down. As he flopped until her arms he took a wisp of her hair with him. For a second's time the spiteful little eyes in the old weazen face, looking up at her own from under the gold crown, froze her stiff with terror, and then, giving a yell that was ten times louder than the first screech, she flung his majesty from her down upon the hard ground. Leaping a ditch, she went galloping wildly across the meadow. The king fell flat on his back with an unreasonable jolt. That wasn't the worst of his bad luck. If Peggy had dropped him at any other place in the field he might have crawled off into the ditch and hid till sunset, but oh, Astor, they're not ten rods away, with eyes bulging and mouth gaping. Stood Barney Casey, the man without child her. Barney looked from the little bundle on the ground to Peggy as she went skimming, like a big red bird, over the low-lying morning fog. Through his surprise a foin hope slowly dawned for him. He said, Good fortune follow you, and my blessing rest on you wherever you go, Peggy Bound, for the throuble you've lifted this day. You've given me a Moses in the bull rushers or a Pharaoh's daughter, but I disremember which, God forgive me for forgetting my religion. He stood for a minute slyly looking to the north, and the south and the east and the west. But what he saw, when he turned to look again for the baby, would have made any other man than one in Barney Casey's mind say his prayers and go on his way. The baby was gone, but in its place was a little old man with a gold crown on his head, a silver-covered noggin in his hand, and the most vexed expression in the world on his face. And he thrailing a shawl and throtting toward the ditch. Twas a hard fall for the man without child her, and hard he took it. When Barney was done with bad language, he says, a second ago, me old lad, you were, or you pretended to be, an innocent child. Well, then, you'll turn back again every hair and every look of you, you'll be a smiling, harmless, pretty baby Agin, or I'll know the race and why, he says, gritting his teeth. With that he crept over and scooped up the king. There was the struggling and wiggling. Lave me down. Lave me down. You murthering spalpeen, shouted the king, kicking vicious at Barney's chist. I'm Brian Connors, the king of the good people, and I'll make you sup sorrow in take cups for this, cries he. Well, Casey, his lips shut tight and his eyes grim and cowled, hilt in his two hands, out at arm's length, the little man, who was kicking furious. For a minute Barney studied him. I believe in my soul, says the man without child her, mighty reproachful, you're only a fairy. But if that's what you are, you must have charms and spells. Now, turn yourself into a putty, harmless infant this minute, have red hair, like the mulligan child her at that, or I'll break every bone in your body. There was blazing anger in the king's eye and withering scorn in his voice. Ignorant man, he cried, don't you know that betwixt cockcrow in the morning and sunset the good people can work no spell or charm? If you don't lave me down I'll have a mark on you and on all your relations the world'll wonder at. But the devil a bit frightened was Casey. He started in to help the charm along as one would thry to make a watch go. He shook the king slowly from side to side, then joggled him softly up and down, muttering earnestly betwixt his teeth, go on, now, you little hay then, change this minute. You scorpion of the world. Come, come, twist yourself. What the little king was saying all this time you must guess at, for I'm not bither-tongued enough to repay it. Seeing that not a hair changed for all his work, Barney wrapped Maureen's shawl about the king and started for home, saying, Who'd your whist? 
It's a child I must have to be baptized this day. It'll be hard to manage, but I have a plan. You came as a child, and you'll be thrated as such, and look, if you don't quit kicking me in the stomach, I'll strangle you. As you know, to say pious words to one of the good people is worse than cutting him with a knife, to show him pious pictures is like burning him. But to baptize a fairy is the most terrible punishment in the whole world. As they went along, the king argued, besought and threatened, but he talked to stone. At last, although he had but the strength of a six-year-old child, the captain of the good people showed what high spirit was in him. Set me down, you thief, he says. I challenge you. If you have a drop of your mother's blood in you, set me furnished you with sticks in our hands, so we can fight it out like men. No, it's not needful, says Barney, cool as ice. But in a few minutes I'll shave every hair from your head, and after that make a fine Christian out of you. It's glad and thankful for it you ought to be, you wishes, ugly little pagan scoundrel. Well, the king let a roar out of him, you bandy-legged villain. He cried, and then whirled in to abuse the man without childhood. He insulted him in English, he jeered him in Irish, he thrajust him in Latin and Russian. But the most awful crash of blaggarding that was known in Ireland since the world began was when the king used the Chinese. Casey looked wonder and admiration, but made no answer till the little man was out of breath, when he spoke up like a judge. Well, if there's any crather within the earth's four corners that needs baptizing it's you, little man. But I'll not thrajus you any more, for you're me own little Romulus or Ramus, he says, scratching his head. Then of a sudden he broke out excitedly, now may four kinds of bad luck fall on your proud head this day, Mrs. Brophy, and four times heavier ones on you, and Mulligan, and may the curse of Cromwell light on you now and forever, Ted Murphy, the bachelor. For pushing yourselves here at this early hour in the morning. For the sight that met his eyes knocked every plan out of his head. Long before the time she was expected, sailing down the road to his own house, happy and slow, came in Mulligan, carrying in her arms her two weeks old baby, Patsy Mulligan. With motion like a two masted schooner, tacking in her pride from side to side, up the road came big Mrs. Brophy, the proud woman carrying her little Cornelius, behind Mrs. Brophy marched bashful Ted Murphy, the bachelor, his hands behind his back, his head bent like a captive, but stepping high. Not with the sheep-stealing air men are used to wear at christenings and weddings did Ted Murphy hop along, but with the look on his face of a man who had just been thried, convicted, sentenced. And who expects in few minutes to be hung for sheep-stealing? They were come an hour before the time to bring the child to the church. Beside the door stood Judy, straining her eyes to know what Barney had hiding in the bundle, and with an awful fear in her heart that he had robbed some near neighbor's cradle. Well, Barney at once broke into a run so as to get inside the house with the king, and to close the door before the others got there, but as luck would have it. The whole party met upon the threshold and crowded in with him. Oh, the little darling! Give us a sight of the poor crasheur, says Mrs. Mulligan, laying Patsy on the bed. He's mine first, if you plays, says Mrs. Brophy, the proud woman. He's sick, says Barney, too sick to be uncovered. Is he too sick to go to church, broke in Ted Murphy, eagerly, hoping to get rid of his job. He is, says Barney, catching at a chance for delay. Then, says Ted, with joy in his voice, I'll run and bring Father Scanlon to the house. I'll be back with him in twenty minutes, says he. Before anyone could stop the gawk, he was flying down the road to the village. Casey felt his bundle shiver. I'll have your life's blood for this. The king whispered, as Barney laid him on the bed betwixt the two child her. Come out. Come out, cries Casey spreading his arms and pushing the three women over the threshold before they knew it. Then he stood outside, holding the door shut against the three women, trying to think of a plan, and listening to more blistering talk than he ever heard on any day before that day. For the three women talked at the same time, each striving to be more disagreeable than the other. What drove him crazy was that his own wife, Judy, was the worst. 
They threatened him, they wheedled, and they stormed. The priest might ride up at any minute. The sweat rained from Barney's forehead. Once in desperation he opened the door to let the women pass, but shut it quick again when he saw the king standing up on the bed and him changing his own clothes for those of little Patsy Mulligan. Well, the women coaxed till Mrs. Mulligan lost all patience and went and sat sullen on the bench. At that Mrs. Brophy suddenly caught Barney around the waist, and whirling him aside, she and Judy rushed in. Barney, with the fierceness of a tiger, swung shut the door to keep Mrs. Mulligan at bay. The other women inside were hopping with joy. Dressed in Maureen's shawl, but divil a thing else, lay on the outside edge of the bed poor little Patsy Mulligan. The king, almost smothered, dressed in Patsy's clothes, was scrooged into the wall with a cloth about his head wrapped round and round. Oh, the little jewel, says Mrs. Brophy, picking up little Patsy Mulligan, and setting herself on the bed, he's the dead cut of his father. In that queer way women have Judy already had half a feeling that the child by some kind of magic was her own. So she spoke up sharp and said that the child was the image of her brother Mike. While they were disputing, Mrs. Brophy turned her head and saw the legs of the king below the edge of little Patsy's dress, the dress that he'd stolen, put on. For the love of God, Mrs. Casey, says she, laying her hand on Judy's chowder, did you ever before see feet on a child of two weeks old like them on Patsy Mulligan? Well, at this they laughed and tithered and doubled backward and forward on the bed, sniggering at the king and saying funny things about him, till. Mad with the shame of the women looking at his bare knees, and stung be the provoking things they said, he did a very foolish thing. He took a pin from his clothes and gave Mrs. Brophy so cruel a prod that, big as she was, and proud as she was, it lifted her in three leaps across the floor. Whoop! Whoop! She says, as she was going. Now, though heavy and haughty, Mrs. Brophy was pretty nimble on her feet, for, red and indignant, she whirled in a twinkling. Judy Casey, says she, glowering and squaring off, if that's your idea of a good, funny joke, I'll tie you a bet there, she says. When Barney, outside listening with his heart in his mouth, heard the angry voices within, a great wakeness came into his chist, for he thought everything was over. Mrs. Mulligan pushed past him, he lost the power to prevent her, and he followed her into the house with quaking knees. There was the uproar. While the three was persuading the furious Mrs. Brophy that it must have been a pin in the bedclothes, Ted Murphy, breathless, flung open the door. Father Scanlon wants to know, he cried, what ails the baby that you can't bring it to church, he says. All turned questioning eyes to Barney, till his mind fluttered like a wounded partridge. Only two diseases could the unfortunate man on the sudden remember. It's half maze-less and a thrifle of scarlet favor, he says. He couldn't a easily have said anything worse. Seeing a terrible look on Mrs. Mulligan's face, he says Agin, but I don't think it's catching, ma'am. The fright was on. With a great cry, Mrs. Brophy dived for and picked up little Cornelius and rushed with him out of the door and down the road, Mrs. Mulligan, thinking she had little Patsy, be case of the clothes, snatched up the king, his head still rolled in the cloth, and darted up the road. She was clucking curses like an angry hen as she went, and hugging the king and coddling him, and crying over him and saying foolish baby language. Till he was so disgusted that he determined to give her a shock. Oh, me poor little darling, she sobbed, pressing the king's head to her bosom, oh, Patsy, me jewel, have they killed you entirely? At that the king spoke up in a clear, cowled voice. Misdoubting her ears, Mrs. Mulligan stopped and bent her head, listening to her baby. Don't worry for me, ma'am, thank you kindly, says the baby, polite and strong. Don't trouble yourself about the general state of my robustness, it says, it's tremendous, says the child, in fact, I never was bet there. As cautiously as if she was unwrapping a rowl of but there Mrs. Mulligan began to unwind the cloth from about the king's head. When this was done she flung up her face and yelled, Ow! Ow! 
Ow! And then came right up from the ground the second hard jolt the king got that day. As he lay on his back fastening his strange clothes and thinking what he would do next, he could hear Mrs. Mulligan going down the road. She was making a noise something like a steam whistle. Be gore, says the king, sitting up and feeling of his back, today, with the women, I'm playing the devil entirely. Chapter 3 The Luck of the Mulligans The wee king of the fairies sat in the dust of the road where and Mulligan had dropped him. There were dents in his gold crown, and the baby's dress he still wore was soiled and tore. Ow! 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 What a terrible jolt Agin the ground and Mulligan gave him when she took the covering from his head and found his own face gazing up at her instead of her baby Patsy's. He turned to shake his fist up the road, and twitched it once more to shake his fist down the road. Be the bones of Pether White, he says, what me and me subjects'll do tonight to this parish'll make the big wind seem like a cock's breath. But, he says, again, how'll I hide myself till dark? We're a we're a. If it were only sunset, the sun has melted every power and charm and spell out of me, the power has left my four bones. I can be seen and molested by any spalpeen that comes along, what'll I do at all at all? I think I had best be getting through the fields back to Barney Casey's. It's little welcome they have for me there, but they must keep me sacred now for their own sakes. With that he got upon his legs, and hooded up his white dress, climbed through the stile into Casey's field. The first thing he saw there was a thin but jolly-minded looking pig, pushing up roots with her nose and tossing them into the air through sheer divilment. Dark-eyed Susan was she called, and she belonged to Tom Mulligan, the one-legged ballad maker, who had named her after the famous ballad. Mulligan was too tender-hearted to sell her to be killed, and too poor to keep her in vittles, so she roamed the fields, a shameless marauder and a nimble-footed freebooter. Be gore, here's luck. Said the little king, since tis in Casey's field, this must be Casey's based. I couldn't ask better, why never a pig is frightened it runs to its own house. So I'll just get on her back and ride down to Casey's cabin. The king looked inquiring at Susan, and Susan looked impotent suspicion at the king. Oh, ho, ye beauty, you know what's in me mind. Says he, whistlin' and coaxin' and sidlin' up to her. A pig likes a compliment if it's well tooed, so Susan hung her head, grunted coquettish, and looked away. Taking advantage of her head being turned, without another word, his royal highness ran over, laid hoot of her ear, and with one graceful jump took an acy saddle sate on her back. This was the last thing the pig expected, so with one frightened squeal from Susan both of them were off like the wind through the fields toward Mulligan's house, taking stones, ridges, and ditches like hurdle jumpers till they came in sight of a mud-plastered cabin which stood on the hillside. A second after the king's hair stood straight up and his heart grew cowled, for there, sitting on the threshold, with her family in a little crowd about her, was the woman who, misconstruing him for her own child, had fled with him from Barney Casey's, and, finding her mistake, had trun him into the high road. About the ballad maker's door was gathered his whole family, listening to the wonderful tale being tooed by Anne Mulligan. A frightened woman she was. Indeed, Wynne and Mulligan, after dropping the king in the road, raced home she fell unconscionable in the door before her husband and her frightened child her. And, she never come to till little Pether sprinkled a noggin of wather on her. Then she opened her eyes and began telling how old Nick had stole the baby and had taken little Patsy's place in her own two arms. There she sat wringing her hands and waving back and forth. The ferryman could a easily guess the story she was telling, and his flying steed was hurrying straight toward the house and nothing could stop it. They'd both be there in ten seconds. Well, this time, anyhow, I'll be killed entirely, says the king. Mrs. Mulligan turned to pint down the road to the place where she had dropped the king, when, lo and behold, up the barine and through the field they saw, coming at a tremendous pace. Dark-eyed Susan and the king, riding her like a dragoon. Mrs. Mulligan gave one screech and, lifting her petticoats, flew, 
the child her scurried off after her like young rabbits. Tom, not being able to run because of his wooden leg, stood his ground, but at the same time remembering more prayers and repentin of more main things he'd done than ever before since he was born. He was sure it was old Nick himself that was in it. And now a new danger jumped suddenly before the king. The pig headed for her favorite hole through the hedge, and when the king saw the size of the hole he let a howl out of him, for he knew he'd be trun. He scrutched close to the baste's back and drew up his legs. Sure enough he was slithered off her back and left sitting on the hard ground, half the clothes torn from his rile back. That howl finished Tom entirely, so that when his majesty crawled through the hole after the pig and came over to him, the ballad maker wouldn't have given tuppence for his sowl salvation. Howsomever, he put on the best and friendliest face he could under the circumstances. Scraping with his wooden leg and pulling at a tuft of carroty hair on his forehead, Tom said, mighty wheedling. The top o' oh, the day to your honor. Sure, how's Mrs. Balzabub and the child her? I hear it's a fine, bright family your lordship has. Ara, it isn't the likes of me, poor Tom Mulligan, the ballad maker, that your reverence be wanting. Hearing them words, the king looked mighty pleased. If you're Tom Mulligan, the ballad maker, he says, coming over smiling, it's proud and happy I am to meet you. I'm no less than Brian Connors, the king of the good people, he says, drawing himself up and trying to look grand. It's many's the fine ballad of yours we sing in Slevenamon. But little Patsy, stammered Tom, sure your majesty wouldn't take him from us, he's our twelfth and rounds out the dozen, you know. Have no fear, says the fairy. Patsy'll be here safe and sound at nightfall. If you stand friend to me this day the divil a friend you'll ever need agin as long as you live. With that the king up and toed him all the day's happenings and misfortunes. Tom could hardly bellave his eyes or his ears. He was so happy he begun in his mind making a ballad about himself and the king that minute. Ow! Says the king, bending his back and hooting his head, when I think of the ondacencies I went through this day. Your majesty'll go through no more, says Tom. With that he went stumping away to call back the wife and child her. In a few minutes the ruler of the nighttime was sitting on Mulligan's table eating the last pita tie and drinking the last sup of new milk that was in the house. The king drained the cup and smacked his lips. Now sing us a ballad, Tom Mulligan, my lad, says he, leaning back against the empty milk crock and crossing his legs like a tailor. And Mulligan nodded approval from where she sat, proud and contented on the bed, the child her smiled up from the mud floor. So Tom, who was a most melodious man, just as his wife was a most harmonious woman, up and sang the ballad of Hugh Reynolds. Me name is Hugh Reynolds, I came of dacent parents. I was born in County Cavan, as you may plainly see. Be lovin' of a maid named Catherine McCabe. My love has been Bethrade, she's a sore loss to me. There's most of the time thirty-two varses to that song, and Tom sang them all without skip pin a word. Bait that, King Brian Connors, he says at last. I challenge you. Then King Brian threw back his head and, shutting his eyes, sung another ballad of forty-seven varses, which was Catherine McCabe's answer to Hugh Reynolds. And which begins this away. Come all ye putty fair maids wherever you may be. And if you'll pay attention and listen unto me. I'll tell of a deceiver that you may beware of the same. He comes from the town of Drums Cullen in the county cavern. And Hugh Reynolds is his name. One song brought out another finer than the first, until the whole family, child her and all, jeaned in singing Willie Riley in his dear Colleen Bown. Twould make your heart young Agin to hear them. At the IND of H. Vars all the mulligans stop quick to let the king wobble his voice alone. Dark-eyed Susan was standing scratching herself inside the closed door, plazed but wondering. So, with sweet songs and old tales, the hours flew like minutes till at last the ballad-maker pushed back the table and tuned his fiddle. While the whole family, at last all of them old enough to stand, smiling, faced one another for a dance. The king chose Mrs. and Mulligan for a partner. 
The fiddle struck a note, the bear, nimble feet raised. Rocky Roads to Dublin was the tune. Deedle, deedle, dee, deedle, deedle, diddle, um. Deedle, deedle, dee, Rocky Roads to Dublin. The twinkling feet fell together. Smiles and laughter and jostling and jollity broke like a summer storm through the room. And singing and patherin' and jiggering, rose and swirled to the mad music, till suddenly, knock, knock, knock. The blows of a whip handle fell upon the door and every leg stopped stiff. Murther in Irish, whispered little Mickey Mulligan, tis Father Scanlon himself that's in it. Acon Mavrone. What a change from merrymaking and happiness to fright and scandalation was there. The master of the fairies, sure that Father Scanlon had the scent of him, tried to climb up onto the settle bed, but was too wake from fear, so misses. Mulligan hissed at him and piled three childher on top of the king to hide him just as Father Scanlon pushed open the door. The priest stood outside, hooting his horse with one hand and pintin his whip with the other. What are you hiding on that bed, you vagabone, he says. Whist. Says Tom Mulligan, hobbling over and going outside, with the fiddle under his arum, tis little Patsy, the baby, and he ain't dressed dassent enough for your reverence to see. Whispered the villain. Tom Mulligan, says the priest, shaking his whip, you're an idle, shiftless, thriftless man, and a cryin' shame and a disgrace to my flock. If you had two legs I'd bait you within an inch of your life, he says, lookin' stern at the fiddler. Faith, and it's sorry I am now for my other leg, says Tom, for it's well I know that when your reverence scolds and berates a man you only give him half a shilling or so. But if you bait him as well, your reverence sometimes empties your pockets to him. Twas hard for the priest to keep an ill-natured face, so he smiled, but as he did, without knowing it, he let fly a shot that brought terror to the heart of the ballad-maker. God help me with you and the likes of you, says the priest, thrying to look savare, you keep me from morning till night robbing Pether to pay Paul. Barney Casey, the honest man, gives me a crown for baptizing his child, and ten minutes after I must give that same money to a blackguard. Well, when Mulligan heard that his own little Patsy had been baptized Agin at the instigation of that audacious imposture, Barney Casey, the ballad maker's neck swelled with rage. But worse was to come. Gulping a great lump down his throat he axed. What name did your reverence give the baby? There was a tremble in the poor man's voice. Bony face, says the priest, his toe in the stirrup. Today is the feast of St. Boniface, a GRR bishop. He was a German man, says Father Scanlon. The groan Tom Mulligan let out of him was heart-rendering. Boniface. Oh, my poor little Patsy, bad scran to you, Barney Casey. My own child turned into a German man, oh, Boniface. The priest was too busy mounting his horse to hear what the ballad-maker said, but just before starting the good man turned in his saddle. I came near forgetting my errand, he says. There's a little old man, dwarves they call the likes of them, who has been lost from some thraveling show or caravan. Or was stole by old Peggy Collins this morning from some place, I don't rightly know which. Send the child her looking for him and use him kind. I'm going up the road spreading the news. Ignorant people might mistreat him, says his reverence, moving off. You'll find no ignorant person up this road, called Tom, in a broken voice, but Felix O'Shaughnessy, and he's not so bad, only he don't bellave in ghosts, cried Mulligan. Even as the ballad maker turned to go in the door the sun, shooting one red, angry look at the world, dropped below the western mountains. The king jumped from the bed. The charms have come back to me. I feel in my four bones the power, for tis sunset. I'm a greater man now than any king on his throne, says he. Do you send word to Barney and Judy Casey that if they don't bring little Patsy and my green velvet cloak and the silver-topped noggin and stand furnished me on this floor within half an hour? I'll have the both of them prisoners in Slevenamon before midnight, to walk on all fours the rest of their lives. As for you, my respected people, he says, a pleasanter afternoon I seldom spent, and be ready to get your reward. 
With thin words he vanished. Their surprise at his disappearance was no sooner over than the Mulligans began hunting vessels in which to put the gould the fairy was going to give them. And Mulligan was dragging in from outside an empty tub when shamefaced Judy Casey passed in, carrying little Patsy Mulligan. Behind her slunk Barney, her husband, hooting the green cloak and the silver-topped noggin. I had him for one day, and Mulligan, says Judy, handing little Patsy to his mother, and though it breaks my poor, withered heart to give him up, he's yours by right, and here he is. Whilst she was speaking those words the ruler of the fairy sprung over the threshold and laid a white bundle on the table. The household crowded up close around. Without a word the fairy drew the cover from the white bundle, and, there, like a sweet, pink rose, lay sleepin', on its white pillow the prettiest baby you ever set your two livin' eyes on. Judy gave a great gasp, for it was the identical child the fairy stole from her down in the county mayo. You don't desarve much from me, says the king, but because an mulligan, fine woman, asked it, I'll do you a favor. You may take back the baby or I'll give you a hundred pounds. Take your choice, Barney Casey. Barney stood a long time with bowed head, looking at the child and thinking hard. You can surely see what a serious question he had. One's own child is worth more than a hundred pounds, but other people's children are plenty and full of failings. Mulligan's family peered up into his face, and his wife Judy sarched him with hungry eyes. At last he said, very slow. My mind has changed, says he. Though people always tood me that child her were a throuble, a worry and a care, yesterday I'd give the county Clare for that little one. After this day's work I know that sayin's through, so I'll take the hundred pounds, he says. Divil a fear of you Taquin, the hundred pounds, snapped his wife, Judy, grabbing up the child. And, thin the two women, turning on him, fell to Abu Sin and Ballyragan, the man without child her, till Sarah bit of courage was left in his heart. I promised you your choice, and they'll lave you no choice, says the king, looking vexed. Well, here's the hundred pounds, and let Judy keep the child. When the fairy turned to the ballad maker the hearts of all the mulligans stopped still. Now, my grand fellow, me one leg genius, he says, you're goin' to be disappointed. You think I'll give you riches, but I won't. At that Tom's jaw dropped to his chest, and the littlest mulligans began to cry. I'll not make you rich because you're a born ballad maker, and a weaver of fine tales, and a genius, if you make a genius rich you take all the songs out of him and you spile him. A man's heartstrings must be often stretched almost to the breaking to get good music from him. I'll not spile you, Tom Mulligan. Besides, he says, as you are a natural-born ballad maker, you'd kill yourself the first year thrying to spind all your money at once. But I'll do bet there for you than to make you rich. And Mulligan, do you clear the table and put my silver-topped noggin on the edge of it, says he. When and Mulligan did as she was bid the king put the green cloak on his chowders and, raising his hand, pointed to the silver-covered noggin. Everyone grew still and frightened. Noggin, noggin, where's your manners, he says, very solemn. At the last word the silver lid flew open, and out of the cup hopped two little men dressed all in black, dragging something after them that began to grow and grow amazing. So quickly did they work, and so swiftly did this thing they brought twirl and change and turn into different articles that the people hadn't time to mark what form it was at first. Only they saw grow before their astonished eyes take cups and dishes and great bowls, and things like that. In a minute the table was laid with a white cloth like the quality have, and chiny dishes and knives and forks. Noggin, noggin, where's your manners, says the king again. The little men dragged from the noggin other things that grew into a roast of mutton and biled turnips, and white bread and butter, and pita ties, and pots of tay. Noggin, noggin, where's your manners, says the king, for the last time. At that the little black men, after puttin' a silver shillin' beside every plate at the table, jumped into the noggin and pulled down its lid. When the aiding and drinking and jollity were at their hoit the king arose, drew tight his crown on his head, and pointing once more to the silver-covered noggin, said. 
This is my gift to you and your reward, Tom Mulligan, maker of ballads and journeyman worker in fine tales. Tis more than your wish was. Neither you nor anyone who sits at your table, through all your life, will ever want a bite to eat or a sup to drink, nor yet a silver shilling to cheer him on his way. Good luck to all here and goodbye. Even as they looked at the king he was gone, vanished like a light that's blown out, and they never saw him more. But the news spread. Musicianers, poets, and storytellers, and geniuses flocked to the ballad maker's cabin from all over Ireland. Any fine day in the year one might see them gather in a dozen knots before his door and into as many little crowds about the stable. In each crowd, from morning till night, there was a chun being played, a ballad sung, or a story being tooed. Always one could find their blacksmiths, schoolmasters, and tinkers, and all trades, but the greater number be far, a.v. course, were beggarmen. Nor is that same to be wondered at, because every genius, if he had his own way and could folly his own heart's desired start tomorrow at daybreak with the beggarman's staff and bag. But wherever they came from, and whatever their station, Tom Mulligan stumped on his wooden leg from crowd to crowd, the jovial, happy master of them all. The Banshee's Comb Chapter 1 The Diplomacy of Bridget Chapter 1 Twas the mendin of clothes that all souls afternoon in Elizabeth and Egan's kitchen that naturally brought up the subject of husbands and the best ways to manage them. And, if there's one thing more than another that makes me take me hat off to the women, tis the audacious way the most downtrodden of their sex will brag about her blaggard husband. Not that either one or the other of the five busy-tongued and busy-fingered neighbor women who bent above their sewing or knitting that afternoon were downtrodden, be no manner of manies. Far, far from it. They were so filled with matrimonial contentedness that they fairly trampled down one another to be first in praising the wonderful men of their choice. Every woman proudly claimed to own and control the handsomest, loikliest man that ever throd in brogues. They talked so fast and, they talked so loud that, twas a thryin' long while before meek voiced little Margaret Doyle could squeege her husband, Daniel John, sideways into the argument. And even when she did get him to the fore, the other women had appropriated all the heroic qualifications for their own men, so that there was nothing left for Daniel but the common lavings. And that deprivation nettled Margaret and vexed her sore. But she took her chance when it came, poor as it was, and bolt in. Jabbing the air as though her needle were a dagger, she broke into the discourse. I wouldn't trade my Dan for the king of Rusia or the emperor of Chiny says she, peering defiant around the room. No one sided with that remark, and no one argued egg in it, and this vexed her the more. The kingdom of China is where the most superior Tay comes from, says K. Celia Crow. She was a large, solemn woman, was Mistress Crow, and a grre historian. No, says Margaret, scorning the interruption, not if the two men were rolled into one, says she. Why? says K. Celia Crow, and, her deep voice told like a passing bell, why, says she, should any dacent woman be wanton, to marry one of them hay then emperors? Sure they're all ambiguous, she says, looking around proud of the grand word. Elizabeth and stopped the spinning wheel the bet there to listen, while the others turned bothered faces to the historian. Ambiguous, says Mistress Crow, raisin, her voice in the middle part of the word. Ambiguous, she says again, manies that accordin' to the legal laws of some foreign parts, a man may marry four or five wives if he has a mind to. At this Margaret bristled up like a bantam hen. Do you mean to say, K. Celia Crow, says she, droppin' in her lap the waistcoat she was mend in, do you in time to substantiate that I'm wishin' to marry the emperor of Chiny, or, she says. Her voice growin' high and cutting as an east wind, do you wish to inferentiate that if my Daniel had the lave he'd be ambiguous? Will you please tell these friends and neighbors, she says, wavin' a hand, which of the two of us you was minded to insinuate against? The attack was so sudden and so unexpected that Mistress Crow was too bewildered to day find herself. The poor woman only sat staring, stupid at Margaret. The others sunk back in their chairs speechless with consternation till Molly Scanlon, 
Wishin, to pacificate the situation, and Winkin, friendly at Caecilia, spoke up Sutherin. Throw for ye, Margaret Doyle, says she. What kind of talk is that for ye to be talkin', Caecilia, says she. Sure if Daniel John were to be med the emperor of Chinese tomorrow he'd hesitate and deliberate a long time before bringin', in one of them ambiguous women to you and the child her. I'd like to see him thry it. It u d be a sorin, a sorrowful day for him, I'm thinkin. Dot. At thim words, Margaret, in her mind's eye, saw Daniel John standin, furnished her with an ambiguous hey then woman on each side of him, and the picture riled the blood in her heart. Oh, ho! says she, turning on poor, shrinkin' Molly with a smile, and that same smile had loaded guns and pistols in it. And will you plays be so kind and condescendin', Mr. Scanlon, says she, to explain what you ever saw or heard tell of in my Daniel John's actions. That you d make you think he'd contemplate such scoundrel endeavors, says she, thrimblin'. The only answer to the question was from the tay-kettle. It was singin', high and impotent on the hob. Now, Bridget Ogle, knowin' the woman that she was, had wisely kept out of the discourse. She sat apart, calmly nipped in one of Darby's winter stockings. As she listened, howsomever, she couldn't keep back a sly smile that lifted one corner of her mouth. Isn't it a poor and a pitiful case, said Mistress Doyle, glaring savage from one to the other, that a dacent man, the father of knowing childer, eight of them livin'. And one gone for a soldier, isn't it a burnin', shame, she says, whumperin'. That such a dacent man must have his charactor thragist before his own wife, will you be so good as to tell me what you're laughing at, Bridget Ogle, ma'am? She blazed. Bridget, fluttering guilty, thried to hide the misfortunate smile, but twas too late. Because, if it is my husband you're mocking at, says Margaret, let me tell you, fair and plain, his aquils don't live in the county of Tipperary, let alone this parish. Tis throw, she says, tossin' her head, he hasn't spent six months with the good people, he knows nothin' of the fairies, but he has more sense than those that have. At any rate, he isn't afeard of ghosts like a knowledgeable man that I could mint eye on. That last thrust touched a sore spot in the heart of Bridget. Although Darby Ogill would fight a dozen livin' men, if needful, twas well known he had an unreasonable fear of ghosts. So, Bridget said never a word, but her brown eyes began to sparkle, and her red lips were drawn up to the size of a button. Margaret saw how hard she'd hit, and she went on triumphant. My Daniel John U.D. sleep in a churchyard. He's done it, says she, crowin. Bridget could hoot in no longer. I'd be sore and sorry, she says, if a husband of mine were druv to do such a thing as that for the sake of a little pace and quiet says she, tenin' her childer. Terran bounds, but that was the stroke. The Lord bless us, mothered Molly Scanlon. Margaret's mind went up in the air and stayed there whirlin', whilst she herself sat gasping and panting for a reply. Twas a thrilling, suspenseful minute. The Chinese shepherd and shepherdess on the mantel stopped ogling their eyes and looked shocked at each other. At the same time Bob, the linnet, in his wooden cage at the door, quit his singin' and cocked his head the bet there to listen. The surprised Tay Kettle gave a gasp and a gurgle, and spluttered over the fire. In the terrible silence Elizabeth Egan got up to wet the tay. Set tin the teapot in the fender she spoke, and she spoke raisinful. Any sensible man is afeard of ghosts, says she. Oh, indeed, says Margaret, catching her breath. Is that so? Well, sensible or unsensible, says she, this will be Halloween, and there's not a man in the parish who would walk past the churchyard up to Cormac McCarthy's house. Where the banshee keened last night, except my Daniel. Says she, triumphant. The hurt pride in Bridget rose at that and forced from her angry lips a foolish promise. Ha! Huh. We hear ducks talkin', she says, coolly rolling up Darby's stocking, and sticking the needle in the ball of yarn. This afternoon I was at Cormac McCarthy's, she says, and there wasn't a bit of tay in the house for poor Eileen, 
so I promised Cormac I'd send him up a handful. Now, be the same token, I promise you my Darby will make no bones of going on that errand this night. Ho! 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 laughed Margot. If he has the courage to do it bid him stop in to me on his way back, and I'll send to you a fine set tin of eggs from my black Spanish hen. What sharp word Mistress Ogil would have flung back in answer no one knows, because when once provoked she has few aquils for sarcastic language. But just then Elizabeth and put in Bridget's hand a steaming cup of good, strong tay. Now, whusky, ale, and porther are all good enough in their places, your honor, I've nothing to intimidate against them, but for a comforting, soothering. A daffing beverage give me a cup of foin black tay. So this day the cups were filled only the second time, when the subject of husbands was completely dropped, and the conversation wandered to the mistage meaners of Anthony Sullivan's goat. All this time the women had been so busy with their talkin' and argifying that the creeping darkness of a coming storm had stolen unnoticed into the room, making the fire glow brighter and redder on the hearth. A faint flare of lightning, followed by a low grumble of thunder, brought the women to their feet. Marcy on us, says Kay Celia Crow, glad of an excuse to be gone, do you hear that? We'll all be drowned before we reach home, says she. In a minute the visitors, after draining their cups, were out in the road, H hurrying on her separate way, and tying her bonnet strings as she went. Twas a heavy and a guilty heart that Bridget carried home with her through the gathering storm. Although Darby was a nuntimate friend of the fairies, yet, as Margaret Doyle said, he had such a black dread of all other kinds of ghosts that to get him out on this threatening Halloween night. To walk past the churchyard, as he must do on his way to Cormac McCarthy's cottage, was a job equal to Lifton, the Shannon Bridge. How she was to manage it she couldn't for the life of her tell, but if the errant was left undone she would be the Logan stock of every woman in the parish. But worst of all, and what cut her heart the sorest, was that she had turned an act of neighborly kindness into a wainglorious boast, and that, she doubted not, was a mortal sin. She had promised Cormac in the afternoon that as soon as she got home she would send Darby over with some tay for poor little Eileen, and now a big storm was gathering. And before she could have supper ready, thry as hard as she could, black night might be upon them. To bring ace to the dying is the comfortingest privilege a man or woman can have, and I've thraded it for a miserable set tin of eggs, she says. Aament I the unfortunate crasheur, she thought, to have let me pride ruin me this away. What'll I do at all at all, she cried. Bad luck to the thought that took me out of me way to Elizabeth Egan's house. Then she met a wish that she might be able to get home in time to send Darby on his errand before the night came on. If they laugh at me, that'll be my punishment, and maybe it'll claim my sin, says she. But the wish was in vain. For just as she crossed the stile to her own field the sun dropped behind the hills as though he had been shot, and the east wind swept up, carrying with it a sky full of black clouds and rain. Chapter 2 That same All Souls Night Darby Ogil, the friend of the fairies, sat, as he had often sat before, amidst the dancing shadows, furnished his own crackling turf and wood fire, listening to the storm beat against his cottage windows. Little Mickey, his six-year-old, cuddled asleep on his daddy's lap, whilst Bridget sat beside Thim, the other child her crittled around her. My, oh my, how the rain powered and hammered and swirled. Out in the highway the big drops smashed Agin wayfarers' faces like blows from a fist, and once in a while, over the flooded moors and the far row of lonesome hills. The sullen lightning spurted red and angry, like the wishes flare of a wolcano. You may well say, twas perfect weather for Halloween, tonight when the spirits of the departed dead visit once again their homes, and sit unseen, listening and yearning about the old hearthstones. More than once that Avenin Darby shivered and shuddered at the wild shrieks and wails that swept over the chimney tops. He be in sartin sure that it wasn't the wind at all, but despairing voices that cried out to him from the could lips of the dead. At last, after one particular doleful cry that rose and fell and lingered around the roof, 
the knowledgeable man raised his head and fetched a deep breath. And said to his wife Bridget. Do you hear that cry, Avernine? The dear Lord be merciful to the souls of the departed, sighed he. Bridget turned a troubled face toward him. Amen, she says, speaking, softly. And may he preserve them who are dying this night. Poor Eileen McCarthy, and she the putty, light-footed Colleen only married the few months. Haven't we the raisins to be thankful and grateful? We can never pray enough, Darby, says she. Now the family had just got off their knees from night prayers, that had lasted half an hour, so thim last words worried Darby greatly. That woman, he says to himself, mighty sour, is this minute contemplatin' and insinuatin' that we haven't said prayers enough for Eileen, when as it is. Me two poor knees have blisters on thim as big as hen's eggs from Neelin. And, if I don't look out, he says to himself again, she'll put the child her to bed and then she's down on her knees for another hour, and me wit her. I'd never advise anyone to marry such a pious woman. I'm fairly kilt with religion, so I am. I must distract her mind and prevent her intentions, he says to himself. Maybe, Bridget, he says, out loud, as he was readying his pipe, it ain't so bad after all for Eileen. If we keep hoping for the best, We'll chate the worst out of a few good hours at any rate, says the knowledgeable man. But Bridget only rolled the apron about her folded arms and shook her head sorrowful at the fire. Darby squinted carefully down the stem of his pipe, blew in it, took a sly glance at his wife, and went on. Don't you remember, Bridget, he says, when old Mrs. Rafferty lay sick of a bad information of the stomach, well, the banshee sat for a full hour keening and crying before their house, just as it did last night outside Cormac McCarthy's. And you know the banshee cried but once at Rafferty's, but never returned the second time. The information left Julia, and all the wide world knows, even the King of Spain might know if he'd send to axe, that Julia Rafferty, as strong as a horse, was digging petitize in her own field as late as yesterday. The banshee comes three nights before anyone dies, doesn't it, daddy, says little Mickey, waking up, all excited. It does that, says Darby, smiling, proud at the child's knowledgeableness. And it's come but once to Eileen McCarthy. And while the banshee cries, she sits combing her hair with a comb of gold, don't she, daddy? Bridget sat onazy, bit in, her lips. Always and ever she had shrove to keep from the child her tidings of fairies and of banshees and ghosts and other unnatural people. Twice she trun a warning look at Darby, but he, not noticin', went on, strokin', the little lad's hair, and sayin', to him. It does, indeed, a vic, and as she came but once to Mrs. Rafferty's, so we have reason to hope she'll come no more to Cormac McCarthy's. Hush that nonsense, says Bridget, lookin' daggers. Sure Jack Doolin says that twas no banshee at all that come to Rafferty's, but only himself who had taken a drop too much at the fair. And on his way home sat down to rest himself by Rafferty's door. He says that he started singing pious hymns to cape off the evil spirits, and everyone knows that the same Jack Doolin has as tubble a voice for singing as any banshee that ever twisted a lip. She says. The woman's contrariness vexed Darby so he pounded his knee with his fist as he answered her, You'll not deny, maybe, he says, that the Costa Bower stopped one night at the hall. Anne. Whist. Cried Bridget, lave off, she says, sure that's no kind of talk to be talkin' this night before the child her, says she. But Mammy, I know what the Costa Bower is, cried little Mickey, sitting up straight in Darby's lap and, pinting his finger at his mother, tis I that knows well. The Costa Bower is a grr black coach that comes in the night to carry down to Croagma the dead people the banshee keened for. The other child her by now were sitting bolt upright, stiff as ramrods, and staring wild-eyed at Mickey. The coachman's head is cut off and he hoods the reins this away, says the child, letting his hands fall limp and open at his side. Sometimes it's all wisable, and then again it's unwisable, 
but always when it comes one can hear the turbo rumble of its wheels. Mickey's voice fell and, spreading out his hands, he spoke slow and solemn. One Halloween night in the woods down at the Black Pond, Danny Hogan heard it coming and he jumped behind a stone. The threes couldn't stop it, they went right through it, and, as it passed Danny Hogan says he saw one white, dead face laned back egg in the dark cushions. And this is the night, all Sowl's night, when it's sure to be out. Now don't I know, he says, triumphant. At that Bridget started to her feet. For a minute she stood speechless with vexation at the wild, frighting notions that had got into the heads of her childhood, then, glory be, she says, looking hard at Darby. You could have heard a pin drop in the room. Old Malachi, the big yellow cat, who until this time lay coiled asleep on a stool, was the best judge of Bridget's character in that house. So, no sooner did he hear the words and see Bridget start up, than he was on his own four feet, his back arched, his tail straight up, and his two golden eyes sear chin, her face. One look was enough for him. The next instant he leapt to the ground and started for the far room. As he scampered through the door, he threw a swift look back at his comrades, the child her, and that look said plain as any words could say. Run for it while you've time. Folly me. Some one of us vagebones has done something murderin'. Malachi was right. There would have been serious trouble for all hands, only that a softening thought was on Bridget that night which sobered her temper. She stopped a bit, the frown on her face clearing as she looked at the child her, and she only said, Come out of this. To bed with yes. I'm raising a pack of audacious young romancers, and I didn't know it. Mickey stopped that whimpering and make haste with your clothes. The Lord help us, he's broke off another button. Look at that, now, she says. There was no help for them. So, with Longin looks trun back at their father, sitting cozy before the fire, and with Con Zolan winks and nods from him, the child her followed their mother to the bedroom. Thin, whilst Bridget was tucking the covers about them, and hushing their complainings, Darby sat with his elbows on his knees, doing in his head a sum in figures. And that sum was this. How much would it be worth this all Sowl's night for a man to go out that door and walk past the churchyard up to Cormac McCarthy, the stonecutter's house? One time he made the answer as low as ten pounds two shillings and threepence, but as he did so a particular loud blast went shrieking past outside. And he raised the answer to one thousand five hundred and twenty pounds sterling. And cheap at that, he said aloud. While he was studying thim sagacious questions, Bridget stole quietly behind and put a light hand on his childer. For a minute, Thin, neither of Thim said a word. Surprised at the silence, and puzzled that little Mickey had escaped a larruping, Malachi crept from the far room and stood still in the doorway judging his mistress. An expression was on her face the cat couldn't quite make out. Twas an elevated, pitying, good-hearted, datermind look, such as a man wears when he goes into the sty to kill one of his own pigs for Christmas. Malachi, being a wise and experienced based, decided to take no chances, so he backed through the door again and hid under the dresser to listen. I was just thinking, Darby of Renin, says the woman, half whispering, how we might this blessed night earn great credit for our two souls. Wait! says the sly man, straightening himself, and raising a hand. The very thing you're going to spake was in my own mind. I was just Dalebertin that I hadn't done justice tonight to poor Eileen. I haven't said me prayers far vint enough. I neither can win we're praying together, or when I'm kneeling down. Thin, like every way else, there's something queer about me. The foinest prayers I ever say is when I'm be myself alone in the fields, says the conniving villain. So, do you, Bridget, go in and kneel down by the child her for a half hour or so, and I'll sit here doing my best. If you should happen to look out at me ye might a easily think, he says, that I was only sitting here comfortably smoking my pipe. But at the same time prayers'll be whirlin' inside of me like a windmill, says he. 
Oh, Thin, ain't I glad and happy to hear you say thin words, says his wife, Putton, one foin arum about his neck. You've taken a load off my heart that's been weighing heavy on it all night, for I thought maybe you'd be afeard. Afeard of what? asked Darby, lifting his eyebrows. Malachi throtted boldly in and jumped up on the stool. You know Father Cassidy says, whispered Bridget, that a loving deed of the hands done for the distressed is itself a prayer worth a week of common prayers. I have nothing agin that sayin', says Darby, his head cocked, and he growin' suspicious. Bridget wiped her forehead with her apron. Well, this afternoon I was at McCarthy's house, she went on, soothering his hair with one hand, and, oh, but the poor child was distressed. Her cheeks were flaming with the favor. And, Darby, the thirst, the awful thirst. I looked about for a pinch of tay, there's nothing so cool and for one in the favor as a cup of wake tay, and, the sara scrap of it was in the house, so I tooed Cormac that tonight. As soon as the childer were in bed, I'd send you over with a pinch. Every one of Darby's four bones stiffened and a mortal chill shruck into his heart. Listen, darlint, she says, the storm's dying down, so while you're putting on your greatcoat I'll wrap up the bit of tay. He shook her hand from his childers. Woman, he says, with bitter politeness, I think you said that we had a great chance to get credit for our two sowls. That's what I think you remarked and stipulated, says he. Ara, shouldn't a woman have great praise and credit who'll send her husband out on such a night as this, his wife says. The worse the conditions, the more credit she'll get. If a ghost were to jump at ye as you go past the churchyard, oughtn't I be the happy woman entirely, says Bridget. There was a kind of a tinkle in her voice, such as comes when Bridget is telling jokes, so Darby, with a sudden hope in his mind, turned quick to look at her. But there she stood grim, unfeeling, and datermined as a pint gun. Oh, ho! Is that the way it is, he says. Well, here's luck and good fortune to the ghost or skeleton that lays his hand on me this blessed night. He stuck his two hands deep in his pockets and whirled one leg across the other, the most aggravating thing a man can do. But Bridget was not the last discouraged. She only made up her mind to come at him on his soft side, so she spoke up and said. Suppose I was dying of the favor, Darby Ogill, and Cormac refused to bring over a pinch of tay to me. What, then, would ye think of the stonecutter? Malachi, the cat, stopped licking his paws, and trun a sharp, inquiring eye at his master. Bridget, says the knowledgeable man, giving his hand an argifying wave. We have two separate ways of being good. Your way is to scurry round and do good acts. My way is to keep from doing bad ones. And who knows, he says, with a pious sigh, which way is the better one? It isn't for us to judge, says he, shaken his head solemn at the fire. Bridget walked out in front of him and fouled at her arms tight. So you won't go, she says, sharp and sudden. The divil afoot, says he, begin mean to whistle. You'd think, now, Bridget was bait, but she still hilt her trump card, and until that was played and lost the lad wasn't safe. All right, me brave hero, says she, do you sit there be the fire. I'll go myself, she says. With that she bounced into the childer's room and began to get ready her cloak and hood. For a minute Darby sat poking the fire, motherin' to himself and feeling very discommodious. Thin, just to show he wasn't the last bit onazy, the lad cleared his throat, and waggin' his head at the fire, began to sing. Yara! As I walked out one more arneen all in the month of June. The primroses and daisies o oh, cowslips were in bloom. I spied a putty fair made a strollin' on the lea. And Rory Bory Alice. Nor any other old ancient heathen goddess. Was not half so fair as she. Says I, me putty fair maid, I'll take you for me bride. And if you'll pay no at Tintian. Glancing up sudden, he saw Malachi's eye on him. And if ever the features of a cat spoke silent but plain language Malachi's face talked that minute to its master, and this is what it said. 
well, of all the cowardly. Creaking Bosthenes I ever see in all me born days you are the worst, Darby Ogil. You've not only give impotence to your wife, and she's worth four of you, but you've gone back on the friends you pretended to. Malachi's features got no further in their insulting remarks. For at that Darby swooped up a big sod of turf and let it fly at the audacious baste. Now it is well known that be a spontaneous troll like that no one ever yet hit a sensible cat, but always and ever in that unlucky endeavor he strikes a damaging or blow where it's not intended. So it was this time. Bridget, wearing her red cloak and hood, was just coming through the door, and that misfortunate sod of turf caught her fair and square, right below the chist, and she staggered back egg in the wall. Darby's consternation and complication and interpretation were bayant imagination. Bridget lained there gasping. If she felt as bad as she looked, for Dublin surgeons with their saws and knives couldn't have done her a hopworth of good. Howsomever, for all that, the sly woman had seen Malachi dodge and go gallopin away, but she pretended to think, twas at herself the turf was trun. Not that she scolded, or anything so common as that, but she went on like an early Christian Marthier who was just going to be introduced to the roaring loins. Well, as you may ACC, the poor man, her husband, hadn't a chance in the world after that. Of course, to rightify himself, he'd face all the ghosts in Chroma. So, in a minute, he was standing in his greatcoat with his hand on the latch. There was a packet of tay in his pocket, and he was a subdued and conquered man. He looked so woeful that Bridget repented and almost relented. Remember, he says, mournful, if I'm caught this night be the cost of our, or be the banshee, take good care of the child her, and remember what I say, I didn't mean, Bridget. To hit ye with that sod of turf. Oh, ain't ye the foolish darlin', to be afeard, smiled Bridget back at him, but she was serious, too. Don't you know that when one goes on an errand of Marcy a score of God's white angels with swords in their hands march before and beside and after him, keeping his path free from danger? With that she pulled his face down to hers, and kissed him as she used in the old courtin' days. There's nothing puts so much high courage and clear, steadfast purpose in a man's heart, if it be properly given, as a kiss from the woman he loves. So, with the warmth of that kiss to cheer him, Darby set his face egg in the storm. Chapter 2 The Banshee's Halloween Chapter 1 Halloween night, to all unhappy ghosts, is about the same as St. Patrick's Day is to you or to me, tis a great holiday in every churchyard. And no one knew this better or felt it keener than did Darby Ogil, that same Halloween night. As he stood on his own doorstep with the paper of black tay for Eileen McCarthy safely stowed away in the crown of his top hat. No one in that barony was quicker than he at an act of neighborly kindness, but now, as he huddled himself together in the shelter of his own eaves, and thought of the dangers before. And, of the cheerful fire and comfortable bed he was leaving behind, black rebellion rushed shouting across his heart. Oh, my, oh, my. What a perishin night to turn a man out into, he says. It'd be half a comfort to know I was going to be killed before I got back, just as a warning to Bridget, says he. The mistrated lad turned a sour eye on the tumultuous weather. And groaned deep as he pulled closer about his childers the cape of his greatcoat and plunged into the desarted and flooded roadway. Howsomever, twas not the pelting rain, nor the lashing wind, nor yet the pitchy darkness that bothered the heart out of him as he went splashing and stumbling along the road. A thought of something more railentless than the storm, more mysterious than the night's blackness put pounds of lead into the lad's unwilling brogues. For somewhere in the shrouding darkness that covered McCarthy's house the banshee was waiting this minute, perhaps, ready to jump out at him as soon as he came near her. And, oh, if the banshee nabbed him there, what in the world would the poor lad do to save himself? At the realization of this situation, the goose flesh crept up his back and settled on his neck and childers. He began to cast about in his mind for a bit of cheer or a scrap of comfort, as a man in such circumstances will do. So, grumbling and sore-hearted, 
he turned over Bridget's parting words. If one goes on an errand of Marcy, Bridget had said, a score of God's white angels with swords in their hands march before and beside and after him, keeping his path free from danger. He felt anxious in his hat for the bit of charitable tay he was bringing, and was glad to find it there safe and dhry enough, though the rest of him was drenched through and through. Isn't this an act of charity I'm doin', to be bringin' a cooling drink to a dyin' woman, he asked himself aloud. To be sure it is. Well, then, what racin' have I to be afeard? Says he, pokin' his two hands into his pockets. Ara, it's acy enough to bolster up one's heart with wise sayin' and heroic precepts when sitting commodious by one's own fire. But talkin' wise words to oneself is mighty poor comfort when you're on the lonely high road of a Halloween night. With a churchyard waitin' for ye on the top of the hill not two hundred yards away. If there was only one star to break through the thick sky and shine for him, if there was but one friendly cow to low or a distant cock to break the teeming silence. Twould put some heart into the man. But not a sound was there only the swish and wailing of the wind through the invisible hedges. What's the matter with the whole world? Where is it wanish to, says Darby. If a ghost were to jump at me from the churchyard wall, where would I look for help? To run is no use, he says, and to face it is. Just then the current of his misdoubtings ran whack up against a saying of old Peggy O'Callaghan. Mrs. O'Callaghan's reputation for truth and veracity, when it come to fairy tales or ghost stories, be it known, was equal if not superior to the best in Tipperary. Now, Peggy had towled Ned Mullen, and Ned Mullen had towled Bill Donahue, the tinker. And the tinker had advised Darby that no one need ever be afeard of ghosts if he only had the courage to face them. Peggy said, the poor crushures ain't Roman about shakin', chains and moanin', and groanin', just for the sport of scarin' people, nor yet out of mainness. Tis always a throuble that's on their minds, a message they want sent, a sacret they're endeavoring to unload. So instead of flyin' from the unhappy things, as most people generally do, she said, one should walk up bold to the apparition, be it gentle or common, male or female, and, say. What troubles ye, sir? Or, what's amiss with ye, ma'am? And, take my word for it, says she, ye'll find yourself a bony factor to them when you last expect it, she says. Twas a query day, but not so unreasonable after all when one comes to think of it. And, the knowledgeable man fell to Dalebriton, whether he'd have the hardness to folly it out if the chance came. Sometimes he thought he would, then again he was sure he wouldn't. For Darby Ogill was one who bent quick under trouble like a young three before a hurricane, but he only bent, the trouble never broke him. So, at times his courage went down to a spark like the light of a candle in a gust of wind, but before you could turn on your heel, twas blazing up strong and fiercer than before. Whilst thus contemplatin' and meditatin', his foot struck the bridge in the hollow just below the barren ground, and, there as the boy paused a minute. Churning up bravery enough to carry him up the hill and past the mysterious gravestones, there came a short quiver of lightning, and, in its sudden flare he was sure he saw not ten yards away. And, coming down the hill toward him, a dim shape that took the breath out of his body. Oh, be the powers, he gasped, his courage emptying out like water from a spilt pail. It moved, a slow, grey, formless thing without a head, and, so far as he was able to judge it might be about the size of an elephant. The persecuted lad swung himself sideways in the road, one arm over his eyes and, the other stretched out at full length, as if to ward off the terrible visitor. The first thing that began to take any shape in his bewildered brain was Peggy O'Callaghan's advice. He tried to folly it out, but a chattering of teeth was the only sound he made. And all this time a tremendous splashin', like the flop pin, of whales, was coming nearer and nearer. The splashin' stopped not three feet away, and the haunted man felt in the spine of his back and in the calves of his legs that a powerful, unholy monster towered over him. Why he didn't swunge in his tracks is the wonder. 
He says he would have dropped at last if it weren't for the distant bark of his own good dog, Cesar, that put a throb of courage until his bones. At that friendly sound he opened his two dhry lips and stuttered the saying. Whoever you are, and whatever shape ye come in, take heed that I'm not afeard, he says. I command ye to tell me your troubles and, I'll be your bony factor. Then go back dasent and respectable where you're buried. Spaken, I'll listen, says he. He waited for a reply, and, getting none, a hot splinter of shame at being, so badly frightened turned his soul into vexation. Spake up, he says, but come no further, for if you do, be the hokey I'll take one thry at ye, ghost or no ghost, he says. Once more he waited, and as he was lowering the arum from his eyes for a peek, the ghost spoke up, and, its answer came in two pitiful, distressed roars. A damp breath puffed across his face, and opening his eyes, what should the lad see but the two droopin' ears of Solomon, Mrs. Kilcannon's grey donkey. Five different kinds of disgust biled up into Darby's throat and almost strangled him. Ye murderin', big-headed imposture, he gasped. Half a minute after a brown hoot owl, which was sheltered in a nearby blackthorn tree, called out to his brother's family which inhabited the belfry of the chapel above on the hill that some black-minded spalpeen had holt of Solomon Kilcannon be the two ears and was kickin' the ribs out of him. And that the language the man was usin' to the poor baste was worse than Scanlaus. Although Darby couldn't understand what the owl was sayin', he was startled be the blood curdlin hoot, and that same hoot saved Solomon from any further extraordinary throuncin. Because as the angry man stopped to hearken there flashed on him the realization that he was baiting an, Kroll Malthraten, a blessing in dishguise. For this same Solomon had the reputation of being the knowingest, sensiblest thing which walked on four legs in that parish. He was a favorite with young and old, especially with childher, and Mrs. Kilcannon said she could talk to him as if he were a human, and she was sure he understood. In the face of thim facts the knowledgeable man changed his chun, and, puttin, his arum friendly around the distressed animal's neck, he said. Aren't ye ashamed of yourself, Solomon? To be paradin and meanderin around the churchyard Halloween night, disguisin yourself this away as an outlandish ghost, and, you havin, the foin reputation for decency and good manners? He says, excusin, himself. I'm ashamed of you. So I am, Solomon, says he, hauling the baste about in the road, and turning him till his head faced once more the hillside. Come back with me now to Cormac McCarthy's, a Vernine. We've each been in worse company, I'm thinkin', at last you have, Solomon, says he. At that, kind and friendly enough, the forgiven, baste turned with him, and, the two keeping each other slitherin', company, went stumblin' and scramblin' up the hill toward the chapel. On the way Darby kept up a one-sided conversation about all manner of things, just so that the ring of a human voice, even if t'was only his own, would take a bit of the cruel lonesomeness out of the dark hedges. Did you notice MacDonald's stream as you came along the night, Solomon? It must be a roarin' torrent be this, with the pourin' rains, and we'll have to cross it, says he. We could go over MacDonald's stone bridge that stands Fernance McCarthy's house, with only Nolan's meadow betwixt the two, but, says Darby, laying a hand, confidential on the ass's wet back. Tis only a fortnight since long Felix, the blind beggarman, fell from the same bridge and broke his neck, and, what more natural, he axed. Than that the ghost of Felix would be celebrating its first Halloween, as a ghost, at the spot where he was killed? You may believe me or believe me not but at thim word Solomon stopped dead still in his thracks and refused to go another step till Darby coaxed him on be saying. Oh, Thin. We won't cross it if you're afeard, little man, says he, but we'll take the path through the fields on this side of it, and we'll cross the stream by McCarthy's own wooden footbridge. Tis within tundy feet of the house. Oh, ye needn't be afeard, he says Agin, I've seen the cows cross it, so it'll surely hood the both of us. A sudden remembrance whipped into his mind of how tall the stile was, Ladin, into Nolan's meadow, and, the boy was puzzling deep in his mind to know how was Solomon to climb across that stile. 
when all at once the gloomy western gate of the graveyard rose quick be their side. The two shied to the opposite hedge, and no wonder they did. Fufty ghosts, all in their shrouds, sat cheek be jowl along the churchyard wall, never carrying a hopworth for the wind or the rain. There was little Ted Rogers, the humpback, who was drowned in Mullins well four years come Michaelmas. There was Black Mulligan, the gamekeeper, who shot Ryan, the poacher, sitting with a gun on his lap, and he Gloeran, beside the gamekeeper sat the poacher, with a jagged black hole in his forehead. There was Thaddy Finnegan, the scholar, who was disappointed in love and died of a decline, further on sat Mrs. Houlihan, who departed this life from aiding of pies and mushrooms. Next to her sat, oh, a hundred others. Not that Darby saw them, do ye mind? He had too good sense to look that way at all. He walked with his head turned out to the open fields, and his eyes squeezed shut. But something in his mind told him they were there. And he felt in the marrow of his bones that if he gave them the encouragement of one glance two or three'd slip off the wall and come moanin' over to tell him their throubles. What Solomon saw and what Solomon heard, as the two went shrinkin' along will never be known to living man, but once he gave a jump, and twice Darby felt him thrimblin'. And when they raced at last the chapel wall the baste broke into a swift throt. Pretty soon he galloped, and Darby went gallopin' with him, till two yellow blurs of light across in a field to the left marked the windies of the stonecutter's cottage. Twas a few steps only, thin, to the stile over into Nolan's meadow, and there the two stopped, looking helpless at each other. Solomon had to be lifted, and there was the throuble. Three times Darby thried be main strength to hist his companion up the steps, but in vain, and Solomon was clean disgusted. Only for the tender corn on our hero's left little toe, I think maybe that at length and at last the pair would have got safe over. The kind-hearted lad had the donkey's two little hoofs planted on the top step, and whilst he himself was liftin' the rest of the baste in his arums, Solomon got onazy that he was goin' to be trun. And so began to twist and squirm. Of course, as he did, Darby slipped and went thump on his back egg in the stile, with Solomon sittin', comfortable on top of the lad's chist. But that wasn't the worst of it, for as the baste scrambled up he planted one hard little hoof on Darby's left foot. And the knowledgeable man let a yowl out of him that must have frightened all the ghosts within miles. Seein' he'd done wrong, Solomon bolt for the middle of the road and stood there wiry and attentive. Listening to the names flung at him from where his late comrade sat on the lowest step of the stile nursin, the herded foot. Twas an excited owl in the belfry that this time spoke up and shouted to his brother down in the blackthorn. Come up, come up quick, it says. Darby Ogill is just after calling Solomon Kilcannon a Malay factor. Darby rose at last, and as he climbed over the stile he turned to shake his fist toward the middle of the road. Bad luck to ye for a thickhead, ungrateful informer, he says, you go your way and I'll go mine, we're sunders, says he. So saying, the crippled man went limp in, and grumplin' down the barin, through the meadow, whilst his disarred friend sent reproach full braze after him that would go to your heart. The throbbin' of our hero's toe banished all pity for the baste, and even all thoughts of the banshee, till a long, gurgling. Swooping sound in front told him that his fears about the rise in MacDonald's stream were under rather than over the actual conditions. Fearing that the wooden footbridge might be swept away, as it had been the year previous, he hurried on. Most times this stream was only a quiet little brook that ran betwixt putty green banks, with hardly enough water in it to turn the broken wheel in Chartres ruined mill. But tonight it swept along an angry, snarlin', Grolin river that overleapt its banks and dragged wildly at the swaying willows. Be a narrow throw of light from McCarthy's side windy our traveller could see the maddened wather striven and tearing to pull with it the props of the little footbridge. And the boards shook and the centre swayed under his feet as he passed over. Bedad, I'll not cross this way goin' home, at any rate, he says, looking back at it. The words were no sooner out of his mouth than there was a crack, and the middle of the footbridge lifted in the air, twisted round for a second, 
and then hurled itself into the stream, Laving the two in still standing in their place on the banks. Thunder and turf, he cried, I mustn't forget to tell the people within of this, for if ever there was a thrap set by evil spirits to drown a poor, unwary morsel, there it stands. Oh, ain't the ghost's terrible wishes on Halloween. He stood dripping a minute on the threshold, listening, thin, without knocking, lifted the latch and stepped softly into the house. Chapter 2 Two candles burned above the blue and white chiny dishes on the table, a bright fire blazed on the hearth. And over in the corner where the low bed was set the stonecutter was on his knees beside it. Eileen lay on her side, her shining hair streeled out on the pillow. Her putty, flushed face was turned to Cormac, who knelt with his forehead hid on the bed covers. The Colleen's two little hands were clasped about the great fist of her husband, and she was talking low, but so earnest that her whole life was in every word. God save all here! said Darby, Takin off his hat, but there was no answer. So deep were Cormac and Eileen in some conversation they were having together that they didn't hear his coming. The knowledgeable man didn't know what to do. He realized that a husband and wife about to part forever were looking into each other's hearts, for maybe the last time. So he just stood shifting from one foot to the other, watching them, unable to depart, and not wishing to obtrude. Oh, it isn't death at all that I fear, Eileen was saying. No, no, Cormac Astor, tis not that I'm misdoubtful of, but, a cone of roan, tis you I fear. The kneeling man gave one swift upward glance, and drew his face nearer to the sick wife. She went on, thin, spock in, tinder and half smiling and stuck in his hand. I know, darlint, I know well, so you needn't tell me. That if I were to live with you a thousand years you'd never shray in mind or thought to any other woman, but it's when I'm gone, when the lonesome evenings folly each other through days and months. And, maybe years, and, you sitting here at this fireside without one to speak to, and, you so handsome and, gran, and, with the penny or two we've put away. Oh, Astor McCree. Why can't ye banish them black thoughts? Says the stonecutter. Maybe, he says, the banshee will not come again. Ain't all the countryside praying for ye this night, and, didn't Father Cassidy himself bid you to hope? The saints in heaven couldn't be so cruel, says he. But the Colleen went on as though she hadn't heard him, or as if he hadn't interrupted her. And listen, says she. They'll come urging ye, the neighbors, and raisinin' with you. Your own flesh and blood'll come, and, no doubt, me own with them, and, they all striving to push me out of your heart, and, to put another woman there in my place. I'll know it all, but I won't be able to call to you. Cormac McCree, for I'll be lying silent under the grass, or under the snow up behind the church. While she was saying thim last words, although Darby's heart was melting for Eileen. His mind began running over the Colleens of that townland to pick out the one who'd be most likely to marry Cormac in the IND. You know how far-seeing and quick-minded was the knowledgeable man. He settled sudden on the Hanlon girl, and decided at once that she'd have Cormac before the year was out. The undecency of such a thing made him furious at her. He says to himself, half crying, Why, then, bad cess to you for a shameless, red-haired, forward baggage, Bridget Hanlon, to be runnin' after the man, and throwing yourself in his way. And Eileen not yet cowled in her grave. He says, while he was saying them things to himself, McCarthy had been whispering fierce to his wife, but what it was the stonecutter said the friend of the fairies couldn't hear. Eileen herself spoke clean enough in answer, for the favor gave her unnatural strength. Don't think, she says, that it's the first time this thought has come to me. Two months ago, when I was strong and well and sitting happy as a meadowlark at your side, the same black shadow drifted over me heart. The worst of it and, the hardest to bear of all is that they'll be in the right, for what good can I do for you when I'm under the clay, says she. It's different with a woman. If you were taken in, I left I'd wear your face in my heart through all me life, and axe for no sweeter company. Eileen, says Cormac, lifting his hand, 
and his voice was hoarse as the roar of the say, I swear to you on me bended knees. With her hand on his lips, she stopped him. There'll come on ye by degrees a great craven for sympathy, a hunger and a longing for affection, and you'll have only the shadow of my poor, wanished face to comfort you. And a recollection of a voice that is gone forever. A new, warm face'll keep pushin' itself betwixt us. Bad luck to that red-headed hussy, Mother Darby, looking around distressed. I'll warn Father Cassidy of her and of her intentions the day after the funeral. There was silence for a minute, Cormac, the poor lad, was sobbing like a child. By and by Eileen went on again, but her voice was failing and Darby could see that her cheeks were wet. The day'll come when you'll give over, she says. Ah, I see how it'll all ind. After that you'll visit the churchyard be stealth, so as not to make the other woman sore-hearted. My, oh, my, isn't she the Farsian woman, thought Darby. Little child'll come, she says, and their soft, warm arums will hood you away. By and by you'll not go where I'm late at all, and all thoughts of these few happy months we've spent together, oh. Mother in heaven, how happy they were. The girl started to her elbow, for, sharp and sudden, a wild, wailing cry just outside the windy startled the shuddering darkness. Twas a long cry of terror and of grief, not shrill, but piercing as a knife thrust. Every hair on Darby's head stood up and pricked him like a needle. Twas the banshee. Whist, listen. Says Eileen. Oh, Cormac Astor, it's come for me again. With that, stiff with terror, she buried herself under the pillows. A second cry followed the first, only this time it was longer, and rose and swelled into a kind of a song that broke at last into the heartbreakingest moan that ever fell on martial ears. A cone. It sobbed. The knowledgeable man, his blood turned to ice, his legs trembling like a hare's, stood looking in spite of himself at the black windy panes, expecting some frightful whisayon. After that second cry the voice balanced itself up and down into the awful death keen. One word made the whole song, and that was the terrible word, forever. Forever and forever, oh, forever, swung the wild keen, until all the deep meaning of the word burned itself into Darby's soul, thin the heartbreaking sob, a cone, and always the varse. Darby was just wondering whether he himself wouldn't go mad with fright, when he gave a sudden jump at a hard, strained voice which spoke up at his very elbow. Darby Ogil, it said, and it was the stonecutter who spoke, do you hear the death keen? It came last night, it'll come tomorrow night at this same hour, and thin, oh, my God. Darby tried to answer, but he could only stare at the white, set face and the sunken eyes of the man before him. There was, too, a kind of fierce quiet in the way McCarthy spoke that made Darby shiver. The stonecutter went on talking the same as though he was going to drive a bargain. They say you're a knowledgeable man, Darby Ogil, he says, and that on a time you spent six months with the fairies. Now I make you this fair, square offer, he says, laying a forefinger in the palm of the other hand. I have fifty-three pounds that Father Cassidy's keeping for me. Fifty-three pounds, he says Agin. And I have this good bit of a farm that me father was born on, and his father was born on, too, and the grandfather of him. And I have the grass of seven cows. You know that. Well, I'll give it all to you, all, every stiver of it, if you'll only go outside and drive away that cursed singer. He threw his head to one side and looked anxious up at Darby. The knowledgeable man racked his brains for something to speak, but all he could say was, I brought you a bit of tay from the wife, Cormac. McCarthy took the tay with unfeeling hands, and went on talking in the same dull way. Only this time there came a hard lump in his throat now and then that he stopped to swally. The three cows I have go, of course, with the farm, says he. So does the pony and the five pigs. I have a good plough and a foin harrow. But you must lave my stone-cutting tools, so little Eileen and I can earn our way wherever we go, and it's little the crassure atesh the best of times. 
The man's eyes were dhry and blazon. No doubt his mind was cracked with grief. There was a lump in Darby's throat, too, but for all that he spoke up scolding-like. Ara, talk racin', man, he says, putting two hands on Cormac's chowders, if I had the wit or the art to banish the banshee, wouldn't I be happy to do it and not a fardin, to pay? Well, then, says Cormac, scowling, and pushin' Darby to one side, I'll face her myself, I'll face her and choke that song in her throat if Satin himself stood at her side. With those words, and before Darby could stop him, the stonecutter flung open the door and plunged out into the night. As he did so the song outside stopped. Suddenly a quick splashing of feet, hoarse cries, and shouts gave tidings of a chase. The half-crazed Gasun had started the banshee, of that there could be no manner of doubt. A remembrance of the awful things that she might do to his friend pathrified the heart of Darby. Even after these cries died away he stood listening a full minute, the sowls of his two brogues glued to the floor. The only sounds he heard now were the deep ticking of a clock and a cricket that chirped slow and solemn on the hearth, and from somewhere outside came the sorrowful cry of a whippoorwill. All at once a thought of the broken bridge and of the black, treacherous waters caught him like the blow of a whip, and for a second drove from his mind even the fear of the banshee. In that one second, and before he realized it, the lad was out under the dripping trees, and running for his life toward the broken footbridge. The night was whirling and beating above him like the flapping of tremendous wings, but as he ran Darby thought he heard above the rush of the water and through. The swish of the wind Cormac's voice calling him. The friend of the fairy stopped at the edge of the footbridge to listen. Although the storm had almost passed, a spiteful flare of lightning leapt up now and again out of the western hills, and after it came the dull rumble of distant thunder. The water splashed spiteful against the bank, and Darby saw that seven good feet of the bridge had been torn out of its center, laving uncovered that much of the black, deep flood. He stood straining his eyes and ears in one duration, for now the voice of Cormac sounded from the other side of the stream, and seemed to be floating toward him through the field over the path Darby himself had just traveled. At first he was mightily bewildered at what might bring Cormac on the other side of the brook, till all at once the murdering scheme of the banshee burst in his mind like a gunpowder explosion. Her plan was as plain as day, she meant to drown the stonecutter. She had led the poor, distracted man straight from his own door down to and over the new stone bridge, and was now deluderin him on the other side of the stream. Back again up the path that led to the broken footbridge. In the glare of a sudden blinding flash from the middle of the sky Darby saw a sight he'll never forget till the day he dies. Cormac, the stonecutter, was running toward the death trap, his bare head trun back, and his two arums stretched out in front of him. A little above and just out of reach of them, plain and clear as Darby ever saw his wife Bridget, was the misty white figure of a woman. Her long, waving hair streeled back from her face, and her face was the face of the dead. At the sight of her Darby thrived to call out a warning, but the words fell back into his throat. Thin again came the stifling darkness. He thrived to run away, but his knees failed him, so he turned around to face the danger. As he did so he could hear the splash of the man's feet in the soft mud. In less than a minute Cormac would be struggling in the wather. At the thought Darby, bracing himself body and sowl, let a warning howl out of him. Who'd where you are, he shouted, she wants to drown ye, the bridge is broke in the middle. But he could tell, from the rushing footsteps and from the hoarse swelling curses which came nearer and nearer every second, that the Deluherd man, crazed with grief, was deaf and blind to everything but the figure that floated before his eyes. At that hopeless instant Bridget's parting words popped into Darby's head. When one goes on an errand of Marcy a score of God's white angels, with swords in their hands, march before and beside and after him, keeping his path free from danger. How it all come to pass he could never rightly tell, for he was like a man in a dream, but he recollects well standing on the broken IND of the bridge, Bridget's words ringing in his ears. The glistening black gulf beneath his feet, and he swinging his arums for a jump. 
Just one thought of herself and the child her, as he gathered himself for a spring, and then he cleared the gap like a bird. As his two feet touched the other side of the gap a terrific screech, not a screech, either, but an angry, frightened shriek, almost split his ears. He felt a rush of cowled, dead air egg in his face, and caught a whiff of newly turned clay in his nostrils. Something white stopped quick before him, and then, with a second shriek, it shot high in the darkness and disappeared. Darby had frightened the wits out of the banshee. The instant after the two men were clinched and rolling over and over each other down the muddy bank, their legs splashing as far as the knees in the dangerous wather. And McCarthy raining wake blows on the knowledgeable man's head and breast. Darby felt himself going into the river. Bits of the bank caved under him, splashing into the current, and the lad's heart began clunking up and down like a churn dash. Lave off, lave off. He cried, as soon as he could catch his breath. Do you take me for the banshee, says he, giving a desperate lurch and rolling himself on top of the other. Who are you, then? If you're not a ghost you're the devil, at any rate, gasped the stonecutter. Bad luck to ye, cried Darby, clasping both arms of the haunted man. I'm no ghost, let alone the devil, I'm only your friend, Darby Ogil. Lying there, breathing hard, they stared into the faces of each other a little space till the poor stonecutter began to cry. Oh, is that you, Darby Ogil? Where is the banshee? Oh, haven't I the bad fortune, he says, striving to raise himself. Rise up, says Darby, lifting the man to his feet and steadying him there. The stonecutter stared about like one stun be a blow. I don't know where the banshee flew, but do you go back to Eileen as soon as you can, says the friend of the fairies. Not that way, man alive, he says, as Cormac started to climb the footbridge, it's broke in the middle, go down and cross the stone bridge. I'll be after you in a minute, he says. Without a word, meek now and biddable as a child, Cormac turned, and Darby saw him hurry away into the blackness. The racins Darby remained behind were two, first and foremost, he was a bit vexed at the way his clothes were muddied and draggled, and himself had been pounded and hammered. And, second, he wanted to think. He had a queer cowled feeling in his mind that something was wrong, a kind of a foreboding, as one might say. As he stood thinking a realization of the calamity shrug him all at once like a rap on the jaw, he had lost his fine briar pipe. The lad groaned as he began the anxious sarch. He slapped furiously at his chist and side pockets, he dived into his throsers and greatcoat, and at last, sprawling on his hands and feet like a monkey, he groped savagely through the wet. Sticky clay. This comes, says the poor lad, grumbling and gropin, of poking your nose into other people's business. Hello, what's this? says he, straightening himself. Tis a comb. Be the powers of pewther, tis the banshee's comb. And so indeed it was. He had picked up a gould comb the length of your hand and almost the width of your two fingers. About an inch of one ind was broken off, and dropped into Darby's palm. Without thinking, he put the broken bit into his waistcoat pocket, and raised the biggest half close to his eyes, the better to view it. May I never see sorrow, he says, if the banshee mustn't have dropped her comb. Look at that, now. Folks do be sayin' that, tis this gives her the foin singing voice, because the comb is enchanted, he says. If that sayin' be through, it's the famous lad I am from this night. I'll travel from fair to fair, and maybe at the IND they'll send me to Parliament. With these words he lifted his cabine and stuck the comb in the top tuft of his hair. Begor, he'd no sooner gove it a pull than a sour, singing felon begun at the bottom of his stomach, and it rose higher and higher. When it raged his chist he was just going to let a ball out of himself only that he caught sight of a thing furnanced him that froze the marrow in his bones. He gasped short and jerked the comb out of his hair, for there, not ten feet away, stood a dark, shadowy woman, tall, thin, and motionless, landing on a crutch. During a breath or two the persecuted hero lost his head completely, 
for he never doubted that the banshee had changed her shoot of clothes to chase back after him. The first clear emotion that Ray turned to him was to fling the comb on the ground and make a bolt of it. On second thought he knew that it would be easier to bait the wind in a race than to run away from the banshee. Well, there's a good Tipperary man done for this time, groaned the knowledgeable man, unless in some way I can beguile her. He was fishing in his mind for its civilist word when the woman spoke up, and Darby's heart jumped with gladness as he recognized the cracked voice of Sheila Maguire, the spy for the fairies. The top of the Avenine, to you, Darby Ogil, says Sheila, peering at him from under her hood, the two eyes of her glowing like tallow candles. A meant I kilt with astonishment to see you here alone this time of the night, says the old witch. Now, the clever man knew as well as though he had been tooed, when Sheila said thin words, that the banshee had sent her to look for the comb, and his heart grew bold. But he answered her polite enough, why, thin, luck to ye, Mistress Maguire, ma'am, he says, bowing grand, sure, if you're kilt with astonishment. A meant I split with incredulity to find yourself meanderin' in this lonesome place on Halloween night. Sheila hobbled a step or two nearer, and whispered confidential. I was wanderin' hereabouts only this morning, she says, and I lost from me hair a gould comb, one that I've had this forty years. Did ye see such a thing as that, Agra? And her two eyes blazed. Fakes, I dunno, says Darby putting his two arums behind him. Was it about the length of Yiri hand and the width of Yiri two fingers, he axed. It was, says she, thrusting out a withered paw. Thin I didn't find it, says the tantalizing man. But maybe I did find something some miller, only, t'wasn't yours at all, but the banshees, he says, chuckling. Whether the hag was intentioned to welt Darby with her staff, or whether she was only lifting it for to make a sign of enchantment in the air, will never be known. But whatsomever she meant the hero doubled his fists and squared off. At that she lowered the stick, and broke into a shrill, cackling laugh. Ho, ho, she laughed, hooden her sides, but aren't ye the bold, distinguishable man? Because tis the banshee's comb. How well ye knew it. Be the same token I'm sent to bring it away, so make haste to give it up, for she's hiding and waiting for me down at Chartres Mill. Aren't you the courageous blackguard, to grabble at her, and thry to catch her? Sure, such a thing never happened before, since the world began, says Sheila. The day that the banshee was hiding and feared to face him was great news to the hero. But he only tossed his head and smiled superior as he made answer. "'Tis yourself that knows well, Sheila Maguire, ma'am, answers back the proud man, slow and deliberate. That when one does a favor for an unearthly spirit he may demand for pay the favors of three such wishes as the spirit has power to give. The world knows that. Now I'll take three good wishes, such as the banshee can bestow, or else I'll carry the golden comb straight to Father Cassidy. The banshee hasn't gold nor warly goods, as the saying is, but she has what suits me better. This cleverness angered the fairy woman so she set in to abuse and to frighten Darby. She bally ragged, she browbait, she trajust, she threatened, but twas no use. The bold man hilt firm, till at last she promised him the favors of the three wishes. First and foremost, says he, I'll want her never to put her spell on me or any of my kith and kin. That wish she gives you, that wish she grants you, though it'll go sore egg in the grain, snarled Sheila. Then, says Darby, my second wish is that the black spell be taken from Eileen McCarthy. Sheila flustered about like an angry hen. Wouldn't something else do as well, she says. I'm not here to argify, says Darby, swinging back and furrud on his toes. Bad scram to you, says Sheila. I'll have to go and ask the banshee herself about that. Don't stir from that spot till I come back. You may believe it or not, but with that saying, she bent the head of her crutch well forward. And, before Darby's very face she true, Savon, your presence, one leg over the stick as though it had been a horse, and, while one might say Jack Robinson the crutch riz into the air and lifted her. 
and she went sailing out of sight. Darby was still gaping and gawping at the darkness where she disappeared when, whisk. She was back again and dismountain at his side. The luck is with you, says she, spiteful. That wish I give, that wish I grant you. You'll find seven crossed rushes under McCarthy's doorstep, uncross them, put them in fire or in wather, and the spell is lifted. Be quick with the third wish, out with it. I'm in a more particular hurry about that than you are, says Darby. You must find me my briar pipe, says he. You Omadhon, sneered the fairy woman, tis stuck in the band of your hat, where you put it when you left your own house the night. No, no, not in front, she says, as Darby put up his hand to feel. It's stuck in the back. Your cabine's twisted, she says. Whilst Darby was standing with the comb in one hand and the pipe in the other, smiling daylight, the comb was snatched from his fingers and he got a welt in the side of the head from the crutch. Looking up, he saw Sheila Tundy feet in the air, headed for Chartres Mill, and she cacklin' and screechin' with laughter. Rubbing his sore head and mothering unpious words to himself, Darby started for the new bridge. In less than no time after, he had found the seven crossed rushes under McCarthy's doorstep, and had flung them into the stream. Thin, without knocking, he pushed open McCarthy's door and tiptoed quietly in. Cormac was kneeling beside the bed with his face buried in the pillows, as he was when Darby first saw him that night. But Eileen was sleeping as sound as a child, with a sweet smile on her lips. Heavy perspiration beaded her forehead, showing that the favor was broke. Without disturbing eight her of them our hero picked up the package of tay from the floor, put it on the dresser, and, with a glad heart stole out of the house and closed the door softly behind him. Turning toward Chartres Mill he lifted his hat and bowed low. Thank you kindly, Mistress Banshee, he says. Tis well for us all I found your comb this night. Public or private, I'll always say this for you, you're a woman of your word, he says. Chapter 3 The Ghosts at Chartres Mill For a little while after Darby Ogil sent the banshee back her comb, there was the duckins to pay in that townland. Each night came stormier than the other. And the rain, never, since Noe the Phoenician histed sail for a ray it was there promised such a denudering flood. In one way or another were all, even the German men and the Fardowns, descendants of the Phoeacians. Even at that the foul weather was the last of the throuble, the countryside was haunted. Every ghost must have left Chroma as soon as twilight to wander abroad in the lonesome places. The farmyards and even the village itself was not safe. One morning, just before cockcrow, Big Joey Hooligan, the smith, woke up sudden, with a terrible feeling that some gashly person was looking in at him through the windy. Starting up flurried in bed, what did he see but two eyes that were like burnin' coals of fire, and they peerin' study into the room. One glance was enough. Given a tremendous gasp, Joey dropped back Quakin into the bed, and covered his head with the bedclothes. How long after that the two Higus eyes kept staring at the bed Joey can't rightly tell. For he never uncovered his head nor stirred hand nor foot egg until his wife Nancy had lighted the fire and biled the stirabout. Indeed, it was a good month after that before Joey found courage enough to get up first in the morning so as to light the fire. And on that same memorable morning, he and Nancy lay in bed Argyfin about it till nearly noon, the poor man was that frightened. The Avenine after hooligan was visited Mrs. Nora Clancy was in the stable milking her cow, Cornelia be name, when sudden she spied a tall, strange man in a topcoat standing near the stable door and he with his back turned toward her. At first she thought it a shadow, but it appeared a thrifle thicker than a shadow, so, a little afeard, she called out, God save you kindly, sir. At that the shadow turned a dim, grey face toward her, so full of reproachful woe that Mrs. Clancy let a screech out of her and tumbled over with the pail of milk betwixt her knees. She lay on her back in the spilt milk unconscionable for full fifteen minutes. The next night a very reliable tinker, named Bothered Bill Donahue, 
while wandering near Chartres ruined mill, came quite accidental upon Tunty Skillington's. And they colloguing and confabbing together on the flat roof of the mill shed. But worst of all, and something that shruck deeper terror into every heart, was the news that six different persons at six different places had met with the terrible phantom coach, the Costa Bauer. Peggy Collins, a wandering beggar woman from the West Country, had a wild chase for it. And if she'd been a second later right in, the chapel steps and laying her hand on the church door it would have had her sure. Things got on so that after dark people only ventured out in couples or in crowds, and, in pint of piety that parish was grown into an example and patron for the nation. But of all the persons whom thim conditions complicated you may be sure that the worst harried and implicated was the knowledgeable man, Darby Ogill. There was a weight on his mind, but he couldn't tell why, and a dread in his heart that had no reasonable foundation. He moped and he mothered. Some of the time he felt like singing doleful ballads and death keens, and the rest of the time he could hardly keep from crying. His appetite left him, but what confused him worse than all the rest was the fondness that had come over him for hard work, cuttin', turf and diggin', pita ties, and things like that. To make matters more unsociable, his friend, Brian Connors, the king of the fairies, hadn't showed a nose inside Darby's door for more than a fortnight. So the knowledgeable man had no one to advise with. In thim dismal circumstances Darby, grown desperate, harnessed the pony Cleopatra one morning and drove up to Clonmel to see the master doctor, the renowned McNamara. Be this you may know how bad he felt, for no one, till he was almost at the pint of desolation, ever went to that crass, browbatten gould codger. So, loath enough was our own hero to face him, and hard-hearted enough was the welcome the crabbed little Doc Thor hilt out to Darby when they met. What did you ate for breakfast? The physician says, peering savage from under his great eyebrows at Darby's tongue. Only a bowl of stirabout, and a couple of pita ties, and a bit of bacon, and a few eggs. He was counting on his fingers, and, and something or other I forgot. Do you think I'll go into a decline, Dr. Agra? Hump. Ugh. Ugh. Was all the comfort the sick man got from the blinkin' gould blaggard. But tenon image it to his medicine table the surgeon began studying the medicines. There was so much of it furnished him he might have give a gallon and never missed it. There was one foin big red bottle in particular Darby had his eye on, and thought his dose UD surely come out of that. But Encinamera turns to a box the size of your hat, and it filled to the top with little white, flat pills. Well, the stingy old rascal counts out three and, handing them to Darby, says, take one before breakfast, another before dinner, and the last one before supper, and give me four silver shillings. And that'll cure ye, he says. You may be sure that Darby biled up inside with madness at the unreasonableness of the price of the pills, but, hooting himself in, he says. Very cool and quite, will you write me out a receipt for the money, Dr. McNamara, if you please? He says. And, whilst the old chater was turned to the writing, be the hokey if our hero didn't half fill his pockets with pills from the box. By manies of them, as he drove along home, he was able to do a power of good to the neighbor people he met with on the road. When you once get in the habit of it there's no pleasure in life which aquils given other people medicine. Darby generously med old Peggy O'Callaghan take six of the little round things. He gave a swally to half-witted Red Durgan, and a good mouthful to poor sick Eileen McCarthy, only she had to gulp them whole, poor thing. And couldn't ate them as the others did, but maybe twas just as good. And he gave a fistful H to Judy Rafferty and Dennis Hogan and he stood handsome thrate to a stranger, who, the minute he got the taste well until his mouth, wanted to fight Darby. Howsomever, the two only called each other hard names for a while, then Darby joggled along, doing good and growing lighter-hearted and merrier-minded at every stop he met. Twas this way with him till, just in front of Mrs. Kilcannon's, who should he see, scratching himself egg in the wall, but Solomon, and the based looking bit their denunciation out of the corner of his eye. 
Darby turned his head, ashamed to look the mistreated donkey in the face. And worse still nor that, just Bayant Solomon, landing egg in the same wall, was bothered Bill Donahue, the deaf tinker. That last sight dashed Darby entirely, for he knew as well as if he had been too that the tinker was laying in wait to ride home with him for a night's lodging. It wasn't that Darby objected on his own account to talking him home, for a tinker or a beggar man, mind you, has a right, the world over. To claim a night's lodging and a bit to eat wherever he goes. And, well, these honest people pay for it in the gossip and news they furnish at the fireside and in the good report of your family they'll spread through the country afterwards. Darby liked well to have them come, but through some unknown wakeness in her charac their Bridget hated the sight of them. Worst of all, she hated bothered Bill. She even went so far as to say that Bill was not half so bothered as he pretended, that he could hear well enough what was agreeable for him to hear. And that he was deaf only to what he didn't like to listen to. Well, anyhow there was the tinker in the road waiting for the cart to come up, and for a while what to do Darby didn't well know. He couldn't refuse one who axed food to eight or shelter for a wanderer's for bones during the night, that would be a sin, besides it would bring bad luck upon the house. And, still he had a mortal dislike to go agin Bridget in this particular, she'd surely blame him for bringin' bothered Bill home. But at length and at last he decided, with a sigh, to put the whole case before Bill and then let him come or stay. Whilst he was meditatin' on some way of conveying the news that it be complementary to the tinker, and that it elevate instead of smashing that traveller's sensitiveness, Bill came up to the cart. The top for the day to you, dasent man, he says. Tis gettin' toward dark and I'll go home with ye for the night, I'm thinkin', says he. The tinker, like most people who are hard of hearing, roared as though the listener was bothered. Darby laid down the lines and hilt out a handful of the little medicines. There's nothing the matter with me, so why should I ate them, cried Bill. They're the best thing in the world for that, says Darby, forcing them into Bill's mouth. You don't know when you'll nade them, he says, shoutin'. It's bet there meets sickness halfway, says he, than to wait till it finds you. And then, whilst Bill, with an open hand against his ear, was chawin, the pills and lookin' up plaintiff into Darby's face. The knowledgeable man went on in a blandishing way to pint out the situation. You see, tis this away, Woolham, he says. It's only two daylight I'd be to take you home with me. Indeed, Bridget herself has wonderful admiration for you in an ordinary way, says he. She believes you're a remarkable man entirely, he says, diplomatic, only she thinks you're not clean, says he. The tinker must have misunderstood altogether, for he bawled, in reply, wish a good luck to her, he says, and ain't I glad to have so foin opinion from so foin a woman, says he. But sure, all the women notice how tidy I am, and that's why they like to have me in the house. But we best be movin', says he, coolly dropping his bags of tools until the cart, for the night's at hand, and a black and stormy one it'll be, says Bill. He put a foot onto the wheel of the cart. As he did so Darby, growin' very red in the face, pressed a shilling into the tinker's hand. Go into Mrs. Kilcannon's for the night, Woolham, he says, and come to us for your breakfast, and your dinner and maybe your supper, me good fellow, says he. But the deaf man only pocketed the shillin' and clambered up onto the sate beside Darby. Faith, the shillin's welcome, he says. But I'd go to such a commodious house as yours any time, Darby Ogle, without a farden's pay, says he, patent Darby kindly on the back. But Darby's jaw was hangin' for the loss of the shillin' right on top of the unwelcome visitor. We'd bet there hurry on, says the tinker, lighting his pipe. For after sundown who knows what'll catch up with us on the road, says he. Sure, there was nothing for it but to make the best of a bad bargain, and the two went on together. Darby gloomy and vexed and the deaf man solemn but comfortable till they were almost at Mikhail's bridge. Then the tinker spoke up. Did ye hear the black threats Sheila Maguire is makin' egg in you, he says. No, says Darby, 
what in the world ails her, says he. Bless the one of me knows, says the tinker, nor anybody else for that matter. Only that last Halloween night Sheila Maguire was bait black and blue from head to foot, and she lays the responsibility on you, Darby, he says. The knowledgeable man had his mouth open for a question when who should go runnin' across the road in front of them but Nettie McHale himself, and his arum full of sticks. Go back. Go back. Cries Nettie, wavin' an arum wild. The bridge's butherworks are washed out be the flood and McDonald's bridge is down, too, so yes must go around be the mill, says Nettie. Now here was bit their news for ye. Twas two miles out of the way to go be Chartres Mill, and do the best possible they'd be passing that haunted place in the pitch dark. Faith, and I've had worse luck than in pickin' you up this night, bothered Bill Donahue, says Darby, for it's loath I'd be to go alone. He turned to speak just in time. For the tinker had gathered up his bag and had put his right foot on the cartwheel, purprin for a jump. Darby clutched the lad by the back of his neck and jolted him back hard into the sate. Sit still, Woolham, till we reach me own house, Avernine, he says, sarcastic, for if ye thry that move agin I'll not lave a whole bone in your body. I'll never let it be said, he says, lofty, that I turned one who axed me for a night's lodgin' from me door, he says. And as he spoke he wheeled the cart quick around in the road. Lave me down, Mr. Ogil. I think I'll stop the night with Nettie McHale, says Woolham, shiverin. Bridget don't think I'm clean, says he, as the pony started off. Who tood ye that, I'd like to know, shouted Darby, growin, fierce, who dared say that of ye. You're bothered, Woolham, you know, and so you misthrup it language, he says. But Bill only cowered down sulky and the pony galloped down the side lane until the woods, striven to bait the rain and the darkness. But the elements were too swift-footed, and the rain came down and all the shadows met together, and the dusk whirled quick until blackness before they raced the gloomy hill. Ever and always Chartres Mill was a misfortunate place. It broke the heart of an ruined and killed the man who built it, and itself was a ruin these last twenty years. Many was the wild tale known throughout the countryside of the things that had been seen and heard at that same mill. But the tale that kept Darby and the Tinker Unwelcome Company as the pony throtted along was what had happened there a couple of years before. One night, as Paddy Carroll was driven past the gloomy old place, his best ear cocked and his weather eye open for ghosts, there came sudden from the mill three agonized shrieks for help. Thinkin' twas the spirits that were in it Paddy whipped up his pony and hurried on his way. But the next morning, Miss Doughton, whether twasn't a human voice, after all, he had heard, Paddy gathered up a dozen of the neighbors and went back to investigate. What did they find in one of the upper rooms but a peddler, lying flat on the floor, his pack ramsacked and he dead as a doornail. Twas his cries Paddy had heard as the poor traveler was being murdered. Since that time a dozen people passing the mill at night had heard the cries of the same peddler, and had seen the place blazon with lights. So, that now no one who could help it ever alone passed the mill after dark. At the hill this side of that place the pony slowed down to a walk. Neither coaxin nor batten d injust the baste to mend his steps. The horse stop a little and wait, and thin it'd go on thrimblin. They could all see the dim outlines of the empty mill glowering up at them, and the nearer they came the more it glowered, and the faster their two hearts bait. Halfway down the hill an old signpost pined the way with its broken arm, just bayant that the bridge, and after that the long, level road and salvation. But at the signpost Cleopatra stopped dead still, staring into some bushes just bayant. She was shaken and snorting and her limbs thrimbling. At the same time, to tell the truth, she was no worse off than the two Christians sitting in the cart behind her, only they were not so demonstrative about it. Small blame to the lads at that, for they were both sure and certain that lurking in the black shadows was a thing waiting to freeze their hearts with terror. And maybe to put a mark on them that they'd carry to their graves. After coaxing Cleopatra and Raisinin with her in Wayne, Darby, 
his knees knocking, turned to the tinker, and, in the excitement of the events forgetten, that Bill was deaf, whispered, As cool and as acy-like as he could. Would ye mind doin' me the favor of steppin' out, a vic, and seein' what's in that road ahead of us, Woolam? But bothered Bill answered back at once, just as cool and acy. I would mind, Darby, he says. And I wouldn't get down, Astor, to save you and your family and all their lanial descendants from the gallus rope, says he. I thought you was deef, says Darby, growing disrespectful. This is no time for explanations, says Woolam. And I thought myself, he went on, turning his chowder on Darby, that I was in company with a brave man. But I'm sorry to find that I'm riding with no better than an outrageous coward, says he, bit there. Whilst Woolam was saying them vexatious words Darby stood lanning out of the cart with a hand on Cleopatra's back and a foot on the shaft, goggling his eyes and striven to pierce the darkness at the pony's head. Without tenon round he met answer. Is that the way it is with you, Woolam, he says, still sarcastic. Fakes, thin ye'll have that complaint no longer, for if yez don't climb down this minute I'll throw you bag and baggage in the ditch, he says. So get out image it, darlint, or I'll throw you out, says he. The words weren't well out of his mouth when the audacious tinker whipped out his scissors and sent the sharp pint half an inch into Cleopatra's flank. Cleopatra jumped, and Darby, legs and arums flying, took a back somerset that he never aquiled in his supplest days, for it landed him flat egg in the hedge. And the leap Cleopatra gave, if she could only keep it up to fit her for the curric races. And keep it up for a surprison, while she did, at any rate, for as the knowledgeable man scrambled to his feet he could hear her furious gallop a hundred yards down the road. Stop her, Woolam of Ronin, I was only joking. Come back, ye shameless rogue of the universe, or I'll have ye transported, he shouted, rushing a few steps after them. But the lash of the whip on Cleopatra's sides was the only answer Woolam sent back to him. To pursue was useless, so the desarted man slacked down to a throt. I'd hate bad to have befall me any one of the hundred things Darby wished aloud then and there for Woolam. Well, at all events, there was Darby, his head bent, plodding along through the storm, and a fiercer storm than the wind or rain ever med kept ragin in his heart. Only that through the storm in his mind there flared now and thin quivers of fear and turpitation that sometimes hastened his steps and thin again faltered them. Howsomever, taking it all in all, he was making good progress. And had got to the bunch of willows at the near side of the mill when one particular remembrance of Sheila Maguire and of the Banshee's comb halted the lad in the middle of the road and sent him fumbling with nervous hands in his waistcoat pocket. There, sure enough, was the piece of the Banshee's comb. The broken bit had lain forgotten in the lad's pocket since Halloween. And now, as he felt it there next his thumping heart and, buried under pipefuls of tobacco, the realization almost floored him with consternation. All rushed over his sow like a flood. Who else could it be but the Banshee that gov Sheila Maguire that Turble Batten mentioned by the tinker? And what was that baiting for? unless the banshee accused Sheila of stealing the IND of the comb. And, mother of Moses. T'was Sarchin, for that same bit of comb it was that brought the ghosts up from Chroma and, med the whole townland haunted. Was ever such a dangerous predicament. Here he was, with ghosts in the threes above him and, in the hedges, and, maybe looking over his chowder, and, all of them Sarchin, for the bit of enchanted comb that was in his own pocket. If they should find out where it lay what awful things they would do to him. Sure, they might call up the Costa Bower and fling him into it, and that U.D. be the last ever heard of Darby Ogil in the land of the livin'. With thim wild thoughts jumpin' up and down in his mind he stood in the dark and, in the rain, gaumin, vacant over toward the shadowy ruin. And he be in much agitated, the lad, without thinkin'. Did the foolishest thing a man in his situation could well a compelish, he took out of his pocket the enchanted sliver of gould and hilt it to his two eyes for a look. The consequences came sudden, 
for as he stuck it back into the tobacky there burst from the darkness of the willows the hallowest, most blood curdling laugh that ever fell on martial ears. Ho! 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 it laughed. The knowledgeable man's hair lifted the hat from his head. And as if the laugh wasn't enough to scatter the wits of anyone, at the same instant it sounded, and, quick as a flash, every windy in the old mill blazed with a fierce blue light. Every battered crack and crevice seemed bursting with the glare for maybe the space of ten seconds, and, then, oh, Milia murder. There broke from the upper floor three of the bitterest shrieks of pain and terror ever heard in this world. And, with the last cry, the mill quenched itself into darkness again and stood lonely and gloomy and silent as before. The rain pathered down on the road and the wind swished mournful in the threes, but there was no other sound. The knowledgeable man turned to creep away very soft and quiet. But as he did a monstrous black thing that looked like a dog without a head crawled slowly out from the willows where the terrible laugh had come from. And, it crept into the gloom of the opposite hedge and, there it stood, waiting for Darby to draw near. But the knowledgeable man gave a leap backwards, and, as he did from the darkness just behind him swelled a deep sigh that was almost a groan. From the hedge to his right came another sigh, only deeper than the first, and from the blackness on his left rose another moan, and, then a groaning, moaning chorus rose all round him. And lost itself in the wailing of the wind. He was surrounded, the ghosts had captured Darby. The lad never realized before that minute what a precious thing is daylight. If there would only come a flash of lightning to show him the faces of the surrounding spirits, horrible though they might be, he'd bid it welcome. But though the rain drizzled and the thunder rumpled, not a flare lit up the sky. One swift, desperate hope at the last minute saved the boy from sheer despair. And that same hope was that maybe some of the good people might be flying about and would hear him. Lifting up his face to the sky and crying out to the passing wind, he says. Boys, he says, agonized, lads, says he, if there be any of yes to listen, he cried. I'll take it as a great favor and I'll thank ye kindly to tell King Brian Connors that his friend and comrade, Darby Ogle, is in deep trouble and wants to see him image it, says he. Ho! 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 laughed the terrible thing in the hedge. In spite of the laugh he was almost sure that off in the distance a cry answered him. To make sure he called again, but this time, though he strained his ears till their drums ached, he caught no reply. And now, out of the murkiness in the road ahead of him, something began to grow slowly into a tall, slender, white figure. Motionless it stood, tightly wrapped in a winding sheet. In its presence a new and awful fear pressed down the heart of Darby. He felt, too, that another shade had taken its place behind him, and he didn't want to look, and shrove against looking, but something forced the lad to turn his head. There, sure enough, not five feet away, stood still and silent the tall, dark figure of a man in a topcoat. Thin came from every direction low, hissing whispers that the lad couldn't understand. Something terrible would happen in a minute, he knew that well. There's just so much fear in every man, just exactly as there is a certain amount of courage, and, when the fear is all spilt a man ate her fights or dies. So Darby had always said. He remembered there was a gap in the hedge nearly opposite the clump of willows, so he met up his mind that, come what might, he'd make a grand charge for it, and, so into the upland meadow bayant. He waited an instant to get some strength back until his knees, and, then he gave a spring. But that one spring was all he made, in that direction, at last. For, as he neared the ditch, a dozen white, ghostly hands raced out eager for him. With a gasp he whirled in his thrax and rushed mad to the willows opposite, but there a hundred gashly fingers were stretched out to meet the poor lad. And, as he staggered back into the middle of the road again, the hero couldn't, to save his soul, keep back a long cry of terror and distress. Image it, from under the willows and from the ditch near the hedge and, in the air above his head, from countless dead lips echoed that triumphing, unearthly laugh, Ho! 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 
Twas then Darby just nearly give up for lost. He felt his eyes growing dim and his limbs numb. There was no air coming into his lungs, for when he tried to breathe he only gaped, so that he knew the black spell was on him. And that all that was left for him to do was to sink down in the road and thin to die. But at that minute there floated from a great way off the faint cry of a voice the despairing man knew well. Keep up your heart, Darby Ogill, cried Brian Connors. We're coming to rescue you, and from over the fields a wild cheer follied thin words. Fa bala, clear the way, sprang the shrill war cry of a thousand of the good people. At the first sound of the king's words there rose about Darby the mighty flurrying and rushing of wings in the darkness, as if tremendous birds were rising sudden and flying away. And the air emptied itself of a smothering heaviness. So fast came the king's fairy army that the great cheer was still echoing among the threes when the gold crown of Brian Connors sparkled up from beside the knowledgeable man's knees. At that the persecuted man, Sabin, with joy, knelt down in the muddy road to shake hands with his friend, the master of the good people. Brian Connors was not alone, for there crowded about Darby, Sympathison with him, Little Philem Beg, and Niall the Fiddler, and Sean Rue the Smith, and Fadrig Ogay. Also every instant, flithering out of the sky into the road, came be the score green-cloaked and red-hooded men, follying the king and ready for throuble. If ever a man needed a drop of good whusky, you're the hero, and this is the time and place for it, says the king, handin' up a silver-topped noggin. Drink it all, he says, and then we'll escort ye home. Come on, says he. The master of the nighttime turned and shouted to his subjects. Boys, he cried, we'll go wiseable, the bet there for company's sake. And do you make the lumination so Darby can see yes with him? At that the lovely rosy light which, as you may remember, our hero first saw in the fairy's home at Slevenamon, lighted up the roadway, and under the leafy arches. Bobbin, along like a regiment of soldiers, all in their green cloaks and red caps, marched at last a thousand of the little people, with Fadrigoge at their head acting as general. As they passed the mill five defiant pipers met the bathered old windies rattle with Gary Owen. Chapter 4 the Costa Bower. Chapter 1. So the green dressed little army, all in the sweet, rosy light they made, went marching, to the merry music of the pipes, over the tree bowered roadway. Past the haunt head breaks up the shivering hills, and down into the waiting dales, making the grim night melodious. For a long space not a word, good, bad, or indifferent, said Darby. But a sparrow woke her drowsy childhood to look at the beautiful procession, and a robin called excited to her sleepy neighbors, the linnets and the rabbits and the hares. And hundreds like them crowded daylight through the bushes, and stood peering through the glistening leaves as their well-known champions went by. A dozen wintersome young owls flew from bough to bough, follying along, cracking good-natured but friendly jokes at their friends, the fairies. Thin other birds came flying from miles around, twithering jubilation. But the stern-jawed, frowny-eyed little people for once answered back never a word, but marched stiff and silent, as soldiers should. You'd swear twas the Enniskillens or twas the eighteenth hussars that twas in it. Isn't that General Julius Caesar at the head, says one brown owl, flapping an audacious wing at Fadrigoge. No, cries his brother another young villian. Tis only the Duke of Wellington. But look at the bothered face on Darby Ogle. Musha, are the good people goin' to hang Darby? And fakes, thin, sure enough, there was mighty little elation on the features of our hero. For, as he came marchin' along, silent and moody, beside the king, what to do with the banshee's comb was both Aaron, the heart out of him if he had only trun it to the ghosts when he was there at the mill. But that terrible laugh had crunched all sense and racin' out of him, so that he forgot to do that very wise thing. Akon, now the ghosts knew he had it, so, to throw it away do no good, unless they'd find it after. One thing was sartin, he must some way get it back to the banshee, or else be haunted all the rest of his days. He was sore-hearted, too, at the king, 
an a bit crass tempered because the little man had stayed away so long from Wizitin with him. But at last the knowledgeable man found his tongue. Be me fakes, king, he complained, tis a cure for sore eyes to see ye. I might have been dead and buried and you none the wiser, says he, sulky. Sure, I've been out of the country a fortnight, says the king. And I've only returned within the hour, he says. I went on a sudden call to prevent a terrible war betwixt the French fairies and the German fairies. I've been for two weeks on an island in the river Ryan, betwixt France and Germany. The river is called after an Irishman be the name of Ryan. At last ye might have sent me word, says Darby. I didn't think I'd be so long gone, says the fairy. But the disputation was tremendous, he says. The little man drew himself up dignified and scowled solemn up at Darby. They left it for me to dayside, he says, and this was the contention. Fifty years ago a swan belonging to the French fairies laid a set tin of eggs on that same island. And then comes along a German swan, and what does the impotent Crathur do but set herself down on the eggs laid be the French swan and hatched them. After the hatch in, the German men claimed the young ones, but the Frenchman preemp thoroughly demanded them back, d mind. And the German men defied them, d c. So, of course, the trouble started. For fifty years it has been growing, and before fighting, as a last ray sort, they sent for me. Well, I saw at once that at the bottom of all was the old, gould question, which has been disturbing, the world and, driven, people crazy for three thousand years. I know, says Darby, scornful, twas whither the hen that laid the egg or the hen that hatched the egg is the mother of the young chicken. And nothing else but that. Cried the king, surprised. Now, what do you think I decided, he says. Now, your honor, I'll always blame Darby for not listening to the king's decision, because tis a matter I've studied myself considerable, and never could rightly conclude. But Darby at the time was so bothered that he only said, in reply to the king. Sure, it's little I know, and sorrow little I care, he says, sulky. I've something more important than hen's eggs troubling me mind, and maybe ye can help me, he says, anxious. Ara, out with it, man, says the king. We'll find a way, of Renine, he says, cheerful. With that Darby up and told everything that had happened Halloween night and since, and, indeed, be saying, now, here's that broken piece of comb in me pocket, and what to do with it I don't know. Will ye take it to the banshee, king, he says. The king turned grave as a goat. I wouldn't touch that thing in your pocket, good friends as we are, to save your life, not for a hundred pounds. It might give them power over me. Yours is the only martial hand that ever touched the banshee's comb, and yours is the hand that should restore it. Oh, my, look at that, now, says Darby, in despair, nodding his head very solemn. Besides, says the king, without noticing him, there's only one ghost in Chroma I associate with, and that's Sean. They are mostly uncultivated, and I almost said redundant. Although I'd hate to call anyone redundant unless I had to, says the just-minded old man. I'll throw it here in the road and let some of them find it, says Darby, desperate. I'll take the chance, says he. The king was shocked, and, throwing up a warning hand, he says. Be no manner of manies, the fairy says, you forget that thim ghosts were once men and women like yourself. So when ghouls concerned they're not to be thrusted. If one should find the comb he mightn't give it to the banshee at all, he might turn bezler and buzzle it. No, no, you must give it to herself personal, or else you and Bridget and the child will be haunted all your days. And there's no time to lose, either, says he. But Bridget and the childers waitin' for me this minute, wailed Darby. And the pony, what's become of her? And me supper, he cried. A little lad who was marching just ahead turned and spoke up. The pony's tied in the stable, and bothered Bill has gone sneakin' off to McCloskey's, the little man says. I saw them as I flew past. 
Fadrig, shouted the king. Donnell. Khan. Niall. Philim, he called. With that the little men named rose from the ranks, their cloak spread, and come flying back like big green butterflies, and they stopped hoovering in the air above Darby and the king. What's wanted? asked Philim. Does any of yez know where the banshees do at this hour? the king replied. She's due in County Ruscommon at Castle Offlin, if I don't misremember, spoke up the little fiddler. But I'm thinking that since Halloween she ain't workin' much, and perhaps she won't lave Chroma. Well, has any one of yez seen Sean the knight, I dunno, axed the master. Sarah one of me knows, says Fadrig. Nor I, nor I, nor I, cried one after the other. Well, find where the banshees stayin', says King Brian. And, some of yez, except in Fadrig, go look for Sean, and, tell him I want to see him perdiclar, says the king. The foive hoovering little lads wanished like a candle that's blown out. As for you, Fadrig, went on the master ferry, tell the regiment there to guard this townland the night, and, keep the ghosts out of it. Begin at once, he commanded. The words weren't well said till the whole regiment had blown itself out, and Agin the night closed in as black as your hat. But as it did Darby caught a glimpse from afar of the golden light of his own open door, and he thought he could see on the thrashel the shadow of Bridget. With one of the child her clinging to her skirt, and herself watching with a hand shading her eyes. Do you go home to your supper, me poor man, says the king, and meantime I'll engage Sean to guide us to the banshee. He's a great comrade of hers, and he'll pacificate her if anyone can. The day of becoming acquainted personal with the ghosts, and, in a friendly, pleasant way have dealings with them, was a new sensation to Darby. What'll I do now? he axed. Go home to your supper, says the king, and meet me by the withered three at Conroy's crossroads on the stroke of twelve. There'll be little danger tonight, I'm thinkin', but if ye should run against one of Thim Spalpeen's throw the bit of comb at him, maybe he'll take it to the banshee and maybe he won't. At any rate, tis the best yez can do. Don't keep me waitin' on the crossroads, whatever else happens, warned Darby. I'll do me best in Daver, says the king. But be sure to recognize me when I come, make no mistake, for ye'll have to spake first, he says. They were walking along all this time, and now had come to Darby's own style. The lad could see the heads of the childer bunched up agin the windy pane. The king stopped, and, laying a hand on Darby's arum, spoke up impressive. If I come to the crossroads as a cow with a rope about me horns ye'll laid me, he says. If I come as a horse with a saddle on me back, yez'll ride me, says he. But if I come as a pig with a rope tied to me lift hind leg, ye'll drive me, says the king. Oh, my! Oh, my! Oh, Terran ages, says Darby. But, says the king, waving his hand against interruptions, so that we'll know each other will have a byword bechuxed us. And, it'll be poetry, he says. So that I'll know that tis you that's in it ye'll say, cabbage and bacon, and, so that ye'll know that tis me that's in it I'll answer, will stop the hard action dot. Cabbage and bacon will stop the hard action, says the king, growing unwisable. That's good, satisfying poetry, he says. But the last words were sounded out of the empty air and, a little way above, for the master of the nighttime had wanished. At that Darby went into his supper. I won't expatiate to your honor on how our hero spent the Avenine at home, and, how, after Bridget and, the child her were in bed. That a growin, day sire to meet and, talk sociable with a ghost fought with tunty black fears and almost bait them. But why never his mind hesitated, as it always did at the thought of the Costa Bower, a finger poked into his waistcoat pocket where the broken bit of comb lay hid, turned the scale. How endeavor, at length and at last, just before midnight our hero, dressed once more for the road, went splashin' and plodding up the lane toward Conroy's crossroads. Chapter 2 A man is never so brave as when sittin' furnished his own comfortable fire, a hot supper asleep in his chist, a steamin' noggin of flagrant punch in his fist. 
and a wealth ride pipe betwixt his teeth. At such times he ruminates on the old ancient heroes, and he decides they were no great shakes, after all. They had the chance to show themselves, and that's the only difference betwixt it himself and themselves. But when he's flung sudden out of thin pleasant circumstances, as Darby was, to go charging around in the darkness, hunting unknown and unwisable dangers, much of that courage oozes out of him. And so the strangest of all strange things was, that this night, when twas his fortune to be taken up be the cost of hour. That a dread of that death coach was present in his mind from the minute he shut the door on himself, and it outweighed all other fears. In spite of the insurance that King Brian had given, in spite of the knowledge that his friends, the good people, were flying hither and thither over that townland. There crept into his soul and fastened itself there the chance that the headless driver might slip past them all and gobble him up. In Wayne he tooed himself that there were a million spots in Ireland where the death carriage was more likely to be than in his own path. But in spite of all racins, a dreading, shiverin' feelin' was in his bones, so that as he splashed along he was flinging anxious looks behind or tremblin' at the black, wavering shadows in front. Howsomever, there was some comfort to know that the weather was changin' for the bet there. Strong winds had swept the worst of the storm out over the ocean, where it lingered slow, growlin' and spotherin' lightning. A few scathered, frowning clouds, throwing ugly looks at the moon, sulked behind. Lord love your shining face, says Darby, looking up to where the full moon, big as the bottom of a tub, shone bright and clear over his head. And, it's I that hopes that the blaggard of a cloud I see creeping over at you from sleeve Naman won't write you and squint your light before I meet up with Brian Connors. The moon, in answer, brushed a cloud from her face, and shed a clearer, fuller light, that made the flooded fields and dropping threes quiver and glisten. On top of the little mound known as Conroy's Hill, and, which is just this side of where the roads crass, the friend of the fairies looked about over the lonesome countryside. Here and there gleamed a distant farmhouse, a still white speck in the moonlight. Only at Con Kelly's, which was a good mile down the road, was a friendly spark of light to be seen. And that spark was so dim and so far that it only pressed down the loneliness heavier on Darby's heart. Wisha, says Darby, how much I drew there be their merry makin with the boys and girls than standin here lonesome and cowled, waiting for the devil knows what. He strained his eyes for a sight of a horse, or a cow, or a pig, or anything that might turn out to be Brian Connors. The only thing that moved was the huge dark cloud that stretched up from Sleeve Naman, and its heavy edge already touched the rim of the moon. He started down the hill. The withered three at the crossroads where he was to meet the king waved its blackened arms and lifted them up in warning as he came toward it. And, it dripped cowled tears upon his cabine and down his neck when he stood quaking in its shadows. If the headless coachman were to catch me here, he whumpered, and fling me into his carriage, not a sowl on earth would ever know what became of me. I wish I wasn't so knowledgeable, he says, half crying. I wish I was as ignorant about ghosts and fairies as little Mrs. Bradigan, who laughs at them. The more you know the more you need know. Musha, there goes the moon. And at them words the great blaggard cloud closed in on the moon and left the world as black as your hat. That wasn't the worst of it by no manner of manies, for at the same instant there came a rush of wind, and, with it a low, hollow rumble that froze the marrow in Darby's bones. He strained his eyes toward the sound, but it was so dark he couldn't see his hand before his face. He tried to run, but his legs turned to blocks of wood and defied him. All the time the rumble of the turbul coach drew nearer and nearer, and he felt himself helpless as a babe. He closed his eyes to shut out the horror of the headless driver and of the poor, dead men lanning back egg in the sate. At that last minute a swift hope that the king might be within hearing lent him a flash of strength, and he called out the byword. Cabbage and bacon, he cried out, despairing. Cabbage and bacon'll stop the hard action. He roared, dismally, and then he gave a great gasp, for there was a splash in the road furnace the three, and a tremendous black coach, with four goint horses and a coachman on the box. 
stood still as death before him. The driver wore a brown greatcoat, the lines hung limp in his fingers, and Darby's heart stopped palpitating at the sight of the two broad, headless childers. The knowledgeable man shrove to cry out Agin, but he could only croak like a raven. Cabbage and bacon'll stop the heart action, he says. Something moved inside the coach. Foolish man, a voice cried, you've not only gov the byword, but at the same time you've shouted out its answer. At the voice of the king, for twas the king who spoke, a great wakeness came over Darby, and he lamed limp Agin the three. Suppose, the king went on, that it was an enemy you'd met up with instead of a friend. Terran ounds. He'd have our sacred and maybe he'd put the commuter on ye. Sean, he says, up to the driver, this is the human being we're to take with us down to Chroma to meet the banshee. From a place down on the sate on the far side of the driver a deep, slow voice, that sounded as though it had fur on it. Spoke up. I'm glad to substantiate any service that will in any way conduce to the Amalyro Aretian of any friend of the renowned King Brian Connors. Even though that friend be only a human being. I was a humble human being myself three or four hundred years ago. At that statement Darby out of politeness thrived to look surprised. You must be a juke or an earl, or some other rich philosopher, to have the most renowned fairy in the world take such a shine to you, went on the head. Haven't ye seen enough to make yourself like him, cried the king, raising half his body through the open windy. Didn't ye mark how C.A.M. and bold he stood waiting for ye, when any other man in Ireland would be this time have wore his legs to the knees running from ye? Where is the philosopher except Darby Ogil who would have guessed that twas myself that was in the coach, and would have flung me the byword so careless and handy? cried the king, his face blazing with admiration. The words put pride into the heart of our hero, and pride the world over is the twin sister of courage. And then, too, whilst the king was talking, that deep, obstreperous cloud which had covered the sky slipped off the edge of the moon and hurried to join its fellows, who were waiting for it out over the ocean. And the moon, to make a minds for its late obscuration, showered down sudden a flood of such cheerful, silver light that the drooping, separate leaves and the glistening blades of grass leapt up clean and logan to the eye. Some of that cheer went into Darby's breast, and with it crept back fresh his old confidence in his champion, the king. But the headless driver was talking. Ogil, says the slow voice Agin, did I hear ye say Ogil, Brian Connors? Surely not one of the Ogils of Ballanthubber? Darby answered reluctant and haughty, for he had a feeling that the monster was going to claim relationship, and the day put a bad taste in his mouth. All me father's people came from Ballanthubber, he says. Come this or come that, says the deep voice, trembling with excitement, I'll have one look at ye. No sooner said than done. For with that saying the coachman twisted, and picking up an extraordinary big head from the sate beside him, hilted up in his two hands and faced it to the road. Twas the face of a goint. The lad marked that its wiry red whiskers grew close under its eyes, and the flaming hair of the head curled and rolled down to where the childers should have been. And he saw, too, that the nose was wide and that the eyes were little. An uglier face you couldn't wish to observe. But as he looked, the boy saw the great lips tighten and grow wide. The eyelids half closed, and the head gave a hoarse sob, the tears trickled down its nose. The head was crying. First Darby grew uncomfortable, then he felt insulted to be cried at that way be a total stranger. And as the tears rolled faster and faster, and the sobs came louder and louder, and the ugly eyes kept leering at him affectionate, he grew hot with indignation. Seeing which, the head spoke up, sniveling. Plays don't get pugnacious nor yet disputatious, it begged, betwixt sobs. Tisn't your face that hurts me and makes me cry. I've seen worse, a great deal worse, many's the time. But tis the amazing family resemblance that's pathrifying me heart. The driver lifted the tail of his coat and wiped the head's two weep-in eyes. 
Twas in Balanthubber I was born and, in Balanthubber I was reared. And, it's there I came to me misfortune through love of a putty, fair maid named Margaret Ellen Ogill. There was a song about it, he says. I've heard it many and many the time, says the king, Nodden, sympathisin, though not for the last hundred years or so. Darby glared, scornful, at the king. Vo. 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 Wailed the head, but you're like her. If it wasn't for your bunchy red hair, and for the big brown one that was on her forehead, ye'd be as like as two passe. Ara, says Darby, Bruslin, I'm ashamed to see a man of your sense and station, he says, and high dictation. Lave off, broke in the king, pulling Darby be the sleeve. Come inside. Whatever else you do, respect the sentimentalities, they're all we have to live for, ghost or mortal, says he. So, grumbling, Darby took a place within the coach beside his friend. He filled his pipe and was boring a bit of fire from that of the king, when looking up he saw just back of the driver's seat and opening into the carriage. A square hole of about the height and the width of your two hands. And, set egg in the hole, staring affectionate down at him, was the head, and, its smiling languaging. Be this and be that, Darby growled low to the king, if he don't take his face out of that windy, ghost or no ghost, I'll take a poke at him. Be no manner of manies, says the king, anxious. What did we do without him? We'll be at Chroma in a few minutes, then he needn't bother ye. Why don't ye drive on, says Darby, looking up surly at the head. Why don't ye start? We're going these last three minutes, smiled Sean, we're coming up to Kilmartin Churchyard now. Have you passed Tom Grogan's public house, axed the king, starting up, anxious. I have, but I can turn back Agin, says the face, lighting up, in the rest. They keep the best whusky there in this part of Ireland, says the king. Would ye mind steppin' in and bringing us out a sup, Darby Agra? Mistress Tom Grogan was a tall, irritated woman, with sharp corners all over her, and a temper that was like an east wind. She was standing at her own door, arguing with Garge McGibney and Woolham Broderick, and dailing them out Herod names, whilst her husband, Tom, a mild little man, stood within Lanning on the bar. Smoking sadly. Garge and Woolham were arguing back at Mistress Grogan, telling her what a foin looking, respectable woman she was, and couldn't they have one drop more before going home. When they saw coming sliding along through the air toward them, about four feet above the ground, a decent dressed man, sitting comfortable. His poip in his mouth and one leg crossed over the other. The stranger stopped in the air not five feet away, and in the moonlight they saw him plain knock the ashes from his poip and stick it in the rim of his cabine. They catched hoot of each other, gasping as he stepped down out of the air to the ground, and wishing them the top of the evening, he brushed past. Walked bold to the bar and briskly called for three jorums of whusky. Tom, oblivious, for he hadn't seen, handed out the drinks, and, the stranger, natural as you plays, imptied one, wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and started for the door. Carrying the two other jorums. Tom, of course, follied out to see who was in the road, and then he clutched hoot of the three others, and, the four, grippin, each other like lobsters bilin, in the pot, clung, speechless. Swaging back and forth. And, sure, twas no wonder, for they saw the strange man lift the two cups into the naked air, and, they saw plain the two jorums lave his hands. Tip themselves slowly over until the bottoms were uppermost, not one drop of the liquor spillin' to the ground. They saw no more, for they h gave a different kind of roar when Darby turned to bring back the empty vessels. The next second Tom Grogan was flying like a hunted rabbit over the muddy pettity field behind his own stable. Whilst Woolham Broderick and Garge McGibney were dashin' furious after him like Skibberberg hounds. But Mrs. Grogan didn't run away, because she was on her own thrashel, lying on the flat of her back, and for the first time in her life speechless. How endeavor, with a rumble and a roar, the coach with its travelers went on its way. 
The good liquor supplied all which that last sight lacked that was needful to put our three heroes in good humor with themselves and with each other, so that it wasn't long before their throubles. Be in, forgot, they were conversing sociable and familiar, one with the other. Darby, to improve his information, was thriving to make the best of the situation be Ashin knowledgeable questions. What kind of disposition has the banshee, I dunno, he says, after a time. A foine creature, and very refined, only a bit too fond of crying and wailing, says Sean. Musha, I know several livin' women that cap fits, says the knowledgeable man. Sure, does she do nothin' but wail death keens? Has she no good love ballads or songs like that? I'd think she'd grow tired, he says. Ara, don't be talkin', says Sean. Tis she who can sing them. She has one in particular, the ballad of Mary McGuinness, that I wished ye could hear her at, he says. The song has three splendid chuns to it, and the chun changes at h verse. I wished I had it all, but I'll sing yes what I have, he says. With that the head began to sing, and a foin, deep singin' voice it had, too, only maybe a little too roarin' for love ballads. Come all ye throw lovers, where'er yes may be. Likewise ye decavers be land or be sea. I hope that ye'll listen with pity to me. Since the jewel of me life is a thraitor. Here's where the chun changes, says the head, lickin' his lips. On goin' to church last Sunday me throw love passed me by. I knew her mind was changed be the twinklin' of her eye. I knew her mind was changed, which caused me for to moan. Tis a terrible black misfortune to think she cowled has grown. That's what I call raw poetry, says Darby. There's no foiner, says the king, standing up on the sate, his face beaming. The next varsal make yez cry salt tears, says Sean. And he sang very affectin'. Oh, dig me a grave both large, wide, and deep. Art lay me down gently, to take me long sleep. Put a stone at me head and a stone at me feet. Since I cannot get Mary McGuinness. Faith, tis a foin, pitiful song, says Darby, and I'd give a great deal if I only had it, says he. Musha, who knows, maybe ye can get it, says the old king, with a wink. Ye may demand the favors of the three wishes for bringing her what you're bringin', he whispered. Sean. He says, out loud, do you think the banshee'll give that song for the bringing back of the lost comb, I dunno? I dunno myself, says the head, jubious. Because if she would, here's the man who has the comb, and he's bringin' it back to her. The head gave a start and its eyes bulged with gladness. Then it's the lucky man I am entirely, he says. For she promised to stick me head on and to let me wear it permanent, if I'd only bring tidings of the comb, says Sean. She's been in a bad way since she lost it. You know the crushure can sing only when she's combing her hair. Since the combs broke her voice is cracked scandlouse, and she's bit there ashamed, so she is. But here's Chroma right before us. Will yez go in and take a drop of something, says he. Sticking out his head, Darby saw towering up in the night's gloom bleak Chroma, the mountain of the ghosts. And, as he thought of the thousands of shivering things inside, and of the unpleasant feelings they'd given him at Chartres Mill a few hours before, a doubt came into his mind as to whether it were best to trust himself inside. He might never come out. How endeavor, the king spoke up saying, Thank ye kindly, Sean, but ye know well that yourself and one or two others are the only ghosts I associate with, so we'll just step out. And do you go in yourself and tell the banshee we're waitin. Ray turn with her, Sean, for ye must take Darby back. With that the two heroes descended from the coach, and glad enough was Darby to put his brogue safe and sound on the road again. All at once the side of the mountain furnace them opened with a great crash, and Sean, with the coach and horses, disappeared in a rush, and were swoolied up be the mountain. Which closed after them. Darby was blinkin' and shiverin' beside the king, when sudden, and without a sound, the banshee stood before them. She was all in white, 
and her yellow hair streeled to the ground. The weight and sorrow of ages were on her pale face. Is that you, Brian Connors, she says. And, is that one with you the man who grab led me? You're most obedient, says the king, Bowen, low. It was a accident, says he. Well, accident or no accident, she says, Savare, tis the foin lot of trouble he's caused me, and tis the illigant lot of trouble he'd a had this night if you hadn't saved him, she says. The banshee spoke in a hollow voice, which once in a wild break into a squeak. Let bygones be bygones, ma'am, if you plays, says Darby, and I've brought back your comb, and by your lave I ax the favor of three wishes, says he. Some way or other he wasn't so afeard now that the king was near, and, besides one square, cool look at any kind of trouble, even if tis a ghost, takes half the dread from it. I have only two favors to grant any mortal man, says she, and here they are. With that she handed Darby two small black stones with things carved on them. The first stone will make you unwisable if you rub the front of it, and twill make you wisable again if you rub the back of it. Put the other stone in your mouth and ye can mount and ride the wind. So Sean needn't drive yez back, she says. The king's face beamed with joy. Oh, be the hokey, Darby me lad, says he, think of the larks we'll have thravelin' nights together over Ireland ground, and maybe we'll go across the say, he says. But fairies can't cross runnin' water, says Darby, wonderin'. That's all superstition, says the king. Didn't I cross the river Ryan? But, ma'am, says he, you have a third favor, and one I'm wishin' for mightily myself, and, that is, that ye'll tiche us the ballad of Mary McGuinness. The banshee blushed. I have a cowled, says she. Tis the way with singers, says the king, winkin, at Darby, but we'll thank ye to do your best, ma'am, says he. Well, the banshee took out her comb, and, fastening to it the broken IND, she passed it through her hair a few times and began the song. At first her voice was pretty wake and thrimblin', but the more she combed the stronger it grew, till at last it rose high and clear. And sweet and wild as Darby'd heard it that Halloween night up at McCarthy's. The two heroes stood in the shadow of a three, Darby listening and the king busy writing down the song. At the last word the place where she had been standing flashed empty and Darby never saw her again. I wished I had all the song to let your honor hear it, and maybe I'll learn it from Darby be the next time ye come this way, and I wished I had time to tell your honor how Darby. One day Havin made himself unwisable, lost the stone, and how bothered Bill Donahue found it, and how Bill, Rubbin, it be accident, made himself unwisable. And of the terrible time Darby had a finding him. But here's Kilcuny, and there's the inn, and thank ye. God bless your honor.